what could be better than sun and fun in Florida? Well, how about sun, fun, and cars at Barrett Jackson Palm Beach? That's exactly what we've got. Boy, what an auction we've had so far. Today is day two. And yesterday, what well, we called an entry-level day. It was a fun variety of cars. But today, guess what? Both the quality of the cars and the prices of the cars are going to go up. Nearly 700 cars, a record here at Palm Beach. But it's not just the number of cars that are going to cross the block that make this auction special. It's the quality of the cars. Better than we've ever seen here at Palm Beach. And over the course of the next two days, the last two days of the auction, boy, we're going to see some incredible things crossing the block. And of course, as always, we have the two best automotive tour guides in the country up there to show you every single car. Mike Joy and Steve Mignante. Well, it's been three years, Rick, since Barrett-Jackson was in Palm Beach. There's a lot of pent-up demand here among consigners and bidders. Now, we have great collections to sell here. Three different flights of cars today from the John Stalupi Cars of Dreams collection. And industrialist George Shin has brought some beautiful cars from his collection. When these mega collectors sell their cars, people know they've been curated. They've been kept up. They've been enjoyed. And they are top shelf. So grab your stack of $100,000 Monopoly money bills and get ready to play, Steve, because this is going to be a fantastic Friday. That's right. And as always, the cars don't talk, so we'll do our job of bringing them to you and pointing out what's special about them and what's extra special about them. And again, the beauty of this auction is that we don't just have muscle cars. We have exotics, late model prestige cars, trucks, SUVs, and Broncos. We have Broncos, late models, and classics all going to cross this block. Literally something for everybody. Now, a 1992 Dodge Stealth, a project of Dodge and Mitsubishi, just hammered, sold for $8,000. So here is lot 333.2, the return of the baby bird. You talk about a car that's peachy, palm beachy. This 2002 retro style for Thunderbird is it. You know, it's funny, during this time, Ford had its modular engine program. Four, six, five, four, two valves, four valves, three valves, all of that. Well, this does have a dual overhead cam V8, but it's a Jaguar based four liter. It's interesting how Ford did not use their domestic engine, but again, the Jaguar four liter, a great engine, you know, over 200 horsepower. Uh, and I love these. These are the, you know, the second coming of the baby bird. They didn't take off in the market first time around, but I say these are he they're heating up. A future collectible, and maybe its time has come. Note the porthole. Hardtop, uh, a feature of the original Baby Birds, 1956-57. The T-Bird line started in 55, and in 58 it grew to a four-seater, but they brought it back, and these cars are well enjoyed by the people that have them, although, as Steve says, in the showroom they were not huge sellers. Yeah, this one, not a lot of miles on it, less than 40,000. I think that's pretty common because a lot of these were bought by older buyers who didn't drive them as much. And as a result, there's a lot of low-mile versions of these floating around. You know, one thing that might have held these back in the market at the time, there was no GT version, no SR, SVT, all automatics. You know, had they done a hot rod version, it might have helped. But again, they're great cars. $21,000 for a 2002 Ford Thunderbird. Next generation. All right, let's check in with the host of Hoovy's Garage, another member of our broadcast team, Tyler Hoover. Well, I found my way over to the Cars of Dreams collection, several of which are selling today, including this Lot 403, a 1933 Ford Street Rod. Now, this is a perfectly executed example with a chopped and channeled all-steel body, two inches each with that beautiful interior aircraft leather on their caros. But then we get to the things that are borrowed, including a Chevy 350 V8, which is pretty common on a Ford Street Rod build. But then there's something different in the back. It'd be kind of hard to see, but you do have an independent rear suspension from a Jaguar along with a rear differential from a Jag. And then look at that tail light. I'll give you a second to guess where it's from. Yeah, that is from a Plymouth Prowler. So you have Plymouth, you have Jaguar, you have Chevy, you have Ford all working together to build this beautiful hot rod selling today at Bear Jackson Palm Beach. All right, thanks a lot, Tyler. Classic hot rod, a little of this, a little of that. Up on the block now, a 64 International Scout pickup. Wow, rare piece here. Uh, the original Scout was the size of the Ford Bronco, but actually beat it to market. Many people consider these the first SUVs with a long roof. Here is the rarely seen uh, pickup version with a functional bed and tailgate. Now, this is a very unusual engine. It has a slant four, which basically is half of the international 392 V8, uh, about 160 cubic inches, whatever it is, but a very unusual engine. 
Nice clean little pickup, $30,000 for a 1964 International Scout. And with that, we're going to check in with the next member of our broadcast team, April Rose. Here's something really cool from the George Shin Collection. It's a 1968 Chevelle SS. She is gleaming. It's got a period correct 396, 325 horsepower, Muncie M21, four speed, Posi track, 12 bolt rear end, front disc brakes, power steering, dual exhaust, perfect new interior. I mean, this is a great driver and a great add to anyone's collection. Super nice. Boy, and once again, the quality of the cars we're going to see today and tomorrow truly off the charts. 1984 Chevy K10 custom pickup up on the block right now. Well, this one's a uh, an unusual uh, long, well, I shouldn't say unusual, for the auction block, it's a long bit. The shorties are the ones that tend to get the most attention amongst restorers. But again, this is a half-toner with the uh, long bed. This one has been customized quite a bit. I see about a two or four inch lift blocks between the axle and leaf spring. But again, beautiful piece, like the paint. So this began as a K-10, which is your typical half-ton four-wheel drive pickup. Body off-frame restoration, only a 305 cubic inch V8 with an overdrive uh, automatic. On this one, new BFG all-terrain tires and beautiful candy apple red paint. Well, there it goes, $42,000. We're already into serious money. I can't tell you, we had a car cross the block before we came on the air that sold for $64,000. So to get to our number one spot, it's going to take more than sixty grand right now. All right, we got a Jeep behind it, 1984 CJ8 Scrambler. Well, the Scrambler, of course, was a long wheelbase, 103 inches, kind of a CJ pickup truck. Now, this one here has a 304 V8, but here's the deal. 1981 was the final year for a V8 option in a CJ, so it's been swapped in. This would have had a 258 six-banger, but again, customized from front to back in the V8 upgrades, not a problem. So this would have been born as the gentleman's Jeep. If there is one complaint about most Jeeps is their short wheelbase gives them a really choppy ride. So they built this extended wheelbase version uh, to appeal to a whole different class of customer. Of course, this one has since been highly modified. The aftermarket for Jeeps is probably bigger than it is for any other car model on the planet. That's true. Now, back in 1981, if you wanted a V8 in your CJ, you paid an extra $345. But again, by 84, it was no longer available. I like the fact that they didn't put an LS in this one. It's actually American Motors 304 with the distributor up front, so it's all in the family. Look at the big lugs on the treads of those uh, Toyo Open Country tires. This is definitely a go-anywhere piece. Uh, it has the get out of jail free kit in the back with the big tall jack in case you get it stuck. Well, $36,000 for that CJ8 Scrambler Custom as it rolls across the block. Got a wide variety that we've talked about here at Barrett Jackson. We're going to go from that Jeep to a 2003 Chevy SSR. Well, this is by far my favorite of the retro-styled vehicles Detroit turned out around 2000. This has a folding hardtop uh, that stacks behind the front seats, the only seats, and the bed is quite usable. There is plenty of room back there. Uh, this one has been treated uh, to some oak strips, uh, but the bed and tailgate make this a useful pickup. This one has some extra special provenance. This is Ed Welburn, chief stylist at General Motors for many years. This was his personal vehicle. So Ed Welburn, basically a, uh, a Bill Mitchell of a modern day. And this one has a low VIN, which is 120. So this was made for Mr. Ed Welburn, and he drove this. Great stuff. Wow. Ed's a great friend and a great friend of the collector car community. We see him at a lot of the concourse and vintage racing events. And if I didn't have one in my garage, I'd want this one. Uh, but these are great, great fun. Top up or top down? Yeah, the interesting thing, too, is he was able to watch this going down the entire line, inspecting as it, as it went along. So it's got a little, not just the name and not the connection, but had his fingerprints all over it. 
just remember, too, that the SSR was built between 2003 and 2006, and this is a first-year example, and yeah, it's the 120th one built, which is extra, extra special. That's amazing. Getting to supervise your car going down the production line for Ed Welburn, I mean, well, that's like Doug Yates getting to build his own engine for his new Ford GT, which he did. Well, this one just sold for 42000 makes it tied as the number two sale of the day, although I think as the day goes along, those numbers are going to go up. Don't forget, we have seven full hours of broadcast of the Barrett Jackson auction here today on FYI from noon Eastern to 7 p.m. And then tomorrow, we're back for six hours on the History Channel from noon until 6 p.m. Eastern time. And we're going to come back for one last cool down lap, an hour on FYI. Seven more hours tomorrow. And coming up in just a little bit, check this out. A 1956 Chevy Bel Air. That's right. Black and white interior matching the exterior. 265 cubic inch V8 under the hood. Welcome back to the Barrett Jackson Palm Beach auction. Yeah, it's a great week here. Big crowd on hand outside and inside, and everybody's enjoying the stuff that's crossing the block so far. Okay, you don't see a car on the block. It's because it was so big they couldn't get it on the block. They rolled it up the exit. It's this 1998 AM General Humvee. If you wonder what Humvee stands for, it's High Mobility Multi-Purpose Wheeled Vehicle, which has been colloquialized into Humvee. $15,000 for that beast of a Humvee. All right, moving back up to the regular part of the block. I love this. It's a 67 Pontiac Grand Prix convertible. Well, the Grand Prix was the top of the line uh, for two-door Pontiacs, four doors and wagons in the Bonneville line. But the Grand Prix was it. This one with its three-speed automatic and uh, a nicely nicely optioned convertible here with a front and rear speaker. Never mind stereo. AM radio. One speaker on the dash, one speaker between uh, the rear seats, and very special styling to differentiate it from any lesser Pontiac. And keep in mind, 1967 was the one and only year you could get a Grand Prix as a convertible. Now, when I see one of these, I'm reminded of our former beloved uh, friend, Christy Lee, former host. Her grandma bought one of these new, and Christy still owns it to this very day. But again, the Grand Prix was built between 62 and 2008, never as a convertible except for right here in 1967. Pretty rare body. Special rear panel and taillights and a special nose. Hideaway headlamp lamps contained within the loop bumper and these kind of louvered in turn signals uh, at the top of the nose. So a very distinctive styling because Pontiac wanted everybody to know you were driving the top of the line poncho for 1967. Light customizing happening. The rear bumper is body color. That's not something that would happen on, on the Grand Prix until the 1980s. So, a nice touch up. That would have been chrome, and it's been shaved a little bit, but again, very distinctive horizontal taillights, also seen on the GTO. Dual exhaust, of course, 389 four barrel power. Doesn't have the 428, which was an option, but again, a great American road cruiser. Less than 6,000 of these were made back in 1967, so there's more than a few, but still not a huge number built. And this one just sold for $35,000. Congratulations to those folks. And we're going to check in with the final member of our broadcast team, Christian Murphy, with some special guests. Thank you very much, Rick. We're up here in my perch with Craig Jackson, Chairman and CEO, Steve Davis, the President. Craig, charity and collections are two hallmarks, two, part of the DNA of the Bow Jackson brand. And today, there's a little bit of crossover and they collide. There is. So we have a great charity moment that's going to happen at 4.30 today uh, for Samaritan's Purse. Two great collections that we have from Mark Pylock's Muscle Car, American Muscle Car Museum and from the George Shin Collection. Both have donated a car, a 2009 Super Snake, similar to the one Steve sold in Las Vegas where it gave him the idea, and a Corvette Pace Car. And this is the first time we've ever combined two forces for one great cause with some great uh, people that are going to also help out. So you got to stay tuned for that one. Steve, we're making history today. Never before. Two cars on the one docket, as I understand. How did you thread the needle and make that happen with two significant collectors? Well, I'll tell you, 
pretty much indicative of the entire docket. We put five gallons in a gallon bucket. We did not drop one ounce. It's been an amazing journey. But you have the personalities with the cars. You have the expectations, which is true with every single car here. But I will tell you, it's been amazing. The people have been amazing. The excitement has been, been unimaginable. And it's going to be one incredible afternoon. They need to tune in, watch us on FYI, because it's going to be one of those moments. You're going to have to see it to believe it. Well, I think any charity is for a good cause, but this one is particularly relevant at this time. And I believe that we will also have information on the screen that people will be able to donate over yeah. and above. And if those don't, people at home don't know, so Franklin Graham has actually been in Ukraine and in Poland. This money is all going for helping the refugees that have had to leave their homes with just the, what they have on their backs. And the community, the European community has brought them in, but there's just so many more things that need to be done. He's actually gone in, and we'll show the video there, actually in trying to get these people out, get them the things that they need. So it's a great time, and everybody is going in the same direction. Some great special guests will be joining us up there to help raise a lot of money for a great cause. Absolutely, Murph, and to that point, it's going to be so special for us at Barrett Jackson, working with two incredible people, George Shin and Mark Pylock. But the cause is always the star of the auction. It's about what we're going to do to help some of the most incredible people in need ever. And for us to be a part of that and to share it with our audience and FYI, it's going to be one of those moments that uh, uh, we'll all remember. Well, I know a hell of a lot of work has gone into it. I thank you for all of that. But it's going to be another wonderful moment and more history here at Barrett Jackson. Rick, we are going to take it back to you, my friend. All right, thanks a lot. We appreciate your time. And up on the block now, uh, 1930 Ford Model A Deluxe Roadster. One of the more desirable body styles, perhaps the four-door fate and convertible will be the pin pinnacle one, but again, with the Roadster, the rumble seat, a whole lot of fun. Not a fast car, but a nice restoration. So why do they call that storage area in the back of your car the trunk? This is why. In the early days of the automobile, there would be a rack on the back and a steamer trunk would sit here. Uh, and there would be handles to be able to remove it, take it into the hotel or into the house, but the trunk was not part of the car as it is today. Well, that trunk and the rest of the car just sold for $39,000 for that Ford Model A. The folks up in the skybox. Something much more modern, well, relatively speaking, a 1962 Oldsmobile Starfighter, Starfire convertible. Yeah, the Starfighter, that was a Lockheed, uh, F-104, I think, but this is the Starfire, and look at this gleaming brushed stainless steel trim the whole length of the car uh, with some cast and chromed accents. Again, every GM division wanted everybody to know when you were driving their top-of-the-line car, and this was it. Yeah, 62 was the second year for the Starfire, which was Oldsmobile's, well, Thunderbird fighter. They all had bucket seats, leather, and 62 was the year that the Starfire was available as a hard top. But this is the more desirable convertible body. There were only 7,149 of these built in 1962. Power comes from a 394 cubic inch, second generation Oldsmobile Rocket V8. Uh, not the same engine that later would become the 455, the W30. This is a pre predecessor to those, but again, same high compression overhead valve V8. Now, Oldsmobiles were luxury cars, so you're not going to see one of these with a full complement of gauges. A Speedo, a fuel gauge, and the idiot lights, so-called. But you could order a console-mounted tachometer, and there it is. I would not want to take my eyes that far off the road to read it and know when to shift, but the automatic transmission does that for you. Well, we've got a couple of bidders. Well, one of them is John Stalupi. One of the uh, people selling a big collection of cars here this week and a big buyer. We also had an internet buyer as well. And away it goes for $30,000 for a 1962 Oldsmobile Starfire. We'll slap the sold sticker on and we will take a brief break here at Barrett Jackson. But we're going to come back to more spectacular cars in just a moment. Uh, back here at Barrett-Jackson. Yeah, it's the world's greatest collector car auction with the world's greatest cars. 
Boy, that Cadillac is long. Just goes on forever. One of the cars we'll see crossing the block through the course of the auction. And up there right now, a car we previewed just a little while ago. Black and white on the outside, black and white on the inside, a 56 Chevy Bel Air. Kind of the Black Widow paint treatment that we saw in 1955 on NASCAR cars. Very highly optioned car. Factory air, power steering, power brakes, power windows, continental kit on the back, dual exhaust, Wonder Bar radio, and Steve, the power pack. It's good to see the 265 was uh, out for its second year. This one has the optional power pack, which to your point is a four-barrel carburetor and dual exhaust, which bumped it from about 162 to about 180 horsepower. This does have the power glide automatic, but keep in mind of the 1.6 million Chevrolets built in 1956, just 131,000 were two-door hardtops like this. Well, $43,000, and right now, that magic number, getting into the 40000 range, is what it's going to take to crack into our top 10. The number of thirty-six dollars and $38,000 cars going down. All right, let's check in in the McGuire staging lanes and Tyler Hoover. Yes, hello. I'm way back here at the end of this Cadillac, lot 341, a 1976 Cadillac Coupe de Ville, which is 233 inches. That's like almost two feet longer than a Ford Expedition or a Cadillac Escalade. And this is a very, very nice example. Supposedly 26,000 original miles, black paint, red interior, still has the original eight track cassette. Well, and then under the hood is something also huge. Last year of the 500 cubic inch V8, after this they started going smaller and smaller, but that still didn't mean horsepower. We are very much in the malaise era, so that was 210 horsepower to pilot this giant land yacht down the road. It certainly has presence. I love this era of Cadillacs. Yeah, just the door alone is massive because there's only two. You got to get in that back seat and that single door on either side is the only way to do it. 1989 Chevy K5 Blazer up in the block. Well, on the back here, the word fuel injection, which debuted in 1987, replacing the feedback Rochester carburetor. A lot of people were afraid of it, but actually to open the door to better fuel economy, better cold start uh, fire ups, and a nice example. And Mike Joy, to your point the other day, the two tone paint scheme, yes, bring it back, Chevrolet and GM, right? Oh, I love it on these, Steve. Uh, it's just so distinctive and so striking. Uh, this truck underwent a complete frame on restoration, meaning the body was not separated uh, from the chassis, but much more than just a cosmetic restoration, it does retain its original engine. Well done. And speaking of that engine, the beauty is that fuel injection bumped power from 160 to 210. So, you know, the fuel injection was seen as, oh, we're going backwards, it's emissions. Nope, more power, 210 horse. Well, we got a new number two sale of the day. All those folks are happy to be a part of it. $60,000 for that 1989 Chevy K5 Blazer. Second only to a 1970 Chevelle that sold earlier today for $64,000. We're staying in the Chevrolet family. Go to 1995 and a ZR1. The King of the Hill Corvette, and I love these uh, wheels, very similar to the Mercedes AMG five spoke wheels, much lighter than the standard Corvette wheel. And this car is much wider, four inches wider to each side at the rear to accommodate the huge wheels and tires. And look at this very unique engine. There it is, the LT5, four valve, four cam, and the L, or the, the ZR1s have their own VIN sequence from number one through number 448. This car happens to be amongst that bunch. This is number 143, so built in the first third of production. These are all six-speed manuals, no automatics. Those special engines were not built in a Chevrolet plant. They were built at Mercury Marine, and I believe Oklahoma, uh, specially built for the ZR1. Now, it's no longer the highest performance Corvette. Uh, it's since been eclipsed by later models. Still, great collectible. And it just sold for $50,000, meaning that is the number three sale today. It looks like our good friend John Stalupi is the man who's going to take that one home. You like that Corvette? Well, check this one out from 1971. It's a 350, 270 horsepower edition, Ontario Orange. We'll see it very soon. Back here in Palm Beach, up at the block right now, we've got a cool car, a 1987 Buick Grand National. 
87 was similar to the 86, but not the same. It lost the chrome band across the top of the hood. Buick became a smaller letter here. And another 10 horsepower and 15 foot-pounds of torque for 245 and 330, 55. But again, not a T-roof car, which if you're a racer, is a good thing. I like this one, uh, Steve, with only 63,000 actual miles. Uh, Buick used that V6 turbocharged emblem on everything from Grand Nationals to cars that raced at the Indy 500. Dual exhaust properly treated on this one. No chrome adornments right up behind the tire there on the right and left side. And uh, very unadorned, but totally there if you know what you're looking for. This has, of course, the chrome wheels. Beautiful car. Well, the hammer's down $47,500 for that 87 Buick Grand National. And it really reminds us of a special auction moment that happened in Scottsdale just a few months ago when the very first Grand National went across the auction block. Well, this was not just the last Grand National, it was the last G-Body car built by the Pontiac plant as we get to $400,000 bid. The car was signed by all the plant workers. The president of General Motors was there as it rolled off the line. What a piece of history. We've got multiple phone bidders. we got bidders here on the block. There's a lot of interest in this car. The Buick Grand National is arguably the greatest American performance car of the 80s, and the Hammer Falls. $500,000 for the last Grand National that ever came off the line. And of course, that $500,000 was for the very last Grand National to roll off the block, to roll out of the factory. And up on the block right now, we got a 1970 Chevy C10. Good money. Right now, it's at $63,000. It is now the number one sale of the day, closing in on $70,000. Yeah, it's a nice piece. This has been given a V8 swap, 4.8 LS engine. Now, the second spot of the VIN tells us what it was born with. We see an S, not the E for V8. So the S tells us it had a 250 cube six-cylinder engine. That was then. Well, now got a V8. That's cool. Great custom. Uh, has a chop top. Has McGuffey suspension. Six-spoke wheels because it's six lug hubs. Beautiful build. Wooden bed floor, get either steel or wood, you choose at the time. Well, this one didn't sneak by. $80,000 for a 1970 Chevy C10 custom pickup truck. That is now the number one sale of the day on our second day of Barrett Jackson auction. Let's take a look at our top five. After that pickup truck, we got a Chevelle, and of course, we got a Blazer, we got a Corvette, and that Grand National that sold just a few moments ago. That's the number five sale. And of course, as the day goes by, we're going to see the cars in that top five and the trucks in that top five definitely move around. 1979 Jeep CJ5. This one is a silver anniversary edition. Indeed it is. You know, I think uh, the Pontiac Trans Am in the mid-70s showed the rest of Detroit automakers that if you blitz things up, you could create a special edition and sell it for more. That's what we have here. The Renegade package was certainly a CJ5 with extra sauce added. 79, of course, you could get a V8, but this one is a six-cylinder with a three-speed manual. I don't see any silver anniversary badging on the exterior of this one, uh, nor do I see it in the... In the inside, uh, this has had a repaint. There are some surgery scars uh, from bodywork, but one of 800 in Quicksilver. And those seats you see inside, those are Bostrom Thin Lines, kind of a generic seat that was also used, yes, in 68 Hemi Darton Barracuda applications, and yes, by Jeep. The rear axles are AMC Model 20, pretty rugged piece. Well, and you see uh, we had a, the gentleman on the right manages the internet bidders, and he pulled in a $40,000 bid at the very end, and that was the winning bid for that 1979 Jeep CJ5 Silver Anniversary Edition. We're going to check in with April Rose. we got a couple pace cars here, 1978 over there and right here. This is how to stand out 101 1998 Corvette pace car in your 
face with those bright yellow accents. Now they built just over a thousand of them. 5.7 LS1, four speed automatic. Now take a peek inside. You got these super high contrasting bright yellow sports seats against that black. Great combination, yellow, yellow stitching in those seats, pace car logos all over, very cool. Now, here's a detail I want you to check out on these wheels, very subtle details in the painted five spoke design. You got yellow lug nut covers, a small carbon fiber pattern ring around the polished silver center that has etched in it the C5 logo. It's kind of like a treasure hunt out here with these, girl. That's very cool. 1998, a great year at the Indy 500. My good friend Eddie Cheever won the race that year. So uh, that was a perfect car for him. Very colorful. All Rick, right. I want to go back a second to that Jeep. I just checked with Dennis Collins, who is an expert on Jeeps. He says that 25th anniversary was indeed a factory model. It was promoted exclusively through ads in Playboy magazine, and Jeep sold a thousand of them. The highest selling CJ5 variant ever. There you go. Good to have an expert around when you need one. Up on the block right now, this is a car that we previewed just a little while ago, a 1971 Corvette. This one's a 350, 270-horsepower convertible. Well, it's not a big block. It's not an LT1. This is the base Corvette, which most of them were. This is the M40 Automatic, which is a no-charge alternate to the four-speed manual. Kind of a lightly optioned car. You don't see uh, such niceties, say, as power windows. Uh, it does have an aftermarket stereo added and uh, a two top car. The soft top hides beneath and the hard top is removable and stowable and is usually seen like this in body color. And speaking of options, this has standard positive traction, which was made standard in 1970. Before that, all the way back to 57, you paid $43 extra for a clutch type differential. Crazy but true. Well, and with that, $40,000 takes that really nice little Ontario orange 1971 Corvette. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll come back to Barrett Jackson in Palm Beach. Oh, beautiful day here in Palm Beach. Absolutely wonderful cars sitting out there. Let's check in with Mike Joy. Mega collector John Stalupi had so many cars, he had to buy an empty shopping mall to house them and turned it into the Cars of Dreams Museum here in Palm Beach. Beautiful facility, great collection of cars. But John is clearing house. He's brought 38 of those great cars here to sell at Barrett Jackson. And the centerpiece is this, a 2018 Ford GT in the very rare Heritage livery, recalling the 1967 24 Hour of Le Mans winner driven by A.J. Foyt and Dan Gurney. Of all the Heritage editions, this is the one. Other great cars that will be offered for sale include a 1958 Cadillac Eldorado Baritz Restomod. This 1967 Corvette Coupe, also a Restomod with a modern powertrain. And this faithfully restored to as new, 1957 DeSoto Adventurer Convertible with a dual quad Hemi power plant. And when these cars are sold, what's John going to do? Start buying again. He's got a big garage to fill. Boy, it's an amazing collection of cars that he's got. And he does a great thing where he loans out his Cars of Dream Museums to great charities, raises money for a lot of good causes. He's a good guy and he's always fun to see here at Barrett Jackson, always fun to talk cars with him. And the first of his collection are starting across the block. They're going to be going in chunks. And what we're seeing is kind of the beginning, the smaller cars that are going across the block. And between today and tomorrow, I can tell you what, the prices for the cars that he purchased and he's selling this week are definitely going to go up. This is a really fun piece that he bought. It's a 1972 Honda Z600. These have an inline two-cylinder engine. Don't confuse this with the Civic, which arrived one year later in 1973, which really, with the Volkswagen Rabbit, revolutionized small car buying. But there it is, man. Look at that little air-cooled two-cylinder inline. 
Now, here's the thing about these mega collectors and the cars they bring to sell. Because John Stalupi owned this, and he has a full-time staff to curate the museum, to maintain and improve the cars that he buys, they sell for big money. A Honda CT70 mini bike just rolled across. They routinely sell at Barrett Jackson for three to four thousand dollars. Hammer price eighty five hundred, twice what a normal one sold for earlier today. So expect big money and maybe some records as these special mega collector cars cross the block. I dig the leaf spring rear suspension on this. The rear valance. You can see the shackles in the end of the springs poking out. Yeah, kind of simple. Now, the Civic would replace this with independent suspension, quite a bit more evolved car, but it all kind of started right here. This bumper and this panel, this drops down to access the spare tire. No room for it inside the car. Between 1970 and 74, 40,586 of these were made. Not rare, but find one today. Good luck. Yeah, they made both the N600 and the Z600. The N600 was a little boxier. The Z600, I love the shape of this. Very sporty looking. Look at this number. Come on. This little pocket size Honda just sold for $20,000. Can you believe it? Think of all the fun you can have for $20,000 with that car. Absolutely great. Once again, these are cars from the Cars of Dreams collection, John Stalupi's collection. Don't forget Barrett-Jackson.com. That's where you can go to check out the entire list of cars that are going to be crossing the block. If you want to see what cars are coming out of which collection, it's all listed there. Just go to Barrett-Jackson.com. All right, next, you don't see it on the block, but we're seeing it on the pictures here in the room. That's because it's a 1956 wooden boat. It's called a Correct Craft Collegian Wooden Boat, and it's part of the Stalupi collection. Well, you got to remember that fiberglass hulled boats of today were a novelty in 1956. Of course, the Corvette was an exotic thing in 53, so wood was the norm for your leisure boats in the day. Look at the spear down the side. That's reminiscent of 55 Chevrolet styling. This concludes the Dorsey trailer. And note one anomaly with this boat. The steering wheel is on the left side. In boating, a lot of them have the wheel on the right. This is V8 powered. You gotta remember that uh, Chrysler Marine, Gray Marine, and uh, even American Motors all created and produced engines for motorboat use. Let's take a peek and see what we got here. There is, yeah, that is uh, a Ford Y-Block, which is probably a 272 in use. And again, for marine use, they have different exhaust manifolds, different induction. You can see their side draft, two side draft carburetors. Those are Y8 series carbs. Same thing used on a 53 and 4 Corvette in the boat. This is described as having been a special order from the factory with unique touches like that. A left-hand mounted steering wheel. And they point out to the crowd that, uh, yes, you do get the trailer, but no, you don't get the vehicle hauling the trailer. So it's the boat, the trailer together. It's a good combination. Now, when you hear a whistle in the background, that is not an onrushing train. That is the bidder's assistant located up in the VIP luxury lounge or the muscle lounge. And that whistle is, there it goes again. That's his way of getting the auctioneer's attention several hundred feet away on stage. And here's that gray marine, again, Ford Y block. And these are side draft Y8 series carburetors right there. These are pretty rare items. Same stuff used on Corvette. Once again, very rare if you're restoring a vet. This is a good source for them. I think you want to park this one out. Well, there we go, $40,000. John Salupi saying goodbye to that correct craft wooden boat. Very cool thing. All right, let's check in with Tyler Hoover. Well, how about some fake wood here? This is a car that's really near and dear to my heart. Lot 352, a 1989 Jeep Grand Wagoneer. The Wagoneer had like a four decade long production cycle, and this is the end of the line here. 1991 actually but it was one of the last cars to have a carbureted v8 sold in the united states you can see this one's beautifully restored and nicely updated dynamite uh, dynamat interior for insulation but i also noticed it has a chevy center console so you can have cup holders uh, also had a nice repaint and they redid the wood which is something i have done before and i'll say this it is 
quite a pain to do. Of course, this is totally fake. It's not real wood. This one, they went with a different style of wood. It should be a cherry, uh, style, sort of like a teak. But this one, it's a different wood grain that I've seen. But you see this trim here? This all goes at an angle. You can see there's cutouts. When they ship it to you, it's all straight. So you have to bend it to form to put on the car and hope it sticks. You use a hair dryer to kind of loosen it up. And let me tell you, it's not easy. It took hours and hours and hours to get this result. But when you do it, man, it looks fantastic. I love the new Wagoneers too, but it needs a wood kit just like this to really set it off. Oh, I'm sure there's more than a few people coming out with wood kits for the new Wagoneers. Awesome. Thanks. We appreciate that. Up on the block now is a car that uh, April Rose previewed a little while ago, this 1998 Corvette Pace Car. Only 3,000 miles on this uh, Corvette Pace Car edition. The purple paint, the tape graphics, the yellow wheels, the yellow interiors, that is all factory. And that it came from Chevrolet just that way, so everybody would know who was pacing the Indy 500 that year. Well, congratulations to that young man right there. I like the way his, uh, his outfit kind of matches the car, too. $41,000, they're going to get to take it home. Sign the paperwork. Remember, you pay a 10% buyer's commission, and then you get to take the car home. We're going to go with another pace car. This is the other one that April talked about, this 1978 Corvette pace car. Well, as we saw earlier, the ZR1 Corvette, Chevrolet gave them unique serial numbers, and that also happened in 78 with the pace cars. These were built uh, number one through 6,502, which was the total production run. This is number 390 of that 6,502 run. So kind of a low number car. Again, this is the base engine, the L48, not the L82. It's 195 horsepower under the hood. I was 28 years old when these were built. Um, you know, starving artist kind of thing. But I talked a Chevy dealer into letting me order the one and only one he was going to get. And months later, as we were waiting for it, I think he discovered he could have sold it for a whole lot more money than the sticker price that I had on my contract. He called and wanted several thousand dollars more in deposit or I'd lose the car. And I lost the car. Ah, I remember 1978, I'm 14, Carroll Chevrolet in Westbrookfield, Mass. I wasn't about to buy one of these, but one came in, and I remember looking at the window sticker, availability charge, 2,000 bucks, which, of course, I'm sure they tripled that. But these were cars that made the New York Times and even the Wall Street Journal as collectibles, and this is one of the first self-aware collectible cars. A friend of mine in Waterbury, Connecticut, got his hands on one of these brand new, rolled it out of the dealership for around $15,000, rolled it straight to Southern Auto Auction in South Windsor, Connecticut, and it crossed the block there one week later for 42 grand. These were instant collectibles. Here's the thing, keep in mind, base price on this was 13,653 bucks, which was $4,300 more than a lesser basic Corvette. So, a good investment. Well, $30,000, the investment for that gentleman right there for a 1978 Corvette Coupe Pace Car. The guy who paid more than 40 back in 78 probably lose money on the deal. Coming up in just a little bit, love this thing. It's a 1927 Ford Model T pickup. That's right, just 176 cubic inches and that four-cylinder motor under the hood. There are multiple incredible collections being offered at Barrett Jackson Palm Beach, and this one is the most interesting to me. It is the George Shin Collection, a legendary man known for public speaking, philanthropy, and a very diverse business interest, and obviously, he has a very diverse interest in cars. This offering encapsulates basically the entire history of the automobile, starting with a 1927 Ford Model T pickup truck, which was America's first mass-produced car. And then we go to an icon of the fabulous 50s and a beautifully restored 1957 Chevy Bel Air, and then all the way into the modern era with this 2005 Lamborghini Gallardo, almost 500 horsepower out of the Italian V10 paddle shift transmission, and just about everything in between. I have never seen a more diverse offering ever at Barrett-Jackson. Yeah, fun, great collection of cars that he has assembled. It'll be cool to see those up on the block very soon. Looking forward to them. And, of course, he's got a great collection, which means great prices, solid numbers that we'll see here at Barrett-Jackson in Palm Beach. Up on the block right now, we got a 1976 Dodge Ram Charger. This one's a custom. 
Well, Ram Chargers, the word. If we look right here, the factory logo on this is very reminiscent of the mid-60s Dodge Ram Chargers. Now, keep in mind, these were built between 1974 and 1993, so Jim Thornton, Tom Hoover were not involved. But this one has been modified quite a bit. Born a 318 now has a Cummins 24-valve turbo diesel. We got a bidder on the block. We got a bidder up by the skybox. He's still thinking about it, debating about whether he wants to get in one more time. We're up to thirty-eight thousand dollars, and indeed he does. Now the Ram Charger was an example of uh, Dodge playing follow the leader. You might call this a loving tribute to the Chevy Blazer, but very effective vehicle. Now forty thousand dollars, the price for a 1976 Dodge Ram Charger. How do you get bigger and better? Check this out, a 1976 Cadillac Eldorado convertible. Final year for the full-size Eldorado, and of course for the convertible body style. Uh, this with a split bench seat would easily seat six in comfort, or more if you have a large family. Uh, it's been nicely enjoyed, but gosh, Steve, this car presents as almost new. 76 was the uh, second year for the rectangular headlights, which were all the rage in Detroit. And 76 also the second year for a sort of a redesign. The fender skirts of 74 were eliminated, giving the car a sportier look, that big open wheelhouse in the back. Taking a page from Lincoln, the top stack was nearly flat, not quite. A little bit of bulge here for the convertible top as it's dropped and covered by what is called a boot cover. An option not seen here in 1975 and 6 was Bendix electronic fuel injection, which is kind of a precursor to the throttle body stuff that we have today. Although $647 is what you paid for that. But look at dual ex the single exhaust on this, which is normal. Cadillac abandoned dual exhaust after 1961. Single exhaust was quieter, but flowed the same number. You have a little game called Where Does the Gas Go? And a lot of time you'll have a folding headlight or a hidden opening here you lift the license plate and that's where the fuel filler is uh, a location that was very common on General Motors cars but later found to be at risk in rear end collisions so now just about every car has its fuel filler located on the rear quarter panel on either one side or the other so how long is this Cadillac well total length is 224 inches but the wheelbase is 126, nearly 100 inches of overhang on the front and rear of that Cadillac. It is massive. $60,000 means that is now tied as the number three sale of the day for this 1976 Cadillac Eldorado convertible. Up on the block right now, station wagon time. The folks that love station wagons are gonna love this one in particular. It's a 1969 Dodge Coronet 500. Oh, the station wagon was the car that really helped the American baby boom happen. And, of course, uh, we see wagons all over the place. But this is special. A factory black paint car in any body style is rare, let alone a wagon. And this one has the G-Code 383 two-barrel, which was a mere $70 more expensive than the 318 two-barrel small block. So it's a big block. Uh, automatic car. Well documented. Well documented indeed. Here is the original window sticker, the original bill of sale, the order sheets at the assembly pack, the build sheet is replicated on the other side, the warranty book, and this car is in phenomenal condition. And this is what we call the, the Mopar B body, and this is the same essential platform that underpinned the Super B, the Dodge Charger, and really uh, a nice one here. The dual exhaust we see on this has been added. It would have been a single exhaust as the two-barrel 383. The duals would have come on a 383 four-barrel, but again, no problem. Doesn't really hurt this at all. Gotta love that tailgate. Window up and down here. This little turn that, and the window of power goes up and down with the key. Pretty cool, little logo. Dave Weiss, who's the uh, Barrett-Jackson Mopar expert, was looking this over the other day, and he called this what he calls a baseline car. It is so original. This is the one you use to take pictures of to restore other cars similar to it. $30,000 for all of that originality on the 1969 Dodge Coronet 500 station wagon. All right, time for the George Shin Collection. We've been talking about it for a number of days. Now it's time for it to be up here on the block, the very first car, a 1927 Ford Model T pickup. And 
I think we're going to squeeze in some Haggerty fast facts on this one. Model T's were built between 1907 and 19, 1907 and 1927, often regarded as the first affordable automobile. And at one point, it was the most sold car in the United States. They sold more of them than any car. That was until the Volkswagen Beetle came along. And, of course, even that's been eclipsed later on by the Toyota Camry. Indeed, the final year for the Model T and also the final year for no front brakes on Ford passenger cars. The 1928 Model A would replace this with standard front brakes. Now, if we can back off and show both front wheels together, you will see that these front tires have positive camber, not negative. Uh, it sticks out more at the top than at the bottom. That's because when this car was new, most of the roads in America were not paved. And that positive camber helped the car track straight on rutted roads. Nice to see that feature kept here. Well, you got to remember the type of roads you had back then. I mean, we didn't have paved roads around the country. The ability to get from one town to the next, you needed something that could go through the ruts and the mud and everything else. And by the way, I said the Toyota Camry was the most sold. Obviously, it's a Toyota Corolla, which has sold so many around the world. Now, you see the rear brakes there. They are drum brakes. What you don't see are hydraulic lines, or what hot rodders would later call juice brakes. Henry Ford I believed that cable brakes were sufficient. So you push down that pedal, it operates a cable, much like the emergency brake in most cars, but no hydraulic brakes in Fords for a long time to come. One thing that did appear for the first time is shatterproof glass in 1927. We want to give it the test, but theoretically that won't cut you too badly if you have a crash. Well, there it is, the first of the George Shin collection, that Model T 1927 pickup just sold here at Barrett Jackson. We're going to check in with April Rose. Check out this 1969 Oldsmobile Custom complete frame off rotisserie restoration with custom pieces to get that Hearst Olds look. You got that cool rear wing, a metal 1970 Ram Air hood, Hearst badging just all around. Take a look up front. It's got a built 455 and a Speed Tech 200 horse shot nitrous, four speed manual with Hearst shifter. I mean, check it out inside. It is all business pro comp gauges aircraft style switches for that beautiful nitrous fuel and fans. I mean, when it comes to customization, Rick, there are no rules. Yeah, and that's such a true tribute to those 442. What a great looking car. If you like Oldsmobiles, that's definitely the way to go. Another from the George Shin collection. I love this, a 1955 Ford Fairlane Crown Victoria. Well, the Fairlane Dynasty starts here, 1955, replacing the crest line of 54 as the top unit. This has an aftermarket, probably a Foxcraft Continental Kit add-on. It was a classic add-on, but not a dealer piece or a factory add-on, but it looks good. Fairlane was the name of Henry Ford's estate where he lived in Dearborn. It's now open to the public on occasion as a museum, part of the uh, Greenfield Village Henry Ford Museum Complex. A lot of great styling touches here, very much influenced by the jet age of fighters that uh, kind of influenced all of Detroit. Uh, note that big pointed hood ornament uh, as look, note the wire wheels, the fender skirts, all the stainless trim on this. This is great. And speaking of that stainless trim, this is the top line Crown Victoria. Put in the Crown in Victoria is this tiara style roof band, which was again in its first year. It would be used by Ford in a, for a few years, but really a beautiful touch that is. But the tiara roof band, standard on the Crown Vic. $38,000 for a 1955 Ford Fairlane Crown Victoria. Once again, part of the George Shin collection. From 1955, we're going to move forward nearly a decade to 1964, and it's so interesting to look at from an automotive design perspective what we get in 1955 and what it looks like in 1964 with this Ford Galaxy 500. Well, a thematic connection can be made. This engine is a 4.6 liter dual overhead cam. It's the camera. Well, 64 was the year that Ford began playing with the 427 camera, which would arrive in 1967. Now, uh, 65. Now, this is not a factory camera, but it just shows you that Ford's been playing with overhead cam architecture since 1964. Uh, but again, this car was born with a 352, but it's nice to see a modern engine upgrade in this classic. So the base Ford 
full size for 1955 was the Custom. That's what the police cars were. Then the Custom 500, then the Galaxy, then the Galaxy 500, and finally this. You see the badging on the back. This is a Galaxy 500 XL. This is the top of the line for the full size Ford in 1964. I like the addition of the five-speed manual transmission. This would have had potentially a four-speed top loader in 64, but the five-speeds are more modern with overdrive, so you hit the uh, the highway and you drop those RPMs and cruise quietly, and a better top end, technically, with the overdrive ratio. This was the total performance era at Ford. I remember a big double-page magazine ad full of Ford race cars and drivers. Must have been incredibly expensive to produce, but, you know, Dan Gurney was there and A.J. Fi I mean, everybody who raced a Ford. Uh, Dino Don Nicholson, they were all in that ad with their race cars, and no CGI. It was all shot at one time with all those cars and drivers in one place. I remember that ad, Mike. There was a silhouette of each car on the next page with a number on it identifying whose car. I always took my eye to the... Uh, Overhead cam Mustang of uh, Gas Ronda. <laughs> but yeah, beautiful ad. Great ad. Google it. $48,000 for that 64 Ford Galaxy 500 means that is now easily into our top 10 as the number seven sale of the day so far. Part of that George Chin collection. And up behind it, the final car for this set of cars from the George Chin collection. I love this. It's a 1932 Chevy Street Rod. Well, the shape says 32 Chevrolet. Everything underneath, though, says uh, says all modern. There's a modern coil spring suspension uh, with A-frames up and down, rack and pinion steering. Uh, a gorgeous, gorgeous build, but it, there, it's no 32. It's all new. And many times, these are based on fiberglass. Well, I bring my little plastic magnet, and yeah, it sticks. This is a steel-bodied car. Very cool. Chevrolet, 1929, came out with something called the Stove Bolt 6, which replaced the four-banger seen in most other vehicles and really kind of put Ford on the track to saying, oh, yeah, Chevrolet, we're going to go you one better with a V8 for the price of a 6 in 1932. So the horsepower wars kind of started in the 30s. Now, the taillights with the Chevy bow tie, that's similar to original. The blue dot lenses are not. Hot rodders like to add those little blue dots because when you get far back from this car, the taillights all appear purple. Now, talk about where does the gas go. This isn't just the filler. This is the gas tank back here uh, right in front of the bumper. Not the safest place for it, but there it is. I think the... Uh, NHTSA did not exist in 1932, but this one does have something cool. It's a 350 under the hood with a B&M Street Charger, and that's a supercharger, belt-driven, like a Roots-type deal. These were very popular in the oh, in the 80s and 90s. The B&M. It's a miniature supercharger, but it certainly uh, gives that 350 the feel of a 450 at full boost. Well, we are still in you couldn't build it for that territory with the high bid, which has just crossed through $40,000. Interesting. We've actually got three bidders who are showing interest. We've got a couple of them in the skybox. We've got one on the floor, all trying to show that not moving it up a lot each time, but 1,000, 2,000 at a shot. Love the chrome on the bumpers. It even extends to the supports, which is not something that would have been factory done. So it's overdone to show, and that's okay when you're shooting for trophies. Now you saw the gentleman at the bottom shake his hands, wipe his hand, go back to you. And this gentleman up in the skybox gets the winning bid at $52,000 for that 1932 street rod from the George Shin collection. All right, roll it behind it. Not part of the George Shin collection, now just part of our regular collection of cars here, a 1989 Jeep Grand Wagoneer, and I think this is the one that Tyler Hoover previewed for us. Well, this is a first-generation SJ Series Wagoneer. This is the longest-running production vehicle, full 28 years, 1963 through 1991, twice as long as the Fox Mustang, and even longer than the Gen 3 Challenger, 2008 through 2023. But again, an AMC 360 under the hood, nice. 
Uh, this is the original engine to this car. It has been rebuilt. Uh, it has a rebuilt transmission. Maybe not the one it was born with. David E. Davis, once the editor of Car and Driver magazine and the founder of Automobile magazine, declared these Grand Wagoneers as his favorite car ever, and he had quite a succession of them in his driveway. For many years after these stopped being produced, they were in high demand and commanded very high prices uh, with fairly low miles and minimal rust. Another noted owner of a Grand Wagoneer was Bill Hera, a noted uh, collector of uh, the 1960s and 70s Hera's uh, casinos. Well, he had one of these things with a Ferrari V12 mounted in it, and I think it still exists somewhere in a collection. Why? Because he could. <laughs> This does have Quadra track, which was an AMC development, meaning that in the hubs on the front, you will not find any kind of a little toggle. This went into automatic overdrive when you kick the switch inside, so you didn't have to get out and get muddy. But again, Quadra track was an American Motors uh, innovation of the mid 70s, it was an exclusive for a couple of years. So AMC had it, Ford and GM and Dodge did not. These were big with the country club set around New England anyhow. These were upscale vehicles and pretty expensive. There must have been a ton of profit built into these. And certainly this is part of the reason why Chrysler was so eager to purchase the Jeep brand as well as the AMC car brand. But Jeep was a moneymaker and continues to be for whoever owns it. I love the way this one's been kind of lightly resto modded. Just a few touches to make it just a better driving car, and away it goes for $52,000 here at the Barrett Jackson Collector Car Auction in Palm Beach. Big crowd here in Palm Beach inside the South Florida Arena. Fairgrounds Expo Center. Boy, we got all those names in there. And up on the block right now, we got a 1970 GMC Sierra 1500, but this one's a custom. Yeah, very nicely customized. Uh, an ARE fiberglass tonneau on this one. American Racing Baja wheels with a big 33 inch uh, Firestone on and off road tires. And the step side bed. Uh, kind of a neat touch on this, but that's factory. $48,000 means it is just barely tied at number 10 for sales on the day right now. Sign the paperwork and away it goes. Right behind it, we get a 1940 Ford Custom Deluxe Convertible. What a beautiful car this is, you know, and you got to remember, still has the flathead, still has the transverse leaf springs first seen on the Model T. But again, you know, uh, didn't really need much more than that with the average cruising speed back then, maybe 45, 50 miles an hour. The interstate system was long, far away, but this does have the factory radio. Here's the antenna right here, which would turn around and be tuned by means of this little crank. Now, you got to wonder if this car heard the broadcast of the Pearl Harbor attack and how much history and how much information that radio antenna picked up. It doesn't talk, you can only wonder. Well, this body style, with not a lot of change, uh, actually would continue on to the start of World War II and a lot of the underpinnings of these cars, even beyond. Ford did not get a complete restyling until 1949. That's right, production in 1940 was 543,000 cars, of which only 23,704 were convertible. So very much in a minority then, and now trying to find uh, you know, an original like this is uh, about impossible, but here it is. Price on this was uh, $850, which was a full $170 more than a business coupe. But check that out, $850 bucks new, which sounds crazy today. But back then, you know, it would probably be like about a $30,000 car today, maybe $40. Well, there it goes, $42,000. And we talk about a custom deluxe. We're not talking about custom as in customized. That was the name for it back then. Don't forget, go to Barrett-Jackson.com. That's where you can see the full list of cars that have yet to cross the block and those that have already crossed the block. You can do your research, dream about what you might want to buy as it crosses the block. And up there right now, we got a 1969 Lincoln Continental Custom. Well, this one's a full resto mod, and by that we mean it appears to be restored on the outside, but it has been all changed uh, underneath that factory sheet metal. But 
professionally lowered, big wheels and tires, big block four, 60 cubic inch V8 in this one. And 1969 was a final year for this styling cycle and those crazy suicide doors. Uh, and again, there was a convertible model of this, but that was dropped after 67. But yeah, beautiful classic American stuff. Those suicide doors are iconic. Yeah, I really like what they've done with this, with the blacked out bumpers in the front and the back. It's got a lowered stance. It almost kind of reminds me of the Black Beauty, which of course was a Chrysler Imperial, but it's got that same kind of stylish look. Very nicely done. Big 20 inch US bags with uh, rubber band tires. Quite sleek. The term suicide door implies the idea that when you're getting out of the back seats and you open this door right here, if somebody passes you quickly and closely, boom, you're, uh, you're going to get pinched. So that's the idea. But again, this is not the first car with that. Most full-sized American four-doors of the 30s and early 40s had that very same styling touch. Chrysler's had it, Oldsmobile's, and yeah, and Ford. But it lingered here on Lincoln for the final go-round. That said, it made getting in and out of the back seat much easier. Lincoln recently did a run of just 50 Continentals with that feature, and boy, they were snapped up just like that. I'll tell you what, this is getting strong attention. $60,000, it just hammered sold, meaning it is now tied as the number three sale of the day. Congratulations to that gentleman right there. Really nice, 1969 Resto Mod Lincoln Continental. Coming up just a little bit, how about a 1970 Plymouth Barracuda? It's got that 340 stripe package. It's got a big restoration, beautiful car. We'll see it soon. Florida moves on because there's all kinds of great stuff up on the block right now. A 1956 Chevy 3100 custom pickup truck. The second year for the V8 revolution at Chevrolet. This one does have a V8, but instead of the 265, it's got a 383, which is an aftermarket combination. But I love the panoramic rear window. And speaking of windows, note that the door window occupies that full frame. The vent windows have been removed. Kind of a nice, uh, subtle touch. So the stance on this is uh, far lower than stock. This rides on A-arm front suspension. The leaf spring and live axle arrangement is long gone. $43,000. Congratulations to that gentleman right there. Fist bumps. We salute you as well. $43,000 for that 56 very yellow 3100 custom pickup truck. 1957 Ford Thunderbird, the last of the baby birds up on the block. And the only one with the fins that replicated the full that on the full size Ford. Functional hood scoop, a V8 underneath. All these were V8s most automatic transmissions and the removable hardtop with the portholes uh, that we saw earlier on that retro 2002 baby bird. Well, this is where they got that idea from. You know, to your point, Mike, 1957, certainly there were all V8, but something new from 57 was the C-Code 292 two-barrel, which was a step-down V8. Now, that was seldom seen and only with a three-speed manual. For the first time, a two-barrel carburetor could be had on a Thunderbird. Yeah, for economy-minded buyers. This one has the D-Code, which, of course, means four-barrel 312 with the automatic transmission. Well, we just got a quick glimpse underneath of the car, and it looks pretty clean on the bottom as well. So uh, nicely done, both top and bottom. All that stainless trim also extends uh, to the inside. Check out these door panels. <laughs> a lot of styling going on here. When I talk about decodes and C codes, we're talking about the VIN. The first digit is the engine designator in 55 through 7 Thunderbird. So the first letter again is going to be a D on a 312 and uh, the C for the little 292 two barrel. Of course, there was the E code, dual quads, the F code, supercharged engine. So, uh, you know, a lot to, uh, to study and absorb in the world of any car, let alone the Thunderbird. You'll notice we've got a couple of bidders. The gentleman on the upper right hand corner of the screen is working a phone bidder. Somebody who's made an arrangement in advance. We've got also got a floor bidder as well. Uh, looks like somebody on the floor pulled it off. Phone bidder not able to get in at the very end. 
The sales price for that is $43,000 for a 1957 Ford Thunderbird convertible. Let's check in with Tyler Hoover. Well, lot 363 here is something very special. It is a 2005 Bentley Continental GT, and when this premiered in 2004, this is a 2005, it was the fastest four-seat production car in the world. You can see four people would fit reasonably comfortably to get this thing over 200 miles an hour, and they made that possible with this. You have basically two Volkswagen VR6 motors put together to make a W12 550 plus horsepower in this thing. And actually, I recently experienced one of these at Atlanta Motor Speedway. We were filming a YouTube series called Car Trek, and we had one of these. We had a 2003 Viper and a C6 Z06, and this was the car that carried the most speed. I was in the Viper going about 130 something in the straights and scared out of my mind. And then my friend Ed was in this going almost 160 miles an hour. So even when it's older, his had 180,000 miles on it. These things can still move. Not just move, they look great while they move. 1957 Chevy Bel Air custom two-door post. Hammered sold right now at $41,000 for that 57 Bel Air. We're going to take a quick break here at Barrett Jackson Palm Beach. But we promise we're coming back. It's Barrett Jackson, it's Palm Beach, and it's a great collection of cars. That's one of the showcase pavilions out there. Beautiful collection. Some of the uh, John Salupi cars, the George Shin cars, the American Muscle Museum cars, all inside that big tent. And they've got air conditioning in there, so it's a beautiful, beautiful way to walk around and watch the cars. There you see the last three cars that sold while we were in commercial break. And up on the block now, a 1969 Oldsmobile Cutlass. But this one's been done as a custom job. You saw April Rose preview this just a little while ago. Well, it sure has. It has great eyeball. It looks like a 69 Hurst Olds, but we got to go to the VIN where we see a 336, meaning it was a V8 Cutlass. To be a 442 or Hurst Olds, you got to see 344. Just a number away, but it means so much. Well, it means so much to the point of $45,000 to the folks up in the skybox. And a very nice 1969 Olds Cutlass Custom. Let's move forward to 1979. In this case, it's a Pontiac Trans Am. Well, 79 was the peak year for Trans Am sales with 117,108 built. But here's the crazy part. They all had this beautiful shaker hood, this fiberglass bubble, steel hood. The bubble didn't do a darn thing, nothing except spur sales. It looks cool. Well, of course, this rode along right on the heels of the Smokey and the Bandit movie when everybody wanted a, a Trans Am. Uh, honeycomb wheels. Not sure about this interior exterior combination matching colors rather than a contrast, but sharp car in very nice shape for a 10th anniversary. Not the anniversary edition of the Trans Am, but the 10th, 10th uh, anniversary of Trans Am production. And this one has the 403, which is an Oldsmobile designed engine. Nothing wrong with that. Made plenty of torque. The, the better one would be the Pontiac 400, but that's okay. Automatic transmission. This is the Turbo 350 GM Hydromatic. Aftermarket wheels, a little bigger. There's probably 17s or 18s. Would have had 15s, but I, I like it. Just tasteful. Great looking car. In 1979, the Firebird got a new nose. The uh, headlights, instead of being in the grill, were now set on their own with a solid piece in between them. The grill now moved down below. Different look, but still very stylish. That rear sway bar hanging down, that is Trans Am stuff. And speaking of Trans Am, you got to see a W in the second spot of the VIN to verify that it truly is a Trans Am and not a Formula or an Esprit or a Sport Coupe. Got a W here, it's the real thing. And the consigners pointing out very original car. They say that Dud did get one repaint in solar gold, the original color, but other than that, they say it's original. 68,000 original miles, and it just sold for $40,000 here at Barrett Jackson in Palm Beach. In 1979, we're going to move forward to 2006, a Celine Mustang. This is an SC281 Extreme. Well, the most famous of Mustang tuners, of course, is Cheryl, Carol Shelby. 
uh, closely followed by Jack Roush, but there were others like Kenny Brown and Steve Celine, uh, whose company had the serial numbered Mustangs uh, built and improved on the original. Speaking of which, one saline touch was here under the driver's side headlight, 7-8. That would be the number of this. And, of course, uh, SC281 stands for supercharged 281 cubic inches, which is what this 4.3-liter V8 translates to in standard English numbers. Note the rear quarter windows, very reminiscent of the early Shelbys. Nice styling touch. Uh, kind of a go wing added to the trunk lid. So a good bit of style to go with the added uh, go power. Speaking of style, this is the second year for the S197 Mustang style, which is really the car that relaunched the Pony Car Wars in Detroit without the 2005 Mustang Fastback. I don't think we would have seen the 2008 Challenger or the 2010 Camaro, which uh, relit the Pony Car Wars in Detroit, which hasn't let up since. Hallelujah. Rear diffuser here in carbon fiber underneath with the dual exhaust. And something Celine did to separate his cars from pedestrian Mustangs is he covered up the third of the Mustangs tri tail lights with this applique. There you go, $46,000 for a 2006 Celine Mustang SC281 Extreme. A little while ago, we previewed this car. Now it's up on the block, a 1970 Plymouth Barracuda. Well, this one looks to be a 340. You see the uh, hockey stick stripe on the back at the 340 engine of the hood, the real thing. But the VIN says G in the fifth spot. So it's born a 318 Q-Barrel. Nothing wrong with that. But again, keep in mind the CUDA VIN is going to be different from the BH23 here, the base car. BS23 would be a CUDA. So the devil's in the details, and so is salvation. Full console, torque flight automatic to go with that V8. 14,000 miles showing uh, on the clock. An added wing here. Now, you could buy a Barracuda. The nameplate continued on. I think it started 1964 or 5, and in this second, third generation, continued on from 1970 on. But if you got the high-performance version, they didn't badge it. Barracuda, uh, they put a little apostrophe there. And Cuda is the nameplate for the high-performance versions of this car as seen there on the taillight panel. Yeah, it's to your point, Mike. A lot of folks would call the Mustangs a Stang. And I think, you know, the Plymouth product planners kind of caught onto the street vernacular. It is nice to see the Cuda-esque through the Valance dual exhaust. We like to say the, the art of the exhaust outlet. And right here, the Plymouth Barracuda, or Cuda, I should say, came with this. It was an option, but it looks great. Well, at $55,000, that is easily into our top 10 of the day here at Barrett Jackson Palm Beach. Congratulations to those folks and the dog taking home that 1970 Plymouth Barracuda. Packed house here in South Florida. I tell you what, the standing room only on the edges. So everybody's coming in to take a look at the cars that are crossing the block. Remember, it's been three years since we've been here. I think there's a lot of pent up demand both to buy and just to watch. It's such a great event to be at. Right now we got a 1957 Ford Thunderbird up on the block. Well, something also new for 1957, in addition to the fins on this, was the Ford Skyliner Retractable. Some would say, did it steal the Thunderbird's thunder? Well, yes and no. The Thunderbird was still $466 more than the Skyliner. But again, final year here for the Baby Bird. And no, the Thunderbird never did get the retractable hardtop until you get into the next generation. But again, a beautiful restoration. Love this. Very nice uh, spoke wire wheels. Uh, give us a little more elegant touch. And that's kind of a nod to the race cars of the 1950s. Uh, cast alloy wheels have really not made much of an impression in sports car racing. So you saw a lot of those spoke wire wheels. Yes, they're very pretty. And yes, they take forever to properly clean. You talk about the art of the exhaust outlet. And of course, Thunderbird did it wonderfully with the uh, bumper at sir extensions doubling as the rectangular exhaust outlets on right and left again dual exhaust making you hit a v8 it was a status symbol on the street in the day still is now this has the somewhat rare for the time town and country radio there was a switch on the radio where in the town setting it would only pick up nearby am stations and on the country station uh, setting out in the country it would search a greater distance for radio stations $39,000 the hammer price on a 57 Ford Thunderbird. 
Town and Country Radio, Porthole, all kinds of fun stuff with those wire wheels as well. All right, you say the 57 just a little too gaudy for you. You want something a little, well, simpler? Well, maybe this is it. A 1956 Ford Thunderbird, one year earlier than the one we just saw. Yeah, this one has the 312, which was new for 1956, uh, but uh, generally found with the automatic transmission. And uh, something kind of cool for this uh, Baby Bird era is the functional cold air hood. Now, the air cleaners here, this cork seal seals to the bottom of the hood so that this open grill feeds cool air into the engine. Cooler, denser charge, more power. But in the wintertime, there's actually a metal plate that could be screwed there to keep water and stuff out of your engine if you drove your Thunderbird in the winter. Few people did. Now, the styling on these inside and out, even that instrument binnacle copied the full-size Ford. All the way back to the taillights. Again, uh, the fins and taillights just like the full-size. Buyers of first-year Thunderbird said not enough luggage space. So for this second year, 1956, the spare tire was moved out onto a Continental kit hanging off the rear bumper. With the chassis cam, let's take a peek underneath this beautiful restored Thunderbird. And we'll see this one does have the automatic power steering, which is a $64 option. That little that ram right there, there's the automatic. The cross-flow dual exhaust, of course. Uh, the Dana rear axle, a 45 series. Big gas tank, really crisp, looks great. Well, it looked like they'd sold it, did they? Nope, I think they... Still have bidders working. Yep, the bid is going up. We're up to 53 now, $55,000. Now remember, just because the auctioneer pounds the gavel down does not mean it's sold until he says it's sold. As a result, even though the hammer came down, he can keep it going, and that's exactly what he does. He's the captain of the ship. He can decide whether the bids are coming in or not. Now, on this, what look like wire wheels are not. These are faux baskets, which basically snap on over the base hub cap. Now, you got to remember that factory wire wheels didn't arrive on T-Bird until 62 on the Sports Roadster. But these look great. 59000 for a 1956 Ford Thunderbird. Let's see, we've seen a 57 sell, 56. Ah, but from this, we're going to go to something much more modern, a 2008 Maserati Gran Turismo Coupe. Well, so this is the successor to the old Maserati GT, which really had a hard name. It was either a Cambio Corsa or a GT, or really no name at all. This one's the Gran Turismo. They made it a lot more practical, larger, obviously, a usable back seat. You still got the Ferrari derived V8, but you got a normal automatic transmission. Gone was the paddle shift, unless you went for the higher trim. It was more of an option. The automatic was the base. Now, these wheels are Neptune wheels. There's a lot of uh, beneath the sea stuff going on here with Maserati, including their logo, which was Neptune's Trident, is the logo for the Maserati brothers when they started building cars. We call it a spork. Engines in these, as we know, were co-designed with Ferrari, but the Maserati version lacks one thing the Ferrari did, the flat plane crank. So the punchline there is the Ferrari engine has a lighter crank and that raspy snarl at speed, whereas the Maserati engine similar, but again, it has a uh, 100 or a 360 degree or 90 degree style crank. So uh, a little different, but similar. There's that logo, both in the Maserati logo and of course uh, repeated there in chrome in the grill. It's the Trident or the Spork, and Max, Maserati guys wouldn't like you telling them that very much at the show. They're all going to say, oh, I have the Ferrari engine in there, and they get it for a price like this, 45000 Awful lot of luxury, awful lot of performance. $45,000 for a 2008 Maserati Gran Turismo. All right, next is the car that Tyler previewed for us a little while ago, a 2005 Bentley Continental GT. Yeah, I really wanted to see this one cross the block myself. Now, it does have a minor accident on the Carfax, but it is only 37,000 miles on this car. Also a very unusual color. I think this is the first one I've ever seen in red. Of course, the uh, Continental GT was, uh, well, a result of the Volkswagen ownership and semi-mass-produced uh, assembly on these things. And, of course, output for Bentley went from like 1,000 cars a year in 2003 to like 10,000 cars a year here. And, again, they didn't really cut corners. These are still... Beautiful cars, nicely made. This one comes out of Orlando. It's been treated to uh, a set of those huge Forgiato wheels. These look to me like about 22 inches in diameter. They're enormous. They're going to be a lot heavier. 
but if style is your thing, I guess that's your brand. Yeah, in Palm Beach or Miami, you don't want to show up to somewhere. You want to arrive, and as far as value goes, currently at 30 grand, this is a small fraction of its original MSRP. It would have been uh, north of $200,000. Yeah, with 552 horsepower, Tyler, like you were talking about, this will get up and move. You can get some serious performance. Yes, with the active suspension, the all-wheel drive, it can definitely hook up, which is the big difference when we were on the track with the other cars. And this one just had all the nannies to help you go really fast versus me and the Viper. I was just scared out of my mind. W12 is an unusual engine, one of the few that's actually wider than it is long by a significant margin. Bizarre little engine. If you see one of these short blocks stripped down, it's kind of weird. Uh, check it out. Google it. Weird-looking engine. I have seen an engine out of these before, and it's a pretty common thing because of the vacuum lines. They're hard plastic, they crack, and then the engine has to come out, unfortunately, to fix it. But once that's done, overall, pretty reliable. Boy, we're only at $35,000 for an amazing amount of performance and beauty right now. Well, that puts a wrap on our first two hours of coverage today here in South Florida, but we're just getting warmed up. Five more hours of live auction action are headed your way. Well, welcome to South Florida and Barrett-Jackson, the world's greatest collector car auction. This week we're in Palm Beach. I'll tell you what, the action is heating up inside the auction arena. All kinds of people, standing room only on the edges. They've come to watch the great cars cross the block. So let's get right to it. Right now we've got a 2005 Bentley Continental GT, current bid $44,000. The styling here is reminiscent of the early 50s Continental GT, which is a two-door fastback, which kind of looks like a 49 Chevy, or vice versa, you call it. <laughs> well, $45,000, the hammer price on the 2005 Bentley Continental GT. Now, this is day two of the Barrett-Jackson auction here in Palm Beach. Had a lot of fun stuff go across the block yesterday. Today, price is definitely higher, and we're going to see a lot of spectacular machinery. And this is one of my personal favorites, a 2014 Jaguar F-Type. Well, I love these, too. Uh, you got to remember, in the 2010 Jaguar sales, they were in the gutter. Ford had kind of kicked them off to Tata Motors of India, and we thought, what the heck are they going to do? And this is one of the first offerings, and it was really, really good, reminiscent of the uh, E-Type Jag. This is the spiritual successor right here. Six-cylinder. Uh, V6, 45,000 actual miles, 14-way sports seats, and uh, just a great long-legged cruising car. These were available with the V6 and the V8. I prefer the V6. Plenty of horsepower, much less weight on the front end, uh, and a better handling car. The 6 would be available with a manual or automatic transmission, not so the V8. To that point, Mike, this one is a supercharged V6, dual of head cams, 335 horsepower. That's net horsepower, more than any E-Type ever had. That's right. What we call the XKE was not so called by the factory. The predecessor to the XKE was the XK150. So you would think the normal progression, once they started using letters instead of numbers, would be XKE. But no, Jaguar called the car the E-Type just as this is the F-Type. Leave the XK at home, I guess. And a long gap between the E-Type and the F-Type. But when you look at what they came up with eventually, you know, this was a great successor to that. Yeah, the styling of these is just fantastic inside and out. You can see the tail lights definitely a throwback, but still modern, very conform to the other Jags. You see the dual exhaust coming out of the center too, more like an exotic car or a supercar. Just a really cool touch you know, for a value like this, $37,000 at the moment. I gotta say the semi-hooded tail lights kind of look like the squinting eyes of a Jaguar getting ready to pounce on the Corvette riding behind it. <laughs> yes, they do. I'm a big fan of these. Uh, I think at the time, it would have been a tough choice between a base Porsche 911 or a Jaguar F-Type, especially in a convertible. Uh, honestly, I love the coupe version. It's got such a great style to it. 
don't get me wrong, the convertible's great, especially I live in Arizona. Love it in the sunshine, but that coupe looks so nice. Well, at the time, they were out selling Mercedes SLs, I think, 20 to 1 or something like that. The 911 was way ahead. Of course, this took a big bite out of the market share. Nice to see Foreman function walking hand in hand. The headrest double as roll hoops, as it were. These are rigid. You know, sometimes these are tacked on. These things are part of the car. I mean, those are built into the frame. And again, protect your noggin in the event you go upside down. And I think I've seen a YouTube video before of somebody putting their drink on the top and putting it down, and it stays upright. It doesn't fall over. Well, it just sold for $49,000, that 2014 Jaguar F-Type, less than 45,000 miles on the odometer. From Jaguar to Maserati, a 2014 Gran Turismo Sport Coupe. Kind of a low mile car here, only 11,000 uh, original miles. I've been to the Maserati dealer here in Palm Beach, and I must say, pre COVID, they had one of the largest inventories of any Maserati dealer in the country. These cars are quite popular here in Palm Beach County. And there's not much of a difference between, say, one that is 10 plus years old to one being built today. So you can buy one of the early years and, well, fall on a budget, I suppose. And this one is a really nice S. I believe it has uh, the carbon fiber in the interior. Oh, yes, it does. Very, very nice. This one is a GTS, as in sport. One difference between this and the GT we saw a moment ago is the engine. This is a 4.7 liter uh, versus the 4.2. This will have a red crackle finish on the cam covers if the hood was open. But again, unlike the Ferrari 4.7, this does not have the flat plane crank nor that shriek at wide open, but still a great V8. Yeah, the only thing missing with this one is a warranty. But then we all get robot phone calls all the time offering us those, don't we? One of these days, I'm going to pick one of those up, and I'm going to ask the guy, okay, how, mu how much to insure my Maserati that I don't have? Well, by the way, this one does have a, a vehicle report that shows that it did at one point have a rear-end collision. That's what's great about Barrett-Jackson. They list that on the car card so you know what's happened. It says the estimated damage was less than $1,000. The airbags didn't go off. But at least if you're bidding on the car, you've got some history to it. Well, I'll be honest, about half of my fleet has something with that kind of negative connotation on it, and that just means I can drive it, enjoy it, have all the fun I want. If I scratch it, it's already been painted once. You can paint it again. And you also know you're getting it for a little less, assuming it was repaired properly and you test it out. You have yourself a better car for a little less money. Not a bad deal. The way that one goes at $50,000. That's where they're going to put the Summit Racing Soul sticker goes on. They write the price right there. And when you're walking around, you can check it out and see what all the cars that have already crossed the block sell for when you're here at Barrett Jackson. 1965 Mustang convertible right behind it. Yeah, this is kind of cool. It's what we call a 64 and a half. This is an F code. And again, the 64 and a half cars were built between April and July of 1964. And the F code is the 260 V8, as seen on the front fenders. That would be eliminated as of July, you know, 30th of 64 with the more mainstream 65s. Now, this is a convertible, and these were built in the minority of the 600,000 or so Mustangs built in that first, well, model year and a half. Something like one in 12 was a convertible. Most were the coupe. I love the wheels on this. It's a modern cast alloy interpretation of the styled steel chrome sport wheels, but larger in both diameter and width. A modern take on a very popular look. This, if it's correct, and it probably is not, which not open, will have a generator instead of an alternator. And there's going to be a bulb. We can't see it. It's not lit up. But here it'll actually say G-E-N instead of A-L-T. That's a correct detail on the 64 and a half. So a lot of little things make them uh, unique. Now look under the dash at those four vents there in front of the uh, shifter. Most cars were shipped from the factory in the early 1960s without air conditioning. It was very popular for the dealer to add on an air conditioning unit, and that is what you see there. 
of the wheel, speaking of add-on, uh, it still has drum brakes all the way around. So a lot of stock in addition to the uh, the hop-up. Now, being a V8 car, it has five lugs. If this were a T-code six-cylinder car, yeah, it would have four lugs. Because again, the Ford Falcon economy car is at the bones of a Mustang. Well, nice even $50,000 the price for that 1965 Mustang or a 64 and a half if you want to call it that with some custom touches. Nice paint job and away that will go to a brand new owner. Staying in the Ford Motor Company world, a 1965 Lincoln Continental Convertible. Well, the Continental and the hardtop were both noted for their suicide doors, but the Continentals were 500, sorry, the convertibles were $506 more than the hardtops, which is about a 10% difference. The big V8 in this one, of course, seating for six with the uh, split bench seat and the wide bench in the back, a true six passenger convertible. Pretty car. That's the 430 V8, which would be in its final year for 65, replaced by a 462 in 1966. This thing's going to get bigger. Now, on convertibles, these rods here, which are adjustable right there, help to preload the cowl. Now, these are body unit construction cars, not body on frame. As a result, they're prone to wiggle and jiggle. Those things help to stiffen things up. The best styling feature of this car uh, is the convertible top of boot. It is below deck level. Uh, this, this piece here comes up, the convertible top retracts and completely disappears. That was expensive to engineer, more expensive to build, but it gives this car a very clean look without a vinyl convertible top boot sticking up. Well, remember, this was the anti-Cadillac when it came out in 1961. It was specifically designed to have a cleaner, less cluttered, less blingy look, shall we say. That's what Elwood Engel designed, and that's what he got. $51,000 for a 1965 Lincoln Continental. Suicide doors, big and beautiful. We're going to take a quick break here in Palm Beach. Before we come back to more Barrett Jackson. fun yet? I got news for you. If you're not having fun, it's because you're not in Palm Beach. All kinds of great things going on here at the South Florida Expo Center. Up on the block right now, they're just about to hammer sold a 1965 Mustang convertible. And look at the money this is bringing in. We're closing in on 60000 almost $58,000 for a dead stock 65 Mustang convertible frame up restoration. And that guy is happy to pay the price. $58,000 for that 1965 Ford Mustang. Going up behind it, we got a 1966 Oldsmobile 442. Well, it's a numbers matching car. The good news, uh, the bad news, this car was originally built with an automatic, which in 1966 meant the two speed jetaway, which is not a bad thing, but it's an evolution of the Buick Super Turbine 300. Good news on that one is that it's been upgraded with a Turbo 400, which is a 67 up transmission with three forward speeds, which is what you want. But otherwise, a beautiful restoration. Now, I'm going to call that no harm, no foul, Steve. I don't think that's going to hurt the value of this a bit to have a better transmission uh, than the one it was born with. The 442 was Oldsmobile's highest performance machine. Came out late in 1964 in response to the Pontiac GTO and went on from there. Now, people that have driven both in period say the Olds 442 handles better than a goat because of the spring and suspension and sway bar tuning about those two-speed automatics they're governed inside not to kick down into first gear over about 50 miles an hour because if you're going 60 and you kick down into first gear the motor's going to go to about 7,000 rpm and blow up so they won't do that that's why a two-speed automatic's not much fun once you're up to speed there's no room for kicking down you're just going Bruh. but hey that's you know the automatic transmission evolved and again the turbo 400 when it arrived in 67 gave the 442 the ss 96 the gto all of them a whole new element of enjoyment, let alone the Corvette, when it finally got the three-speed automatic in 68. Well, as the one-time owner of a 65 GOAT with a two-speed automatic, I can tell you these big block engines had plenty of torque and plenty of power, and maybe two speeds was just enough. 
Yeah, I would have rather had a four-speed, but you know what? The used car factory was closed that day, so I didn't have that choice to make. I will say my grandmother had a 65 Impala SS with a two-speed power glide. When she kicked it down, it was terrifying. It would go, well, <laughs> It's like it's going to blow up, but it was normal, but uh, over 50, it wouldn't kick down. $56,000 is the hammer price for that old 442. Every Barrett Jackson is an auction, of course, and it's a car show. And it is a platform for raising big money for some great charities. And that'll happen this weekend. Here's Rick DeBrule with a preview. Over the last 50 years, Barrett Jackson has raised more than $144 million, all for charity, selling great cars for great causes. And this auction here in Palm Beach is no different. There are seven cars that will be crossing the block, all of which will be sold to benefit people in need. These two cars are a perfect example. They will both be sold to benefit an organization called Samaritan's Purse, all the money used to help the people in the Ukraine. Ford Motor Company has donated the 2022 Ford Bronco Raptor VIN 001 to benefit the National Forest Foundation and Outward Bound. Not to be outdone, well, Chevy's brought the first retail production 2023 Corvette Z06 convertible, with every penny going to the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. The 2012 Jeep Wrangler Unlimited Custom 6x6 pickup, nicknamed the Savage Bull, will be sold with money raised going towards an organization called Canned Aid which works to inspire people to become catalysts for change in their own communities. A 2023 Cadillac CT5 V Blackwing has 668 horsepower and it will benefit the SAE Foundation. Finally, this 2020 Ford Shelby GT500 can help pancreatic cancer research at John Hopkins University. And remember, Barrett Jackson takes no commission on these sales, so every dollar helps a great cause. Barrett Jackson consigners and bidders have opened their hearts and their wallets for these great charities and for these great cars. Another charity lot is coming up in just about 10 minutes here on Friday. As we return to the block for lot 367, here's a customized 1947 Ford F1. Well, custom is the word. This rides on coil springs, something it would not have had in 1947. It would have leaf springs. And it's a five liter V8 under the hood. I can't tell if it's Coyote. Okay, I can see the top of the plenum. This is like a mid 80s Mustang 5.0, not to be confused with the modern Coyote 5.0 dual overhead cam. But again, nothing wrong with that. Uh, four speed AOD automatic transmission with overdrive. Beautiful paint. Yeah, the great thing about the pickup truck world is you just pick which decade you like the best. I mean, some people love the 40s, some people love the 30s or the 50s, the 60s, 70s, and 80s have their own fans. And I love the way they've done this one, where they've taken the bumper off the front, with that big grill that's kind of stretches all the way down to the ground, beautiful bed in the back, nicely done custom pickup. Nine-inch rear axle in the back with, again, coilovers inside. Look at that beautiful customized interior. A long way from how this was built. The very austere, flinty, <laughs> dry factory stuff, all plush leather upholstery and padding. Pretty nice, very modern inside. You know, really, this was the end of the pre-war styling for Ford. The following year in 1948, they went into what they called the bonus built trucks, and this was the end of this style. $56,000 for a 1947 Ford F1 custom pickup truck. Big applause up in the skybox. You want something new? It's all out there. It'll be crossing the block here at Barrett Jackson, Palm Beach in just a little bit. Meanwhile, up on the block right now, we have a 1975 Volkswagen 23 window. Now they're calling this a microbus recreation because this has had the windows added. Well, correct. Uh, you gotta remember that the Type 2 ended in 1967, at least for Germany. Well, in Brazil, they kept building the bikini face, if you will, uh, all the way into the early 70s. And what you wanna see is a VIN that's all numbers for German built, but with a B at the front, it's a Brazilian one. That's why it's a 75 Type 2. But this has been given a 23 window conversion from 15 windows. A company called Grumpy's Metal will sell you the conversion kit for about 3,500 bucks. And then, of course, it's up to you to weld it in place but again it's a nice what if 23 window based on a Brazilian 20 or 15 20, 15 window bus 
Yesterday we saw a 1965 roll across that was custom, and we had some questions about the, the VIN number. Turns out in the 60s, all they had was a B on the front. In the 70s, it went to a BH. So that's the distinction with the lettering. So that's why when we see this as a 1975, we realize that's a Brazilian. But once again, the B at the front is the key letter to watch out for. Take a peek under the... Uh hood as it were here in the tail and there she blows the air-cooled flat four a little bit hot pepper some chrome dress up goodies a clear distributor cap kind of cakey but it still has the down draft oh i guess one or maybe a two barrel carburetor no side draft rubber stuff but still it's a peppy little clear nice fifty three thousand dollars for a 1975 23 window samba recreation congratulations to those folks we're going to head outside and find april rose one of the great things here at Barry Jackson is you can spend the entire day checking out these cars right now. I'm at the very back of the staging lanes. It's such a great thing to get up close and really see every detail on these cars like this first year, 1958 Impala. Now it's a one year only body style, top of the line, Bel Air, which was the trim package, beautiful frame off restoration, correct 348 V8 with tri power, three speed automatic. And I want you to check out the back. It has those fantastic outward sculpted rear fenders, just looks super classy with the fender skirts, continental kit, finished off in snow crest white paint, beautiful piece of history that started the Impala right here, Debrule. Absolutely love that one year body style 1958 absolutely great looking very Cadillac like in that Chevrolet 1969 Chevelle custom up on the block right now. Well, no claims. This is an SS model. It does show a 136 prefix. So it's a V8 car, but let's not confuse the 69's non-functional domed hood for the 70s Z01 induction. These are visual, but they look great as a four speed transmission. And uh, it's got a 396, but again, no claims it's an actual SS 396. Well, I'll tell you what, getting a lot of attention in the room, currently bid at $80,000, meaning that will be tied as the number one seller of the day. And that's exactly what it hammers back. Let's check in with Mike Joy. I'm up in uh, Craig Jackson's Skybox to answer the question I get asked most often about Barrett Jackson auctions. Who is John Stalupi and what is with all these cars? So I'm with John and Jeanette uh, here in Palm Beach. Where did you get your love of cars to start? You know, I started as a mechanic when I was a kid, and that's this is all my era. I worked in a Chevrolet store, and, and from that time on, these, these type of cars, just like, I love them. And the good part is I know how to fix them, I know how to work on them, and I really enjoyed them. But you fill up your Cars of Dreams collection, and then you sell them all, and then you fill it up again. Jeanette, you're all part of this? Oh, yeah, of course I am. <laughs> but what a philosophy. You buy them, you sell them, you're going to buy them again. You know what happens? I miss them, and I always want to change the collection. And you know when you see another car, it says, ah, oh, I remember that car when I was a kid, or I worked on that car when I was a kid. So that's what keeps me going. And you know, this was killing me selling this collection because I was selling my shopping center, but now my guys might have told me we might have found another building. I'm not sure yet, but if I get another building, I'm going to build another collection. All right. We'll see some of your great cars coming up here in just a little bit. John Stalupi. All right. Thanks a lot, Mike and John. And just like Barrett Jackson, John does a great job helping to raise money for great causes. He loans out his Cars of Dreams Museum, and they have a lot of charity events there. Up on the block right now, we got another Chevelle. This one, another 1969, a convertible, and we're seeing these bring big money today. Yeah, no claims. This is an actual SS396. Trouble is, after 1968, the 138 VIN prefix went away. So what you get is a 136 V8 car with the SS option added on at the factory. Now, whether it's done or not, it doesn't really matter. The car doesn't know the difference. It's beautiful. This one's backed up by a M21 four-speed tranny, and it's it's presented as an actual SS396. Again, the car doesn't know the difference, and uh, it's, it's a beautiful car. I like it. Cranberry red. Yeah, and on the car sheet, they're not calling it an SS. Once again, it can have the look, but they're making it very clear, at least with the car sheet, that that's not what this is. So they're not pretending it. They're just making it look that way. And I think, as I said, no harm, no foul, as long as they don't try to pretend that you're buying something that's original. And why is that important? Well, you know, if you ask 10 collectors, five will say, that's really important, it's an SS. The other five will say, I don't care. I want to drive and enjoy it. So you find where it fits for you. Well, I'll tell you what, this one's working with this crowd. $84,000, the current bid, meaning this is now 
the number one sale of the day here at Barrett Jackson. 85,000 and that is the hammer price of that gentleman right there. We've been seeing him buying a number of cars this week here at Barrett Jackson. All right, let's sell a car for a great cause. Give back and to do good. Our Treads and Trails program gets kids playing outside through bikes, skateboards, and our latest project, a much needed ADA accessible park in Berthoud, Colorado. This park won't just change life for miles, it'll impact wheelchair dependent youth in this community for generations to come. Thank you, Candy, for building me a park I can play on. This is People Power. Folks, we have a great cause, and uh, as always at Barrett Jackson, we're very proud to share our stage to raise as much money as we can for some incredible charities, and we have a very special one here right now. I'm going to introduce you to Diana Ralston, founder and executive director of Candy Aid, and what an incredible opportunity this is for us to help a very, very needy and absolute incredible cause. Tell us a little bit about it and why it's so special. Thank you so much for allowing us to be here. We are absolutely overjoyed. We've never, ever had this type of platform, and it's a little bit overwhelming. So I just want to sincerely thank both of you and the entire Barrett-Jackson family. Candade works to um, get children off their screens and devices and get outside leading healthy, active lives. So through our Treads and Trails program, we have built and donated almost 3,000 bicycles nationwide to children. And our latest program is to help um, build a fully accessible and uh, inclusive playground. And Miles Bowling and his entire family are here. They're the inspiration for this park that we're building. And so I guess I would just ask all of you uh, to bid with your hearts and help us raise as much money as possible so that we can build this park for Miles and for all sorts of people that have mobility issues. And we, again, are very grateful to be here. And we want to tell them a little bit about this incredible vehicle backing in there. You talk about something incredible. Let's and here it is on the exit ramp here. Shane, tell us how amazing Ladies this and gentlemen, the opportunity of a one-of-a-kind Jeep, customized from the ground up, modified into an extended wheelbase. Now, this would have been originally built in 2012 with the Pentastar V6. Pretty great engine, 306 horse, but now it has a Mopar Performance or Direct Connection 6.4 Hemi great engine with 400 plus horsepower and the six wheel drive on this does work uh, it's not a tag axle it's not a pusher axle both rear axles do have ring and pinions and it's truly six wheel drive all right joseph it's even got some celebrity connection. This was actually commissioned by Atlanta Braves Hall of Fame baseball player Andrew Jones. He's even signed the tailgate on it. And since it's been built, it's gone 12,000 miles. We're already up to $100,000 for this great cause. As a Wrangler Unlimited, of course, it's a four door. With uh, beautiful, I love the baseball stitching on the seat, so I get it with the baseball player provenance. Very cool with the stitching on the seats there, done up like a baseball. How cool. What a great theme, and, and what a, just a very unique build, not to mention all of its off road capability. This may make a great mall finder. Uh, it may go just anywhere you want. We're looking for $200,000. One detail here on the... Goes direct to the charity. Come on. Detail, open a door, watch the step ramp come down automatically, close the door, goes back up automatically. Or maybe not. Yeah, there you go. How oh, cool. There's one of those uh, dual drive axles in the back. It could be Dana 60 or 70, Spicer style axles. $150,000 every penny to go help Candade. 
helping children around the country. What a great organization, a great car being sold at a great event here in Palm Beach. isn't just a great car auction, it is also a great car show. You get to wander around by a general edition ticket and look at all of the cars before they cross the block. And I often point out, Barrett Jackson, when it comes to town, is one of the best car shows around. And it's also a great auction. Up in the block right now, a 1956 Ford F100 custom pickup truck. Another one of the cars from the Cars of Dream John Stalupi collection. This is an interesting truck, of course. 56 is the one-year Ford cab with the wraparound windshield. 57, a whole different design, but something unusual here. The hood is closed. This is a Chevy 396 big block hiding under the hood. But again, the overdrive there would indicate that uh, the original vehicle was equipped with a three-speed manual with an overdrive. This one's been given a Chevy wrap motor transplant. Beautiful resto mod in that uh, light metallic blue tan leather interior. Freshly, freshly done. Four-wheel disc brakes, automatic transmission, stuff that wasn't even dreamed of in 1956, but would arrive shortly thereafter. Like the dual exhaust sort of poking out the back there, an aftermarket fuel cell made of aluminum sitting below the uh, bed and behind the bumper. This and the next two vehicles, all part of the John Stalupi Cars of Dreams collection, are being sold here over three days. 38 cars here at Bear Jackson, Palm Beach. Remember, Mike, about, oh, seven years ago, we had that party at the Cars of Dreams. It was a carousel. We all rode the carousel. What a cool thing that was. John Sloopy is an eclectic collector. He can get whatever he wants. $85,000 is what that one sold for, meaning it is now tied as the number one retail sale of the day. Now, John Stulupi, who you met a segment ago and who is selling this group of cars, is not only a mega collector, but quite a philanthropist. He was the winning bidder of that six-wheel Jeep Gladiator Ford charity at $150,000. And from the skybox, he yelled at Craig Jackson on the block, sell it again. He donated it right back to the charity. It sold again, raising another $100,000 for that great cause. Total of $250,000 from those folks here, all for that 2012 Jeep Wrangler 6x6 pickup. And once again, just one of seven charity vehicles being sold here at Barrett Jackson. We've got another one coming up today. We'll be raising money for an organization called Samaritan's Purse, raising money for refugees fleeing the Ukraine. Up there right now, we've got a 1966 Chevy C10 custom pickup. This is beautiful. You know, the use of color can mean so much on any vehicle build, and the use of the white and the red here, and the red line sidewalls, just mouthwatering. I gotta say, makes you want to drool. But this one has been given a heart transplant. Again, this one has an LS1 all aluminum Gen 3 small block backed up by a 4L60E automatic overdrive. Now, interesting two-tone treatment down the side and the roof, and note the grill is in the secondary color. Uh, that happens because all those Chevy grills were painted white, Ford grills were cream, unless you paid extra for chrome. Whether you built model cars or collected Hot Wheels cars in the 60s, knows the name Tom Daniel. Well, before he got to Mattel in Southern California, he worked for Chevrolet Design in the early, early 60s, and that hood design was a Tom Daniel styling touch. It's a fact and uh, very cool. A little subtle known uh, hide in plain sight thing. Now, if you built models, the Red Baron, uh, so many of those models by monogram are Tom Daniel designs. But yeah, the hood on this thing also by Tom. 66,000 dollars the hammer price on a 1966 Chevrolet C10 custom pickup truck. Well, if you'd like to try and sharpen your bidding skills, maybe grab a great prize in the process, you're going to want to play the fantasy bid brought to you by Dodge. All you have to do is go to BarrettJacksonFantasyBid.com. It's all one word to register and play. You'll try to predict the winning bid of select auction vehicles that are going to be crossing the block tomorrow on Saturday. Now, the winner of Palm Beach, that person will get a three-day Radford Driving School experience, and they will also have a chance to win the grand prize, which is a 2022 Dodge Challenger. Now, there's only one more day before the game begins, so make sure you to register for Fantasy Bid, brought to you by Dodge. Another car from the Cars of Dreams collection. This one is a 1964 Corvette. 
Well, some rest of mod touches here. Again, being a 64, we would not see the side pipes or the four-wheel disc brakes or the 427 stinger hood. But again, that's fine. I like how the 327 emblems have been added to the 427 hood. Of course, that's a reference to the 327 small block four-speed car. I like it. Rest of mod, more mod, more wrestle than mod, but a bit of both. Well, it's bringing solid money. We're at $87,000, meaning this is now the number one retail sale behind the charity car that sold just a little while ago. When you have side pipes on a Corvette of this era, the rear balance panel is solid, does not have the pass to exhaust hips. Correctly presented here. $90,000. Once again, that's now the number one retail sale of the day. Congratulations to those folks. They'll write the check, pay a 10% buyer's commission as well. They own that Corvette. Well, from the moment you walk in here at the South Florida Fairground for the Barrett Jackson Collector Car Auctions, it's literally like walking into a showcase with all kinds of great cars. Yeah, you got all the collector cars, but plenty of new stuff as well. It's like going to a new car show where you can sample and sit in and look at all the great new cars that are coming out. And of course, we've got all the collector cars as well. And up on the block right now, we've got a 1959 Fairlane 500. I love this one. It's a Skyliner. Well, third and final year for the retractable hardtop, and uh, by far the most expensive Ford line or in, the, in the vehicle in Ford line, except for the Thunderbird, which is still 300 bucks more expensive. But here we have this long deck lid. This opens up, and the top comes up, closes, and uh, really an amazing thing. 600 feet of water in this system. There is actually a usable trunk in the center of that section. It is it is uh, cordoned off, kind of a steel box affair, uh, just like on a modern hardtop convertible, uh, so that you only use the stowage space that will not interfere with that top being retracted. Something. Well, the way it goes, once again, that gentleman, we've seen him be uh, purchasing more than one car, $46,000. For that 1959 Fairlane 500 Skyliner. All right, take a look at our Haggerty top five sellers of the day. Of course, the number one is the $250,000 raise for canned aid, but the top retail sale of the day, that was $90,000 for a Corvette, followed by a Chevelle, a Ford F-150, and finally a Chevy C-10. Up on the block now, a 1963 Chevy Nova SS Custom. Well, the Chevy 2 and the Nova were brand new for 1962, and the convertible body style was only offered in 62 and 63, so a two-year body. Now, check this out. No factory V8s until 64, so this had to have been a six-cylinder car when it was new. But that was then. It now has a 350 small block with rack and pinion, and it's a nice example of a Resto mod, mixture of restoration and modification. The Chevy 2 was developed in a rush as buyers, they bought the Chevy Corvair, but the rear engine air-cooled flat six just didn't appeal to a lot of buyers uh, who were lost to the Plymouth Valiant and Ford Falcon. So Chevy quickly uh, rushed these into production in 1962 to fill that gap. Yeah, true compact cars, I think, might have been a reaction to the excesses of the 50s, the fins and stuff. Of course, the Studebaker Lark and the Nash Rambler were the two first American compacts. And yeah, by 1959-60, the Valiant, the Falcon, the Corvair, and of course, the senior compacts all kind of changed the market. Without the compacts, we, we wouldn't have had the muscle cars and the mid-size models. Well, this one just hammered sold at $49,000 for a 63 Nova SS convertible. Yeah, we've seen that gentleman buy before, so we got some frequent buyers here. Up there right now, a 2007 Bentley Continental GTC convertible. Well, around the new millennium, Bentley went to Volkswagen. Rolls-Royce, they were combined at one point, went to BMW. This was the first offering of that, the Continental GT. Of course, a few years in, they had to take the top off, and this is what you get, the GTC for convertible. I understand the top speed on this is only 189 miles an hour versus 195 with the top up. Have you tried either of those numbers, Tyler? No, no. I thought they were capable of over 200 at one point. But, uh, yeah, not, I've never tried that. No, sir. 
Now, I know the GT Fastback was the one that was like 202 miles an hour. The convertible, I think, was a little dirtier aerodynamically. But imagine that, 189 at the top down. I don't think I have uh, eggs that big. I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I have hair follicles that strong, unfortunately. But yeah, a beautiful car, kind of a nautical theme on this one with the blue, the blue dashboard and the light tan interior. Really nice. Again, the art of the exhaust outlet. I love that, the stainless steel oval outlets coming through. The balance as if they were born to be there, which they were. I love that, nice work. And of course, you see the Flying B logo. They actually made it practical on the cars in the rear. You could pop the trunk with this. In the front, it's also your hood release. I believe it's locked right now, but you can see it's a button that you can push. Same with the front. That's the hood catch release. You're not reaching inside the grill or anything. It's just right on top with the B. $59,000 for 2007 Bentley Continental GC. Less than 40,000 miles, plenty of power, plenty of looks, plenty of sex appeal. Out of the McGuire staging lanes. Oh, so many great cars left across the block. Remember, we're going to be live until 7 o'clock Eastern time tonight. And what a collection of cars we're going to see crossing the block. Have yet to see a retail sale of $100,000, but I'm pretty sure that's going to happen before the day is over. Right now, we've got a 1979 Porsche 911 SC Custom. Well, this has been customized by adding the steel front fenders and the steel fender extensions that you would have found on a 911 Turbo. This is not a Turbo, even though it does have uh, the big wing. Struggling here with the release. There it is. Um, so somebody spent a lot of money to change this one. The color is unique, but it is not a color from Porsche's paint to sample program. Whoever restored this car chose their own special mix. Yes, this started life as a 79 SC. You see the wide body, but under the hood or the, the bonnet in the back, it's not the three liter anymore. It's a 3.2, say from a later 80s Carrera. You have the later cup wheels as well. You know, it looks like more like a 964, the later generation, which I imagine back when the SCs weren't worth very much, uh, you could do something like this to make it look newer. Now, don't confuse this with the M491 option, the factory turbo look, where you could get the body and chassis and suspension of the turbo with a normally aspirated motor and the five-speed. That's what I had. I saved on insurance and maintenance costs that way, but I sure got a great Porsche equal of the turbo on the road. Well, $55,000, that's what it took to buy that custom 1979 Porsche 911 SC with the newer-looking body style on it. All you have to do is go to barrett-jackson.com, go to the website, and you can check out the cars that are going to be crossing the block. We call it the docket. It's just the list of cars. The great thing is you can also research auctions you know, from years ago, see what cars sold for, watch the trends as they're happening. Up on the block now, a 1978 Chevy K5 Blazer Custom. One little correction, the VIN in this one reads CC, not CK. This is a C5, it's a two-wheel drive blazer, and yeah, you could get a two-wheel drive blazer. There were definitely like maybe a one out of 25 proposition. Uh, that was then, this is now got an LS transfer, but uh, again, a two-wheel drive blazer custom, slammed low, quite the opposite of the jacked up four-wheeler we usually see. Note how the firewall and the uh, inner fender liners, everything has been shaved of wiring and accessories and parts that uh, should bolt on there have been relocated elsewhere. A lot of work in this. The second letter of the VIN tells the story. If you see a K, it's a four-wheeler. If you see the C as we do here, yeah, two-wheel drive blazer. CC, not a CK. Heavily lowered on uh, what looked to be 20 or 22 inch hoops. Uh, don't see a rear seat here. Guess you just don't need one. You're going to pop your surfboard inside and away you go. Well, that puts a bow on another hour of coverage here at Barrett Jackson Palm Beach. But the prices and the quality of vehicles are only going to go up from here. We're cruising along on a Friday here at Barrett Jackson Palm Beach up on the block right now. A wild custom, a 1978 Chevy K5, at least that's what it says, K5 Blazer Custom, although the VIN tells a different story. 
That's right. You know, the second spot is a C, not a K. This is a two-wheel drive Blazer, and yeah, they made them. And it's slammed down. It's customized, sort of in the Southern California sport truck mode. It's not jacked up, but yeah, two-wheel drive Blazer born. Pretty rare bird, but uh, not that desirable. With that said, it's got an LS motor, and it's way more desirable now as a custom than it would be a stocker. Yeah, the body style is what people are looking for in that blazer world and the fact that it's been customized but once you start customizing and what does it matter what it was born as and i gotta say the roof on this one has been blended in almost looks like suburban stuff this would be a bolt-on hardtop from the half cab rear but this has all been melded in and the corners have been smoothed out the transparent uh, lens is gone and nice work and the flesh mount LED horizontal split tail lamps. Just a whole bunch of custom, a lot of time. Beautiful work. You see the gentleman on the right, he's handling the internet bid for Barrett Jackson. So he's through the internet, connected to a bidder. $62,000 internet bidder takes it for that 1978 Chevy Blazer Custom SUV. Going up behind it, we got a 1990 Chevy. This one's a custom pickup, big 454. And this is the first of this group for the George Shin collection. Well, this one makes me a little bit sad. You got to remember that between 1990 and 93, Chevy offered a thing called the 454 SS Silverado. This was one of them, and you know they're starting to bring some serious money. But that said, this was customized probably a while ago. You got to love it. There's a 454 still under the hood. Uh, it's got an Edelbrock dual plane intake, and it does have fuel injection in place of the original carburetor. So it's kind of a mixture of uh, original and mod. Well, actually, more modification. But yeah, it was a big block 454 pickup way back when. Heavily customized and this beautiful lime green candy metallic paint. Uh, this is a process that was described in the magazines as dip painting, as if the entire body had been dipped in a vat of paint and everything on the exterior is body color. One thing about this we'll check out with the chassis cam is the amount of customization done below. And uh, this again is a two wheel drive, of course, as with the 454 SS pickups. Um, stop looking suspension. I love the uh, matching green on the tranny, the bottom of the floor. Dual exhaust running down the uh, passenger side. There's that big uh, corporate rear axle, battery located down low. Now keep in mind, the 454 SS pickup truck is identifiable. The VIN will have an N in the eighth spot. We see it here, so a pretty rare core vehicle. And it just sold, hammered sold, at $38,000 for that cool 454 Custom. Let's check in with April Rose. The value of these keep on going up and up and up. They are just so cool. No, I'm not talking about that T-Bird. I'm talking about this 1977 K5 Blazer. Now, this year, new, it's got the exterior decor package. You could only get with that white top. Okay, you get the two-tone color. This one is cardinal red and frost with the stripe package. This is the way to go. It looks so clean, so fresh. It's got the original matching numbers, 350 TH350 automatic trans. Now inside, take a look inside. You got that crimson red interior, all the factory controls, the Cheyenne trim level, which gives you the larger center console, and that wood grain right there, that's a simulated chestnut wood appearance. This year only, it just looks spectacular. Well, it's interesting. You know, we just saw a lowered blazer goes across, go across. Now we've got a raised blazer about to go across. And you're right, April. The prices are absolutely going up on those. 1968 Chevelle SS up on the block. Well, this is a real super sport. 1968 was the final year that we have a 138 in the first three spots of the BIN. Yep, it's a real big block Chevelle. Uh, this one is backed up by a, a four speed, got a 12 bolt rear axle. This is also a bent seat car. We'll see eventually. Kind of weird. You paid extra for the buckets on the console, but again, a bent seat four speed. Yep, factory stuff. And this is an authentic 396 cubic inch, 325 horsepower uh, V8 as this car was born. Rally wheels, Le Mans blue, very sharp super sport. Just remember, of course, the 396 was available in three potencies, the base 325, there was also a 350, and then a 375 horsepower version, which had solid lifters, a big Holly intake, or a carburetor, and that's definitely a rare bird. But either one, any one of those three 396s is a bunch of torque and a lot of fun. A verified muscle car, no doubt. 
you don't often see the bench seat with the M21 Muncie four-speed floor shift. Well, those folks are the winning bidders. Congratulations to them. And the Summit Racing Soul sticker goes on. And mark the price, $55,000, and away it will go. By the way, $55,000, that doesn't make the top 10. You want to make the top 10 today? It's going to take at least $62,000. You want to make the top 10 of both days, yesterday and today? Well, that would take at least $73,000. Right behind it up on the block, we got a 1967 Shelby Cobra. This is a recreation. Yeah, probably one of the most popular kit vehicles on the planet, the Cobra. Here it is. This is a 302 with uh, a small carburetor, five-speed manual transmission. It's fiberglass, but a lot of fun. Yeah, fiberglass is the body. Of course, these have a, a big four-inch tube, twin-tube ladder frame. Uh, the handling is, is great. The ride is described as ox car-like. Uh, and this one has been done to taste with a Cobra style roll bar, single hoop roll bar. After all, if you're racing this, there's only the driver, there is no passenger. Monza style filler cap. And as we said, a fiberglass repro body. And this does have the side pipes, which are original to an actual 427 Cobra, at least a race version. But you want to watch yourself when you get out. Those are going to be mighty hot. Can cook an ankle within a second. So pay attention when you drive one of these after a fast, when you get out after a hot lap. And the wine glass style alloy wheels, those are quite authentic. Instead of bumpers, the brackets for the quick li lift jack in the back. And that is an authentic Cobra SC street competition option. And this is from the George Shin collection. We know he only buys good stuff. So this was a high quality build. There's a wide range of what people do with these things. And everybody's got a different idea of what the perfect Cobra recreation is going to be. Obviously, no expense spared making this one. And the current bid price shows that. We're up at $85,000. And that is where the hammer comes down, tying it as the number three sale of the day here at Barrett Jackson for a 1967 Shelby Cobra recreation. 302 under the hood. Nicely done. 1959 Ford Thunderbird convertible rolling up behind it. This is weird. Here's why. This is a Thunderbird, the epitome of Ford personal luxury in 1959, as it would be in 58 through 60. But this one is a three-speed manual transmission with the shifter on the column. 1960 would be the final year until 84 that you could get a manual transmission in a Thunderbird. But if we take a peek inside, we'll see here, just like Grandpa's Edsel, the three-speed manual on the column, clutch pedal. And yes, it was certainly the standard tranny. Kind of weird, very rare but there it is. I mean, not said to be a one of one, but it's the only one I've ever seen. Did they just not offer a floor shift with the manual transmission? Well, you know, Ford didn't have a four speed until 1962. Uh, but the crazy thing on a baby bird, a 55, six or seven with a three speed, yes, the shifter would be on the floor. So I think maybe as T-Bird got into its more luxurious upscale mode, the four speed on the floor, or the floor shifter was seen as being too sporty. And hey, who knows? No floor shifts on these, but that column shifted manual is a weird thing on this car, but it's real. I like it. I remember building a 124 scale model of these back when I was a kid. Loved the big front. And yeah, we all love the baby birds. This is the second year of what we call the square birds. Boy, what big sellers these were for, for Ford when they finally brought these out. Well, that's right, monogram models. That's probably the model you built way back in the early 60s. And of course, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, the, the TV novelty lady drove one of these puppies. And 1959 brought leaf springs in the back. 58 was a one-year dalliance with coils at the tail, but a nice resto. These cars handily outsold the two-seat baby birds, showing there wasn't much of a market for two-seat sports cars, but the success that Ford had with the four-seat Thunderbird got them in the next decade thinking about what would become the Mustang. A two-plus-two sporty car for everybody. And of course, by the uh, the Gen 2 Bird, the 312 was gone, replaced by the big block, the 352, but there was an optional 430, which was also possible at this point in time. This has the 352. Oh, the way this one goes, this 1959 Ford Thunderbird, rare bird in many ways, $54,000, the hammer price. Coming up in just a little bit, check this out. Got a really nice 1970 Dodge Challenger. This one's great. RT Plum Crazy Purple. 
We'll see you up on Unblock very soon. Welcome back to Palm Beach. It is heating up, up outside and it is heating up as cars cross the block. We are in the middle of a wonderful run from the George Shin Collection. Right now, up on the block, a 1957 Ford Thunderbird convertible. Just beautiful and azure blue with those optional wire wheels, the fender skirts, the porthole hardtop, the town and country radio. 312 watt block under hood, but a highly optioned car. Yeah, one thing that this car has in common with Corvette in 57 is the fiberglass, not body, but roof. The body, of course, on this is steel. And these bodies were made by a company called Bud, who also, of course, makes train cars, even to this day. In Pennsylvania, the bare bodies were shipped to Ford's Dearborn plant for final assembly. So at one point in time, these quarter panels, this Declan, was basically a bare primer shell on its way from Pennsylvania to Dearborn. But now it's been restored, and here it is. Wonderful result there for that 1957 Ford Thunderbird convertible at $63,000, just falling outside today's top 10. Up next on the block, 1958 Chevrolet Impala. A one-year body style for Chevrolet between the tri-year 5567 and the all-new and different uh, 59. This unique two-door hardtop roof line would later be copied by a number of GM and other cars with that wraparound rear window, but this was style. There's a 348 with the triple two-barrel Rochester carburetors. This is the beginning right here, 1958, of the big block era. Now, some would say, that's not a big block. The 396 is a big block. Well, yes and no. This gave way to the 409, which would go away in 64 and, of course, 65. But, yeah, this is a big block in that it's larger than the 265, 283 small block. But, again, beautiful car. AMT makes a nice 125th scale plastic kit of this. If you can't swing the real thing, grab one from round two. So when you bought an Impala, you got all of this great stainless steel trim because Chevrolet wanted everybody to know that you had bought the top of the line car. And look inside. Did your grandmother's sofa have these quilted, clear plastic covers to protect the fabric? Uh, now that tritone upholstery, that is original Chevrolet, uh, but the clear plastic covers, not so much. A lot of critics in the late 50s said a lot of the Detroit cars had gingerbread and glitz added for no reason. Well, yeah, I gotta say here on the back of the roof, this looks like an exhaust vent for interior uh, air. It doesn't do anything at all, but it's a great example of Detroit gingerbread styling. But you know what? I say bring it on. I love it. Great Chevy styling touch, and here's where it began. The Impala got triple tail lights. Lesser Chevrolets had to make do with two. A wonderful result there for that 1958 Chevrolet Impala as it sneaks into the top 10 with $68,000. We're going to check in now with Maguire's staging lanes with Tyler Hoover. Yeah, I'm with something really, really special. Here in person, a 384 lot and 1972 Stutz Blackhawk. Now, Stutz went under in 1935 in the Great Depression, but it was brought back in the 1970s. Virgil Exner pinned this beautiful design that was actually the most expensive car built in America at one point, and you can kind of see why. Under the hood is a GM big block running gear, but look at all the details here, including these knockoff wire wheels, which are real, but not real, is this side exhaust. The exhaust doesn't go through there, obviously, but when you go inside, it's just unbelievable. First, look at this door handle down here, the way it opens, and then you see the gold-lined center console and shifter just so over the top ridiculously comfortable pillow top seats and then look at the carpet this is faux animal for right here which is actually going into the trunk as well for some reason the luggage needed to be faux lined as well now a lot of famous owners of these frank sinatra sammy davis jr barry white but who bought the first one Elvis Presley I'm an Elvis Presley super fan and I also know the last car he ever drove before he went home and died that night was this Stutz. He owned several of them, not this particular car, but he was a big fan of these and man, I can see why. Tyler Hoover, you really know how to pick them. That's a wonderful car. Up now on the block, a 1969 Chevrolet Camaro Yenko recreation. Well, this purports to be a Yenko supercar with a 427. It was born as less. The Camaro Rally Green on here is a stock factory color, however. 
Pete, if you look down low, that weird-looking cross-flow multiple of those dimples, what is that? Well, that's the chambered exhaust option, which is available in reproduction, but unlike a cross-flow multiple with plenty of uh, back pressure, that's basically a straight-through tube. Those dimples kind of tune and tame the exhaust note. Those are generally illegal in most states and not offered for many years. Now, this car was born a 124 V8 tub, but it could have been a 307, could have been a 327, so we don't know. But that said, it's a really nicely done Yenko tribute. Everything is correct from under the hood to outside. Wonderful result there for that 69 Chevrolet Camaro Yenko recreation. I'm going to stay here up on the block as we let's have a look now at a 69 Pontiac GTO Judge Ram Air 3. Pretty much the third generation of GTO in 1968, the first year for the body color Endura bumper. Carried over here to 69. You could get these with hideaway headlights, or you could delete the hideaways and save, I think, $31 or so, as was done here. That's right. This is a 455 with an aluminum intake, which is super duty stuff. Now, that's stuff that was added, but this is an actual judge as verified by Jim Madison's Pontiac Historical Services. It's a 242 GTO, so it's something that Pontiac never made, but maybe should have, a Ram Air 455 in 1969. Now, if the color looks like Camaro Hugger Orange, it is. It's the exact same paint code. However, Pontiac preferred to call this Carousel Red. Yeah, to your point, Mike, there was something like 6,500 judges built in 1969. The first 2,000 were done in this color. The idea behind this was with Jim Wangers and the folks at Pontiac Marketing said, you know, we want the world to see the judge and we want to have a, a uniform marketing statement. They're all going to be orange, but after the first 2,000, any color you wanted was available, including a burgundy car with a white vinyl top. We'll see across the block in a little while. Here Come the Judge was the first commercially successful rap song by an artist named Pigmeat Markham, who then appeared in the first year of Rowan and Martin Laffin to do his Here Come the Judge routine. Pontiac liked it, and this car was born. Big money. Now, all judges were equipped with Ram Air 3 or 4 engines, wherein the scoops were open on a lesser judge without Ram Air or, or, or GTO. This would be blocked off with the integrally molded horizontal ribs, but not on a judge or a Ram Air Go. Real stuff right here. Well, get out your $100,000 bill. It's time. And the judge does it, taking the lead now in the top 10 for the day, the 69 Pontiac GTO judge. A wonderful, wonderful result. We're going to go now to a preview of a car coming up with John Stalupi from the John Stalupi Cars of Dreams collection, and he's with Craig Jackson. One of my other cars that I have here is the first car that got me into hot rods. It's a 1936 Ford. Four door steel body convertible. To restore it the way it's restored is unbelievable. A 350 with yep, a turbo. 350. I mean, it's really, really reliable. You don't have to worry about computers and you don't have to worry about all that other stuff that goes with it. And the color is just, when you look at this car, I mean, look at the paint on this. Burnt car. orange. Listen how the door shuts. I looked underneath it, the frame is painted underneath. It's a gorgeous car, top to bottom, the workmanship. It's all steel. It's an amazing car. It just needs what? A new owner. He's an owner who's going to love it like I do. Welcome back to Barrett Jackson Palm Beach. It's been three years, and as you can see out there, the room is full. It is standing room only here in Palm Beach. And you know, during the week, we have asked, been uh, revealing some of the stories of the cars of our hosts with a new segment we're calling My Garage. And now we have the opportunity to see the one and only Mike Joy's own collection. Well, just a sneak, perhaps. Our cars cover a broad spectrum, from this nearly new Ford GT to this 50-year-old MG Midget. How do you even compare the two? Zero to 60, three seconds. More like 15. 650 horsepower, 55. Top speed, 212. <laughs> Maybe 90 downhill with a tailwind. This has a carbon fiber body. This uses carbon-14 dating to determine the age of some of its components. But 
there's one area in which MG's littlest sports car stands proud against Ford's great GT, and that is the number of smiles per mile delivered. See ya! Well, that was wonderful to see Mark Joy's in two very special cars there. But I've got to ask you, Max, do you have a sense that Mike has a 360-degree camera at home or a dolly or something? That was incredible. The camera work was good, but with a name like Mike, the microphone work could be better, Mike. Got to say, <laughs> I love your video. Good stuff. Damn it, Jim. I'm a talent, not a videographer. My wife, Gay, shot that walk around on her iPhone. She did a wonderful job. I'd love to have Mrs. Joy in my home shooting some of this sort of stuff. It's a thing I don't called have a clip on Mike, Mike. Sorry about the puns. And there we go with a 1972 Sturtz Blackhawk Coupe making some really good money. Coming up next, coming up next, we have the 1972 Sturtz Blackhawk Coupe that Tyler Hoover recently previewed in the Maguire staging lanes. There was a company called Renwall, and they made model cars. And they made four fantasy cars, one of which was the Stutz Blackhawk. And somebody decided, you know what? We need to build those. And they did. And here it is. Yeah, the Neo Classics by Renwall, indeed. Uh, pretty rare models. But uh, this is based on a Pontiac Grand Prix. These are built in Italy. Now, this is not a fiberglass what if. This is made of steel. This is handcrafted. And again, Virgil Exner, the man behind Chrysler's forward look, was the fellow who did these things here. But you look at this, my little plastic magnet, which won't hurt the paint. It sticks everywhere. This is hand-formed steel. Wow. These cars in model form answered the question of what if you took some of the great cars of the 20s and 30s, the Stutz, the Duesenberg, I believe there were four in all, and you took their styling cues and performance and put them in modern bodies and chassis. I don't recall how many of these they sold. It was probably in the high double digits, but the craftsmanship is extremely good and the restoration, fantastic. Well, that's right. You know, these were uh, approximately uh, built between 1971 and 1987, and uh, they sort of came and, you know, they, they sputtered along. But uh, there's a fair number of these, but the better ones are the earlier ones, like this year. Again, 455 Grand Prix Bones, but again, uh, built in Italy. In fact, the Shah of Iran is said to have had 12 of these. A wonderful result there for the 72 Stutz Blackhawk Coupe that Tyler Hoover recently previewed. Now we're going to check in with the lovely April Rose. Hey Murph, I want you to meet my new friend and his name is Kahuna. How about that? 1947 Ford custom woody wagon, all original steel car, custom woodwork, three inch chop top, and it's got a five liter Ford automatic. Look at the detailing on that. Just the coolest ride here right now, in my opinion, and the custom interior. Go ahead, take a look. Power all around, tiki shift lever. I think we all need one of those. And it's rolling on a 20 inch mob steel artillery wheels, four wheel disc brakes all around. Custom, definitely worthy of its name, Kahuna. Murph. Exquisite, exquisite, exquisite. April Rose, a wonderful, wonderful uh, car there. And I just love the idea of a Kahuna. Now up on the block, the 1970 Dodge Challenger RT Coupe. It's a real one, of course. Uh, this one has the 440 Magnum, which was a mere $130 more than the 383 base engine. Nothing wrong with that. 375 horsepower, 480 foot-pounds of torque. Now, you can see the wheels on this. These are the Mopar Rally wheels, but these are 14s, not the 15 by 7 you would expect to see. Well, it speaks to the fact that there were indeed two versions of the Rally, and you paid extra for the 15.7. But this is also kind of weird. It does not have the Bumblebee stripe that would be standard on an RT nor does have the longitudinals. It's a strike delete car. Kind of cool. But again, the Dodge RTs were members of the Dodge Scat Pack. The cars with the bumblebee stripes were not here. Ah! 
an automatic torque flight, 727 under the hood, and this beautiful power dome hood that looks like it's ready to suck in SS396s and GS400s. Not so fast. It doesn't work. It looks great, but again, it was purely ornamental. Now, if you look underneath this hood, there's some spots where you can see that they probably were playing with the idea of having a functional system. It never came to pass, but they probably played with it in engineering. Trying to get six figures for this one. And we're close. You know, the thing I love is the fact that between 70 and 74, about 166,000 challenges were built. Well, since 2008 and now, 673,000 modern era challenges have been built. That's awesome. You can go home again. Now, while the Camaro and Firebird were brothers, the Cuda and the Challenger were more like cousins because didn't the Challenger have a longer wheelbase than the similarly styled, styled Barracuda by about two inches? Are we going to get there? Yes, $100,000. Gonna love that recessed grill. And again, when Dodge brought the Challenger back in 08, they said, you know, we're going to do that. They gave away about a half a mile per gallon, but man, it helps to sell cars. What a wonderful result there for the 1970 Dodge Challenger climbing well up into the top 10 with $100,000. We're going to take a little break here from Palm Beach in Florida. The heat is hotting up across the auction block and some of the wonderful cars from great collections are crossing the block. Up of the block in just a moment, right behind it, that Corvette with the Ukrainian flags, both of those cars are about to be sold across the block as part of a charity auction, raising money for an organization called Samaritan's Purse to help Ukrainian refugees. That's gonna be a big moment here at Barrett Jackson, happening, oh, in about the next hour or so. So you're gonna wanna stick around for that. Up on the block right now, a 1968 Camaro Custom. Well, this car was new. It was one of about, oh, 50,000 six-cylinder cars, in other words, uh, Two in 10 were six-cylinder cars, uh, but that was then. This now is an LS3, which is a Gen 3 small block Chevy, backed up by a TKO five-speed manual transmission. Rear leaf springs have been replaced by coilover shocks, which is a nice upgrade. Allows the addition of wider rear tires. Yeah, Willwood disc brakes all the way around. You know, it's got those RS headlights, new ones up front, 18-inch loose wheels. You know, it's really been solidly customized all the way around. ZL2 cowl induction style hood. This one is a steel replica. Now keep in mind that this did not arrive until 1969 on Camaro, but hey, aftermarket reproductions are ready to go and they bolt right on. $70,000. You know, just about an hour ago, that easily would have landed in our top 10. Now it doesn't even come close. That would take at least $80,000 to pull that off. 2009 Mercedes-Benz SL65. This is an AMG. But now, the styling cycle started in 2003 with dual round headlamps either side. So the Mercedes uh, update or life cycle impulse gave us this headlight look with projector lamps. There's the AMG front apron, uh, the forged alloy wheels, and this one is an SL65, which means V12, not V8. That's right, the 63s would have been the V8 powered cars. Now on the fenders we see something that says by turbo, not compressor. In other words, this does not have a belt driven bore, but rather exhaust driven turbos. Not just one, but two of them. So free horsepower and plenty of it. For built between 2004 and 2011. So this is uh, right around the two thirds mark when they were highly evolved. Original sticker price on this, close to $200,000. At the time, the fastest, highest horsepower and mo you know, most powerful Mercedes-Benz that you could buy. And again, I, I'm a sucker for a long hood and a short deck lid, the classic pony car styling. And I mean, you don't call this a pony car, but it is a mean machine. I love these things. I wish they were American, we could brag about it. Oh well. 
604 horsepower. This one has only 56,000 miles on the odometer. The way it goes, it's $78,000 for 2009 Mercedes-Benz at SL65 AMG. How about a Bentley? In this case, a 2005 Bentley Continental GT. Well, these were around for a long time, starting in 2003, and to this very day, they're still available and being made a uh, third generation, I believe. But one thing that came for 2005 was a uh, phone that can take commands in six languages. I don't uh, speak my Latin so well anymore, but I bet it doesn't do Latin. I took Latin for two years in high school, but, uh, you know, but six languages, jump in there and speak to the phone. It'll translate for you and take direction. Giant 22 inch wheels. The interior of this is to die for. I am a huge fan of two tones. And look at this caramel and truffle interior and the diamond stitching on the seats. Have you seen anything more luxurious cross the block today? I have not. Yeah, the amazing thing is that all of these, regardless of what generation they're in, one, two, or three, they all have all-wheel drive. There's no decontented model with rear-wheel drive only, although there are V8s as well as these W12s. But again, they're all all-wheel drive. Yeah, this was a huge car for Bentley. I mean, not just the fact that it was now owned by VW, but it was really their first mass-produced luxury car. Up until that point, it essentially been handmade. This was mass production. And the question was, would it succeed? I think the answer to that is absolutely. Yeah, if you ever get a chance, just Google Bentley W12 engine, and what you'll see is a very strange looking engine block with th four rows of three cylinders. The weirdest looking thing. You'll, you'll think you're seeing double, but a crazy engine. And again, it's, it's wider than it is long, and the whole point is to get that wide, or that V12 to fit here instead of there. So it's a wide engine. In fact, a lot of it's located in front of the firewall and the head of the actual center line. So kind of nose heavy. Not that it really matters that much, but a very interesting piece of engineering. Well, less than 25,000 miles, 552 horsepower, and they are jumping around out there. Obviously, that was the car of their dreams, and they are taking it home. Congratulations to those folks. $85,000. Don't forget, Barrett-Jackson.com. That is where you can go if you want to check out the uh, full list of cars that are going to be crossing the block, as well as the prices for those that have already sold here in Palm Beach. All right, I love this thing. It's up on the block right now. Very interesting. This is listed as a 1986 Chevy IMSA GTP race car recreation. Well, this is what the Chevrolet factory-sponsored race car uh, looked exactly like same body panels. This is not racetrack rash. This is a wrap uh, to look like this car just finished the Daytona 24 hours. The original race car is in Rick Hendrick's collection in Concord, North Carolina. You know, it's funny. We only now have recently gotten the C8 Corvette with mid-engined uh, platform. Well, back in 1986, the engineers and the race team knew that mid-engine is the way to fly, and indeed, these were. Now, GTP meant GT prototype, which is to say that Chevrolet, Porsche, anybody could run stuff that was prototype. Didn't have to be production-based, but here we have the first mid-engine Corvette, race only. And here's the kicker. This is street legal. It has all the proper street equipment, has an adjustable suspension, so you have a little road ground clearance. You could buy this and drive it home, but would you? Now, it's interesting to note, this one has a tune port injection 350, kind of like you would have found in the mid 80s, so it's period correct in a sense. Uh, not the LS you might expect, but it does have aluminum cylinder hatch, which is kind of nice, but really, what a little monster this thing must be. The power to rate ratio and the grip must be off the chart. Yeah, underneath the original design was essentially a Lola chassis, a design that came off the Lola T600, evolved into the T710. So it had its basis over in England, but it was called the Corvette GTP. Yeah, this has a steel tube frame chassis, nothing like uh, what came out of Slough, Buckinghamshire, and the Lola works in England. But boy, what a fun track day toy. Just drive this to the Dairy Queen and <laughs> have fun.
And I love the fact that they have it up in the 1986 colors the way they did it. That was a successful year for the Corvette GTP program, so it's just a great look. And like you say, the fact that it's street legal, boy, what a lot of fun. $62,000 for that IMSA race car GTP recreation. Yeah, congratulations to you. Up next, the car that we had April Rose previewing for us a little while ago, a 1947 Ford Custom Woody Wagon, nicknamed Kahuna. Well, this is an actual Woody cowl and fender assembly. Just remember, the original Woodies were four doors, not the two-door year. But again, this is a, 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 a what-if, kind of a fun thing on a Fat Man Fabrications chassis. It's powered by a small block Ford. Good to see that. Of course, when the distributor's up front, you're looking at a Ford small block, Chevy small block, distributor's in the back. So good to see it's all in the family. Archie and uh, would love it. Hot Rodders now call these fat fender cars. And just looking at the front of this, you can see why. The body and the fenders uh, are separately stamped and not really of a piece, as we'd see in 1949 when the all-new Ford body style came out. But post-World War II, 1946 was the first year after World War II when you could go and buy a brand new Ford as wartime production of tanks and bombers uh, gave way back to passenger cars once again. Now the roof on this is indeed fabric, although in this case it covers, I'm gonna bet, a steel shell beneath it, but uh, back in the original ones, 46, 47, 48, there would have been a, uh, a wooden lattice, and that would be a fabric roof, which would require some maintenance, as would the, the wooden body. Note this little sticker, HB, does that mean anything to you? Huntington Beach, Surf City, USA, you bet. I love the ash wood, uh, ash also used for baseball bats. Uh, very, it's a hard wood, very tight grain, uh, doesn't deform or warp much, and that's why it's chosen both for bats and for woodies. Transmission is the Ford AOD, which was Ford's first four-speed automatic overdrive Mostly found in mid-80s five-liter Mustangs and trucks. Good transmission based on the C4. It'll handle about 400 horsepower. I like the choice of wheels on this. Uh, they are jewelry in themselves, yet they do not detract from the lines of this car. We're at 75,000, and we may not be close to done. It's interesting. We actually have somebody on the Internet. We've got somebody in the muscle lounge. They're going head-to-head, -head, trying to figure out which one of them is going to come away the winner. Hands are up in the skybox. You could see the bitter assistant that was kind of motioning to the auctioneer going, come on, come on, bring that hammer down. So my guy can walk away the winner at $80,000 for a beautiful 1947 Ford Woody wagon. Uh, coming up, I love this, a 1938 Diamond T. This was a custom pickup truck from the Cars of Dreams. It's got an 8.1 liter V8 engine. Jackson this week we are in Palm Beach second one of the year remember we started off in Scottsdale then we go to Palm Beach then we go to Las Vegas and we finish up the year in Houston four great auctions around the country plenty of opportunities if you're elsewhere in the country to visit but if not well you can enjoy our television coverage we've got seven hours of live auction action here on FYI today and up on the block a 1972 Chevy K10 Cheyenne super pickup well, it's been upgraded in many ways. This is a long bed, let's remember that. It's uh, also a four-wheel drive, which of course brings the K into the picture, the K10 versus the C10, but it has a 350 Edelbrock aluminum heads. Way it goes, $43,000. You know, back in 1957, the county donated 100 acres to create the South Florida Fairgrounds. That's exactly where we're having this auction right now. So we've decided to make that our spotlight year. Find some interesting cars from 1957, and that's exactly what Tyler Hoover has. 1957 was the first year of the redesigned Ford Fairlane, and they made a lot of improvements. It was larger, it handled better, came with a Ford Y-Block V8 and a two-speed Ford-O-Matic transmission, and lots of power options, including a retractable hardtop. 
You wouldn't think this beautifully restored example from the George Shin collection would work in pink and brown, but it really pops in person. And I imagine it will be a huge hit when it crosses the block this weekend. And that 1957 car is one we will see crossing the block tomorrow. Up there right now, we got a 1970 old 442. This is a W30 recreation. Yeah, recreation is the important part. The VIN on this one shows 342. So it's a cutlass, not a 442, which would be 344. Four, that makes any sense, and it, it should. Uh, but this is a, a, a what if, as it were. It's got a 455 Olds, a Turbo 200 R4, which is a light duty four speed automatic, but with the proper beef, it'll certainly live behind that 455. I love the wide and wider old Superstock 2 looking wheels, but uh, with a modern twist. Pretty car. Yeah, there's some nice upgrades that they've done to it. It's got Willwood power disc brakes, got power steering. So in addition to giving it that W30 look, they've made it you know, like a resto mod, a little more drivable in today's modern world. As the W25 fiberglass hood, which is available in reproduction. Great looking hood. Well, there you go, $74,000 for that 442 W30 convertible recreation. All right, let's get really modern. How about 2020, a Corvette C8 Stingray? That's right, the mid-engine, less than 3,000 miles on this one. Yeah, these are astonishing, and we just saw that GTP prototype replica of the 1980s, which had mid-engine. Well, that was a race car as exotic as heck, but now every Corvette is a mid-engine design. Now, this is a coupe, not a roadster, but what a beautiful piece this is. Zero to 60 in under three seconds, and that's the base engine, not even the Z06. Yeah, pretty amazing to think they finally came out with the mid-engine after talking about it for all those years, decades, in fact. VIN reads 0090, so the 90th car, low number, cool. Well, the action is fast and furious here on Friday in the Sunshine State. Still got a long way to go, though, so buckle up. Continue to ride along with us for the next three hours at Barrett Jackson. We are in the thick of things here at Barrett Jackson Palm Beach on the block right now is a 2020 Corvette C8 Stingray. The bid right now, $100,000. I know that the production of these has been on and off at Bowling Green, and right now it's off, so there's a lot of pent up demand, which explains higher than sticker sales. Yeah, I've talked to somebody, a friend of mine just recently got on the list, and he doesn't know when his is going to be arriving. So if you can come in here and buy it on the block, go ahead and do it. Once again, a 2020 Corvette Stingray, hammer down at $100,000. Congratulations to those folks up in the skybox. All right, you say you don't like it in blue? You want something just a little bit different? Well, we've got one coming up in yellow, but first, let's check out our top five. The top seller of the day so far was that wild 2012 Jeep Wrangler. That sold for $250,000. It was actually sold twice, once for $150,000, second time for $100,000, all the money being donated to charity. And as you can see, the cars as you go down, that Pontiac GTO Judge, the Dodge Challenger, a lot of American iron, beautifully done. So once again, we got another Corvette C8 Stingray convertible up on the block. And this one is a sequence number that goes uh, 824. So again, an early build car for the 2020. Uh, and again, 2020, the first year for the C8 with its mid-engine architecture. Now, again, if you're used to seeing the engine up here on the Corvette, which it's been since 1953, not anymore. It's now right back here behind the driver in, you know, classic Ferrari, Lamborghini, Ford GT tradition. And what that does was basically gives the car a whole new lease on traction, acceleration, and Corvette is now ready to take on any vehicle from any part of the planet on equal terms. Watch yeah, out. For the money, now once again, you can't, it's hard to buy him at sticker price right now, but for the money, this is truly an amazing supercar. And, you know, people talk about, well, you know, the base price is $70,000, but you got to have all these options that you put on it. It's like, no, don't you don't have to put them on there. This is an amazing supercar at its base level. So, and this one's got a great story. 
has less than 700 miles on the odometer. It's part of the Chevrolet collection, so it was used at various events. It was at Corvettes of Carlisle, the Chevy Auto Show. They were using it as for specialist training. So this has some fun Chevrolet history behind it. And it just sold at $117,000, meaning that is now the number one retail sale of the day here in Palm Beach, a 2020 Corvette C8. Let's check in with Mike Joy. To many of you at home, the invasion of Ukraine is little more than highlights on your nightly news of a war far away. But it means so much to the people who are gathered here, including representatives of Samaritan's Purse, and some great Barrett Jackson consigners that are about to do a very great thing. Mike Pylock from the American Muscle Car Museum has brought this beautiful Corvette. He's surrounded uh, by his family. And Mark, just tell us about how this idea of this charity car began. <clears throat> Basically, um, most people probably don't know, but my lovely wife is actually from Ukraine. And so uh, for her, it's extremely personal to see all the tragedy that's that's happening in the Ukraine. Uh, so many of her family and friends are still there. Uh, we're very fortunate that we have at least two of her family uh, that has been able to come. Uh, she has her sister here, Olga. She has her niece, Daria. And they fled Kharkov. Uh, that city is constantly being bombed and shelled by the Russians. Uh, they're killing hundreds of children and civilians, innocent people. And so, when I, I saw what was going on, I said, I want to really do something to help the people of Ukraine. And so um, I had already committed to auctioning off some of the cars, and I knew the Ukrainian flag was, of course, blue and yellow. And so I said, well, I, said, I have a beautiful yellow car. It would be a great item to donate for charity. Um, and we all tried to dress in a blue and yellow. So it's really a, a touching tragedy. Uh, that's going on and and since i experienced that firsthand and and see what's happened with my wife and her family that's why we're here today you can, you can sense the emotion uh, that is tied to this samaritan's purse a, a great cause is going to help distribute the funds raised here for relief for ukrainian refugees so that's mark's side of the story megan shin i understand you and george got together and just said well we need to be part of this we wanted to be a part, we wanted to be a blessing to the Ukrainians because they need all of our help. We are blessed to be in America, blessed to be Americans, and we need to be a blessing to the Ukraine right now and to all the people. A wonderful initiative in Georgia, a great car from out of your collection, again, going to this great cause. Well, what happened is that I had decided to sell some of my cars and I went to the best in the world with Steve Davis and, and Craig Jackson. and. So, uh, and I had a, another car that I was going to donate for charity for a school in Haiti. And uh, one night, middle of the night, she woke me up. It was about four o'clock and I just heard her voice say, are you asleep? And I said, I'm not now, are you okay? And she said, yeah, I've been thinking about the Lord's been speaking to me and we need to do something for those people in Ukraine that's suffering. I said, honey, if you let me go back to sleep, we'll get on it first thing in the morning. And so what happened, uh, I called my good buddy here, Rick Hendrick, because uh, Rick, uh, Rick's uh, donated $2,000 for every lap. His cars uh, led the race at this uh, NASCAR event in Vegas. And uh, Ray, uh, this guy's one of the best human beings I've ever met. Donates help so many people. And... <laughs> I get emotional, I'm sorry. But I call Rick, I said, Rick, who are you giving the money to? We want to donate a car and give some money too. All right, well, let's let Rick to tell this part of the story. We'll get a mic here. Rick is here with his grandson to be part of this. And I know just a couple of weeks ago, you donated a total of $300,000 to Ukrainian relief yeah. uh, at the NASCAR race based on laps that your four cars led. Yeah. And pick up the story from here. Well, we had, you know, we just saw the tragedy unfolding on TV and uh, we thought we would, uh, you know, donate for every lap and then with the automotive group and racing, we, we're over 500,000 now. And, uh, but I know the Graham family and they do such unbelievable work. And when I called Franklin, they had a hospital underground when it started. And I just, I'm so happy to meet this family uh, that survived and uh, 
But George, thank you, and we need to raise a lot of money today. The Pylocks, the Shins, the Hendricks, the Jacksons, the Davises, all of Barrett Jackson is one great family, and we're about to raise a lot of money for the greatest cause today imaginable. Thanks a lot, Mike. Yeah, those cars will be crossing the block very soon, and I have no doubt, just as the Barrett Jackson family and family of fans and family of buyers and bidders has always opened their hearts and their purses before, they'll be doing so again. Up on the block now, a 1935 Ford Model T Custom Roadster, and it hammers sold at $43,000. Right behind it, we got a 1970 Olds 442 convertible. 1970 was the year that the 442 grew cubic inches to 455. That's not the optional engine. That's the standard engine in all 442s. Amazing stuff. Now, we do see the 344 VIN. It's a true 442. And there's that mighty 455 big block V8 under the hood. Now, this one's got an automatic, but what it does not have is the optional cold air fiberglass hood. It would otherwise have a duct here with a seal. But again, it's a true 442 convertible 1970. Uh, what a monster. Beautiful car. Center console, automatic on the floor. Got air conditioning. It's pretty well loaded, but believe me, it's a muscle car, even though it's also a luxury car. Yeah, less than 3,000 of these made. You know, this was the year that uh, GM lifted their ban on engines that uh, were more than 400 cubic inches, so the result was 455 cubic inches, 365 horsepower. 1970, of course, really the ultimate year when it comes to performance in the muscle car era. You know, the unusual thing that's unique to the old 455 is that the stroke is larger than the bore. In other words, it's under square, and that does a lot for torque. Most V8s built after World War II are over square, where the bore diameter is larger than the stroke in inches. But again, the old 455 stands alone as Detroit's only post-war undersquare V8. And again, that emphasizes low-end torque. And this is one of the cars from the John Salupi Cars of Dreams collection. So uh, we know John likes to buy the best. This is another one of the cars that he's owned and we're seeing cross the block in a sequence. And they've got a lot in addition to the, to the regular restoration. There were a number of new old stock parts used to help restore this. In other words, parts that, well, they were built back in the day when this car was new, but they were never used. Someone acquired them, and the result was this was part of the restoration. Of the dual exhaust on these things, the through the muffler with the trumpet tip, that's not custom stuff. That's a factory option. Good to see it here. This does have the old 12-bolt rear axle, which is different from a Chevy 12-bolt. These don't have C-clips. These actually have bearing retainers, so it's similar but different from a Chevy 12-bolt. It's interesting watching the bidders assistant on the right-hand side. Oh, he was trying to get one last bid in, but he couldn't quite pull it off. As a result, the internet bidder came away. The high bid was $89,000 for that 1970 old 442. Oh, man, you got to be quick. Don't sit around and wait. If you're going to get your bid in, do it fast. Another car from the Cars of Dreams collection. This is another one we previewed a little while ago, a 1936 Ford Phaeton convertible. You gotta remember in the earliest uh, oh 20 years of the automobile most every car had an open roof but as the steel roof took over open top cars became less common and this is a four-door phaeton a very rare body only 4378 made in 1936 the chassis cam shows us the underside of fully modified rack and pinion underside of the small block chevy x frame open drive shaft nine inch rear axles so the original live axles and transverse leaf springs are ancient history but again a very rare body knew this was 860 $60, which doesn't sound like much, but it's $100 more expensive than the next most expensive Ford. So this was the top of the line with a topless <laughs> angle. But again, a very rare body right here, the Phaeton. And what's really amazing to look at that hood, that front hood with the way the beak puts out there. I mean, just think, just four years earlier, they had the 32 Ford, which had a flat look to the very front. By now, they had changed the styling, and in just a few years, it was moving radically forward from an industrial design perspective. Very, very cool. Yeah, Phaetons were also a popular in Australia where things are warmer and drier. But here in the United States, a four-door open-top car? Who would buy that? Well, again, about 4,300 people in 1936. Now, I think the Phaeton body continued till about 1938 or 9, but it's always been the rarest body style. 
That's pretty cool, Hot Rod, and those folks get the honor of bringing it home for $58,000. We're going to head out to the McGuire staging lanes and check in with Tyler Hoover. Well, here's something I have never seen before. This started life as a 2017 Ford Shelby GT350, the real deal voodoo, voodoo flat plane crank V8 under the hood, six speed manual transmission. But then somebody decided to radically customize this thing. They ditched the magnetic ride control that you would have normally with the Shelby and swapped it with air ride so you could slam this to the ground. But then obviously you see the wide body kit they put on this thing. So now you can put giant tires on the back so you don't have to worry about traction. But to do this, you do have to drill holes into the fenders. So the first time you drill that hole to get this wide body kit on, well, you are committed. And what a look. Of course, this is all wrapped, so it could be undone except for the holes. It's a real GT350 that's made into sort of a radical, wild looking race car. Really cool. Every time I walk by that one, Tyler, I got the same reaction. I'd look at it for a moment and go, wait a minute. There's something different about that. It is very wide. It didn't, you notice it the moment you walk by. Another truck that we previewed a little while ago, a 1938 Diamond T. This is interesting because it's a custom. Well, this almost presents as being larger than life. This is much longer than an eight-foot bed. Uh, the long hood, seldom seen style. Uh, black cherry over black, uh, truffle leather with uh, black cherry accents. Beautiful truck. Now this has an 8.1 liter GM V8 engine with a four speed overdrive automatic transmission. Custom bed. And from the Cars of Dreams collection. Uh, you will need an extra length garage to house this one, but it would be worth it. Even in its day, this was an industrial truck, not just a standard truck that was built on, you know, a half ton frame. This was a beast when it was built. I have a Chevy C6500 uh, ramp truck with a Hodges bed. This would have been its 30s equivalent. I mean, not just super duty, heavy, heavy duty. $65,000 for a 1938 Diamond T custom pickup truck. Beautifully done. We're going to take a quick break and come right back. Let's go wild car across the block and brought wild money a 2008 Cadillac XLR. OK, it doesn't look like that. Well, it's because they call it a 789 XLR. It's got the front look of a 1957, the back look of a 1959 Chevy and the door look well from a 1958. When it crossed the block, it sold for one hundred thousand dollars up there right now. We got a 1933 Ford sedan delivery custom. Wow, what a beautiful car and uh, all steel two-door sedan uh, so no separate trunk just lots of room in the back and look at those beautiful tail lights the way that they are frenched into the fenders great amount of style here it would take us all day to describe all the custom touches and workmanship that have been put into this car which is described not as a sedan but as a sedan delivery a commercial vehicle yeah, I love the fact they've chopped that top two and a half inches. And boy, you look at that steel, you don't see any of that right there. They channeled it two inches on the frame. Beautifully done. Did I read that these are Plymouth Prowler taillights? I think they are. Yes, the retro style uh, two-door roadster, two-seat roadster uh, that Plymouth and Chrysler built. Wow. Yeah, yesterday Tyler Hoover was previewing this and pointed out those Prowler taillights. Uh, and, you know, the, the point being that this is a, a little bit of this and a little bit of that, which is exactly what they would have done with a hot rod when they were building it back in its day. Disc brakes, modern suspension uh, up front, coilovers there. That slope forward grill, unmistakable, the gleaming silver over metallic gray paint. Uh, a theme repeated in the interior. The door handles and the hinges have all been shaved off of this one. Great build. Yeah, four wheel disc brakes. And this is another, another one from the Cars of Dream collection. There you see the folks up in the skybox. They come away the winning bid. Congratulations to them. 
And the Summit Racing Soul sticker goes on. They write the price 70K, you see there, $70,000. Off it will go. Boy, I love that hot rod. What a beautifully done piece. All right behind it, we got a 1966 Pontiac GTO convertible. And this one with the upgraded 360 horsepower tri power engine, tri power being three two barrel carburetors instead of the single Rochester four barrel. Uh, I see an air conditioning compressor here. That's kind of rare on convertibles, but not here in Palm Beach. Second styling cycle for the GTO. Uh, those are the parking and signal lights. They look like driving lights or fog lights. And we see that on much more modern cars than this 66. The eight crate grill denoting the 66, and it's not a 67, though otherwise the cars were very similarly styled, but for the grill and the tail lights. Now, this is also, not only is this a tri-power car, it's a four-speed car. So three pedals, gas brake and clutch. GTO, Gran Turismo Amalogato based on the Pontiac Tempest, and by now it became its own model line, but still uh, a very commodious car, not like the Firebird that would come along a year later, this thing with a full-size usable trunk and seating for five. Popular in its day, they sold nearly 100,000 of these, and it's popular here. The current bid at $115,000. Now we're up to 120, meaning this is now the highest retail sale of the day behind our earlier charity cars that sold. And that's what the hammer comes down on, $120,000 for a 1966 Pontiac GTO convertible. Well, coming up in just a little bit, you gotta check this out. The 1966 Dodge Hemi Charger. Bright red, restored to concourse condition, one of only 468 made that year. Beautiful day here in Palm Beach. Beautiful waters. Great place to hang out. Oh, that's if you want to go to the beach or hang out by the ocean. But if you want cars, well, that's where you want to head inland just a little bit to the South Florida Fairgrounds and the Barrett Jackson Collector Car Auction Palm Beach Edition. Those are the cars out of the free staging lanes. They'll be coming up here very soon. Meanwhile, up on the block right now, we have a 2017 Jeep Wrangler Unlimited Custom. Yeah, unlimited generally means four doors when you're talking Wranglers, and something that's often un unrecognized is that the roof center is removable, as are the doors. Those industrial strength looking hinges, front and rear, aren't just for looks. You can actually lift and remove the doors on these, which are, I mean, that's something that in the 70s when colonnade styling and malaise were the backbone and being conservative, no more convertibles. We now have vehicles that are fun and safe. It's a great example of that. Tailgate opens, of course. Opens wide here at the rear, and the spare tire comes with. Pretty cool stuff. Huge cargo area. Aftermarket bumper in the tail. Nice piece. You know the great thing about the Jeep world is it doesn't matter whether you take them stock, you customize them. Everybody has what they like in a Jeep, and it, you know, it adds value if you customize them. They can add value if they bring them back to stock. If they're older, they're vintage. But it doesn't matter what you like. There's somebody out there who wants to buy it. This does have a lot of aftermarket components, as you mentioned, Rick. Uh, the wheel lips, which are steel, and kind of have the look of a Dodge Power Wagon. Cool. Love those inner fenders right there. 6,000 miles that just sold for $60,000. Don't forget to check out Barrett-Jackson.com. That's where you get the full list of cars. We call it the docket of all the cars that are going to be crossing the block, as well as those that have already crossed the block. Do your research, maybe do a little bit of dreaming. You can eventually find out what you might want to bid on someday. Up on the block right now is the car that Tyler Hoover previewed for us. What a wild machine. It's a 2017, it's a Shelby GT350, but it has definitely been taken up to the next level. 
Yeah, we've got to remember the GT350 was made between 2015 and 2020, and every single one of them has that flat plane 5.2 liter Voodoo V8 that goes to 8,500 RPM. These are serious machines. In fact, over 20,000 of these were built in that five-year model run. Now, this one's been pretty heavily modified with a wide-body kit. This is probably uh, injection-molded plastic at each corner. These are screwed on. They're not blended in with Bondo, which is actually a correct look. The IMSA race cars, the Monzas, etc., of the 1970s, their body kits were largely add-ons like this. It's not a, a shame to, uh, to have an add-on kit rather than trying to mold this stuff in. But again, this is a very rare and desirable car, which has been heavily modified. That's okay. It's good on good. All right, Steve, you mentioned the flat plane crank. Explain what you mean by that. Basically, uh, it's a lighter crank, and it basically behaves like two four-cylinder engines joined at the crank, as it were. But the crankshaft has much smaller uh, counterweights, which allows it to spin really high. And it's better for tuning, a variety of reasons. The only thing, it has more shake. So the engine mounts on these things are hydraulic. But again, Ferrari, every Ferrari V8 engine uh, has been a flat plane design. So they certainly work, and Ford has adopted. In fact, the new Z06 Corvette 5.5, that's a flat plane engine, too. They have an amazing exhaust shriek at wide open. Yeah, always did well at high RPM, and uh, in the United States, we just didn't really need to rev up that high, but now with the ability to do both, have a low RPM and high RPM, the design of really impressive. $60,000 the current bid for this truly wild Shelby GT350 Custom. It's got a wide body kit by a company called Liberty Walk. Really just creates a whole new look for this thing. And I have to say, every time I'd walk by it when it was over in the showcase, it got my attention. One thing to keep in mind is that these engines have 12 to 1 compression, which is sky high, but with the knock sensors and computers, it works. Yeah, once again, it's amazing how far we've come with automotive technology, things we couldn't do or had a hard time doing 30, 40 years ago. Well, it's standard today. $145,000, the hammer just came down on this 1976. Ford Bronco Custom SUV. That is now the number one retail sale of the day. It's got a Ford Gen 3 Coyote 5 liter V8 engine in there. Dana 20 transfer case. At Scottsdale, we saw that market just crank. And I have a feeling here in Palm Beach, the prices on those are going to be strong again. $145,000. Number two sale overall. Number one retail sale of the day. All right. The question is, would you like a matching one, maybe a little newer from 1976? How about a 2021 Ford Bronco Custom? Well, there are two engines available in the non-Raptor, of course, the 2.34 and the 2.7 V6. This one has the 2.3 liter four banger. And with the Ford, you can get a seven speed manual, but only about 15% are built that way. This is a 10 speed automatic, but something has been done here. Now in the early days, Broncos, the rear wheel openings were cut and large. Well, something that are people doing are now is they're deleting the factory fender flares with non flares by four wheel parts and other companies. So that's something Ford can't do. You're gonna the tire but with that said the new look on bronco is the wheel lip delete and here we have it here yeah it's cool this is a four inch adjustable lift kit so you can make it as high or as low as you want in that four inches and four inches trust me is an awful lot of travel within that suspension so it's really cool the stance it gives it's got those vintage stripes on it really nicely done and we're closed in on a hundred thousand dollars these, uh, unlike the Ford F-Series pickups, which are all aluminum, including the, the floor, etc., these have a steel skin, the rear quarter panels and firewall and floor, but everything else is aluminum. The fenders, the doors, the tailgate, the hood. And again, it's lightweight and strong. And four-wheel parts is a national chain that uh, will sell you anything you might need for your four-wheeler and install it. I uh, did a TV show with these guys years ago in their Los Angeles uh, depot, and they had everything you might need to modify your vehicle from stock to wild. It's got those big, huge 38-inch tires, big 17 by 9 wheels underneath. And once again, this particular truck has less than 100 miles on the odometer, so this is an absolute brand-new build 
with all of these custom touches. One thing I love about Bronco is that the Ford designers and engineers went crazy with fun details. This one is a soft top. You can see here the top folds back and stacks at the rear. This is factory stock. This is not some crazy custom. How fun and cool is that? Well, that is the happiest kid in the building right there. He's a part of that purchase. Congratulations. $98,000 for a modern custom Ford Bronco. Let's head out to the McGuire staging lanes. Beautiful sunshine out there. We're going to check in with Tyler Hoover. Okay, that doesn't look nearly as fast. Uh, no, it's not, but it's always a crowd favorite here. Lot 411, a 1965 Amphicar, and it is a car that swims. I'd never seen a diagram like this before that shows everything with how it works, which you can see inside you have the four-cylinder engine that drives the wheels to go on the road, but you also have a clutch and two little transmissions or drive shafts that run the rear propellers so you can actually go into the water now it didn't do either of these things very well I don't think the top speed driving down the road was much more than 60 and certainly in the water it wasn't very fast but you do have a vehicle that is capable of doing both and my favorite story with these is with President Lyndon Johnson. He had one at his Texas ranch, and when he would have guests over, he would prank them by pretending the brakes had gone out on his car and would crash into the water. The people didn't know that it was amphibious, and he would just, well, prank them. This looks like a beautifully restored example. In recent years, these things have gone way up in value, and this one is gorgeous. Yeah, I was looking at that earlier. Very nicely restored. Up in the block right now, the 1956 Oldsmobile Holiday 98 Custom that apparently used to belong to Pat Riley. Remember him from the Lakers and the Heat? Beautiful piece. You know, the the uh, art of the exhaust outlet. Here we have a central exhaust outlet, kind of like a late model Corvette. Nicely done, integrated into the bottom of the bumper. It's been scalloped and then re-chromed. Now this, of course, is a 98 as opposed to an 88, rides on a longer wheelbase. This is the top line offering for Oldsmobile, short of a Fiesta. Although under the hood, which is closed now, there's a 555 cubic inch big block Chevy. Interesting that they kept all the stainless trim separating the two-tone down the sides, but otherwise this has been shaved of all of its adornment, its jewelry, its door handles, no outside uh, rear view mirror. Very clean look. Transmission in this one is a combination of traditional and modern. It's a Chevy Turbo 400, three speed automatic, no overdrive, but there's a gear vendor's overdrive added to the tail shaft, which then turns into an eight or six speed. You can double up each of those gears with the gear vendor's gear splitter unit, which is actually an evolution of the old Laycock non mill overdrive from Jaguars and Spitfires from England, but it works today as well as it did then. This is a modern take on a classic GM color scheme salmon pink and deep metallic gray was offered by Oldsmobile on this car in 1955-56 one of my neighbors had one because we just want to make sure the consigners folks they give us these cars they say I'm going to give it to Barrett Jackson we're going to sell them at no reserve and we see the values we have in our mind and about what they're worth when we see a car that's really, really below what we hoped it was going to bring, we want to make sure for the consigner's sake we're communicating properly. This car, if you were given the car, this would be a good start on the deposit. And that's not an exaggeration, folks. Incredible amount of money spent on this car. Celebrity ownership. One more look before it rolls off the block. It's going to sell for what you decide it's going to sell for, but it's a great buy. 10, 20. Mind, this is a hard top, which was the uh, sort of the styling trend of the 50s, getting away from the fixed B pillar of uh, a sedan and the hard top with the windows down. Kind of gave it the open air feel of a convertible, but with a fixed roof, it stayed dry. The only downside is when that rubber seal starts to dry up, you get wind noise, but it's a beautiful, graceful style. This car has been shown a bunch, won a lot of awards, including Boyd Coddington's Pro Picks. It was a finalist for the Good Guys Custom Rod of the Year. So not only was it built well, it has been shown well, and the judges love it. Yeah, this is the sort of car that you would see at the SEMA show. And, uh, I mean, it looks as good now as it did when it was built. I would say this is probably about a 12 to a 15-year-old build, but, again, it's not unraveling at all. It looks fantastic. You can open that trunk lid. Yeah, there we go. Uh, okay, it's got the car cover inside, a <laughs> bit of an anticlimax, but again, nicely finished inside with filler panels, uh, soft fabrics, uh, not the big cavern it would have had from the factory. Looks good. 
Pretty sure the wheel wells have been tubbed. Those are really wide rear wheels and tires, hence not much trunk room. Well, the price has definitely jumped up to 175,000. The current bid still moving. Wrap around windows front and rear again. Another 50 styling icon. The way it goes, $180,000 for a 1956 Oldsmobile Holiday 98 Custom, the number one retail sale right now. A uh, lovely day here in South Florida. Plenty of great cars as well. Yet to cross the block. A wide variety of things that you'll see here at Barrett Jackson. Well, moments ago, something really interesting crossed the block and got a lot of attention. It was a really nice 1967 Corvette. Big block, 435 horsepower. By the time it hammered sold, $117,000. And I can tell you, the money has suddenly arrived. The quality of cars has jumped up. Just to make it into the top 10, you'd have to see a car sell for $100,000. And guess what? Numbers are still going to go up over the course of the next two days. Right now, we got a 1966 Dodge Hemi Charger. We previewed this a little while ago, and it's closing in on 100000 well, 1966 was the first year for the street Hemi, and this was something that NASCAR made Chrysler Corporation do. They said, if you want to race that Hemi thing on our tracks ever again, we make those for the public. So Chrysler sat out 65, released the 66 street Hemi, and voila. Now, this is one of 493 built and out of 468 cars out of 37,000. But again, the controversial fastback styling wasn't for everyone, but this is a numbers matching car. Great restoration. Four bucket seats and a full length console in these. Now, my memory may be a little hazy, but I seem to recall seeing the original Dodge Charger show car in a pavilion at the New York World's Fair, 1964 65. It, is, it looked very much like this, previewed the production Charger of 1966, and that fastback roof line, wow, that was to die for. Yeah, the Dodge ads read, even Custer couldn't muster a stampede like the Hemi Charger. And I remember being about a 10-year-old kid in 1974 when the Ford Pinto was the new thing and thinking, man, I missed out. But now we have Hemi Chargers all over again. But with that said, this is the very first of the Charger family and the very first of the Street Hemi family right here. 1967 would see the addition of a trunk spoiler right here, a screw-on device, which would be one of the first add-on aerodynamic devices for the muscle car period. Well, another thing we have all over the place is $100,000 cars. That one just sold for $127,000. Yep, a 1966 Dodge Hemi Charger bringing solid money here at Barrett Jackson. Back, I think it's time to update our top five because it's been changing so rapidly. Remember, our top sale was the charity car that was sold twice. To benefit a uh, great cause. Then, of course, you've got that old Holiday 98 Custom. We've got a Ford Bronco, that Hemi Charger, and a Pontiac GTO. $120,000 just to break into the top five right now. Up on the block, we've got a 1971 Chevy K5 Blazer. And this one comes out of the Hendrick Performance Collection in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Black over red. The K5 meant this was the quarter ton Chevy truck, or the Blazer, and the K denotes four wheel drive, 350 cubic inch V8 automatic, and uh, nicely restored. Yeah, the funny thing with these is these have a fiberglass roof that looks like, oh, pop it right off, you got yourself a roadster. Not so fast. These were bolted down. You could remove it, but it would take you about an hour or two. Uh, but again, any black pickup truck with factory codes is a rare thing, uh, or a blazer for that matter. But this is a nicely restored. Now, the wheels are from a, oh, probably a late, 70s application, but uh, still all in the family. Nice restoration. Fresh interior with the uh, Silverado embossing on the vinyl. And the CST you see on the door, that is not someone's initials. That stands for Chevrolet Sport Truck. By the way, Steve, there's some great uh, videos on YouTube showing how to remove these. So before you go at it, watch how other people have done it, because there's one bolt in the back that's hard to see, and it's an advantage to know where that is. I had one owner claim he could remove his hardtop in 15 minutes. I didn't ask him if he could then reassemble it. 
This one has a 350, which is the biggest engine possible. Uh, no big blocks until you get into, uh, well, the later years. Uh, in fact, well, big blocks were never available in a Blazer. They would arrive uh, in half tonners in 66, 67, but Blazers were always small block powered. You get a 400 in the mid 70s, but this is a 350, which is the largest engine. Plenty of power. $100,000 bid. Now, that is a lot of money for a Blazer. So these were four seaters with a lot of luggage and this one's locked sorry but uh, plenty plenty of storage room here along with the uh, five seats broncos blazers even the international scouts values are moving up that's a hundred thousand dollar car wow uh, we have hit that point in the day when the cars the quality is up and the price is in the room a lot of money 1957 chevy nomad custom well, again, this comes from Hendrick Performance. Uh, they have brought quite a group of cars. So when you're Rick Hendrick and you own a lot of Chevy dealers and some of the winningest Chevrolet race cars on the planet, and you have your own museum, your own performance department, the cars are going to come out of there and head to auction looking like this. Yeah, this is a, it's been modified, of course. Uh, it is an actual Nomad. It's got a small block under the hood. Looks like fuel injection and add-on, so a throttle body type deal, I think. Uh, again, keep in mind, 57, 56, and 55 were the three years for the two-door Nomad. And 57 was the number that was produced in the least number, about 6,100. And uh, a rare bird. Beautiful piece. This one has a very stock looking interior. Yes, that two tone and that brocade upholstery. That's what came from Chevrolet in 1957 in their top of the line two door hardtop wagon. Well, I think the official ante for buying a car now here in the afternoon on Friday at Barrett Jackson Palm Beach is $100,000. It's the century mark. We're at 100,105 bid for this 57 Nomad. Now, the Nomad was a bit of a gamble for Chevrolet because a two door station wagon was associated with florist delivery and sedan delivery, and, and it was a utilitarian workhorse. But the Nomad show car displayed at the Waldorf Astoria GM Motorama was a two seat wagon style, much like this, but built on the two seat Corvette. And then they had to take it in largest proportions to go on the full size Chevrolet. But here it is blue chip collectible and beautifully redone. It is interesting to note that the grill and hood and front fenders were the same as in any other Chevy of 1957. But from the dashboard back the Nomad was very specific. I'll tell you what, we had three solid bidders going after that. Congratulations to those folks right there. $130,000 for a 1957 Chevy Nomad Custom. Coming up, well, we saw that one Bronco rock the block, and this one may do the same. A 1967 Ford Bronco Custom frame-off restoration. It'll be here soon. Beautiful coastline here in Palm Beach, Southern Florida. Yeah, great water out there. It's a great place to vacation. It's also a great place to come and enjoy the Barrett Jackson Collector Car Auction in Palm Beach. Inside the room, I tell you what, it's a packed house. You got people standing, I don't know how many deep they are in the back, because you know, of course you get a general admission ticket, you can just come in and watch. And up on the block right now, a 1972 Chevy C10 Super Cheyenne pickup truck. Yeah, short bed, fleet side, half ton. That's uh, the big three for success here. And this one has been given a 454 big block heart transplant. No problem there. Not something came from the factory until 73, but it's backed up by a 400, a 700R4, four-speed automatic. Interesting wheel and tire choice here. 20s on the front and 22s on the rear. And 65 is the magic number. That's what it sells for, $65,000. All right, from a big red pickup truck to a small red Amphicar, 1965 Amphicar 770. Well, the final year for Amphicar, 1960 through 65. And, uh, you know, it was a car that didn't do either thing well, drive or float, but, you know, they're so cool. You know, there are places in America where 
roads reach, but they are very difficult and to be able to hop across the lake to go to dinner and uh, drive there and not have to switch vehicles. That is pretty cool. Yes, you get the life jackets. Yes, Cliff, you do get the paddle uh, that goes with it. There's the gas tank front mounted the engines in the rear. You are ready to go or show on land or sea. It does everything but fly. Uh, these don't have rudders, but if you look at the front tires, yep, those are your rudders. You turn them left to go to port or right to go to starboard, as they say. It does have two propellers on the back, and yes, they are reversible. You can go backwards in one of these if you want to. And this thing's all Coast Guard approved. It has all the right lights uh, for nighttime running on the lake including, let's see, red right return, isn't it? Okay, so there's the red light to port on the nose and the green light shows to starboard, which is right, of course. By the way, the most important handle on that, Mike, isn't the outside, it's inside. At the base of the door, inside the door, there's a secondary handle. If you're gonna go in the water, you tighten that up to make the door watertight. Yeah, we see it right there at the back of the door. There it is. Yeah, so once you're in, latch. you ratchet that, that shuts the door and tightens it up. By the way, we're at 120,000. I remember we saw one sell for 117,000 at least a decade ago, and we thought that was so much money. And now, for an Amphicar, we're beyond it at 130,000, well, 127. And the propellers on these are made of plastic, which makes them inexpensive versus a brass uh, item. Uh, and again, a little bit softer if you smack into a piece of wood or something like that. But uh, an interesting thing, two props and reversible. It was a lousy car. It wasn't a very good boat, but it did what neither of those could do individually. Oh, and more importantly, it's bringing great money. So $145,000. I'm not sure what the record is for an Amphicar. Well, we're at 140. They just dialed it back a little bit. But I think we're pretty darn close. Total production on these was 3,878 in that five-year run. According to the consigner, this one only has about 3,500 miles on the odometer. Of course, we're not counting how many miles on the lake. Is the speedometer in miles per hour or not? Either way, $147,000 the price for a 1965 Amphicar. All right, rolling up on the block behind it, a 2021 Ford Bronco. This is a Badlands custom SUV. Well, this is interesting. You know, we saw a moment ago, we saw one with the, uh, the, the wheel arch delete. This is how they are built from Ford. This one does have the 2.3 liter EcoBoost with a seven speed manual. Kind of a, a rare piece. Uh, only about 15% are built with the stick shift. And if you have the V6, you cannot get the stick. So if you want a, a clutch pedal Bronco, here it is. Demand for these still far exceeds supply. So folks lucky enough to buy them and deciding to modify them such as this are finding a ready home in the secondary market. Now the funny thing, a lot of people say, why a seven speed tranny? Well, the seventh gear is what they call the C, the crawler gear, which has a 6.6 to one ratio, which slows this thing down and lets you go up a wall or crawl up that wall. In fact, the stick is marked C for crawl. So a normal first gear in a manual box would be about 2.4 to 1. So 6.6, .6, you're right. That's the ultimate granny gear stump puller right there. This one is a soft top. And that folds and retracts all the way. I mean, how fun is that? You know, we, you got to think about this. For a long time, vehicles were just built over safe in the 1970s with rollover protection. And this is still very safe, no doubt about it. The A, B, and C pillars are rock solid. But the top folds back. You can enjoy the sun and be safe. You can have your cake and eat it, too. And the word Bronco in the grill lights up. Uh, that's a feature Cadillac introduced a while back. Followed by Mercedes, you can order a light and three-pointed star. And on these, you can get the whole Bronco across the front of the truck to light up. 
notice if you looked at from the rear how wide the track is, distance between the tires, and that's all about stability. The original Broncos were probably 30% narrower and more prone to toppling. And, you know, as a result of uh, well, some legal action, you know, almost every off-road type vehicle got really wide tracks like Whoa, you see here. A hundred thousand dollars. We got an internet bidder involved as well. You know, you have to admit, Ford tapped in perfectly at the right time. There was a pent-up demand for this kind of car. They brought it out, and it's absolutely rocking the market. It's the perfect amount of retro style with modern look. Boy, the prices are strong, and the two-door version looks great. I remember the Bronco campaign was off, on, off, on, off, on, and the Bronco Sport was kind of a placeholder for a while. But here's the real deal right here. $100,000 for a 2021 Ford Bronco Custom. All right, let's check in with April Rose. You don't just show up in this, okay? You arrive. It is luxurious and beautiful 2006 Maybach 62 limousine. Now, this is the long wheelbase version of the Mercedes limousine. Twin turbo V12, 550 horsepower. Now, take a look inside. Reclining rear seats that are just so comfortable. Even Tyler Hoover is taking a nap. That's how comfortable those seats are. Privacy curtains. You got a fridge for champagne and your own personal gauges right up there on the top so you could be the best backseat driver ever, which I'm sure Tyler is, of course. And you got 12 Bose speakers. What do you think, Debrule? How should we wake him up again? Oh, wait, he's up. Should we play some Bach or Beethoven? It's a my Bach, so Bach, of course. That'll be up in the block very soon. Thanks, lady and gentlemen. I appreciate that. 1972 Chevelle. This one's an LS5 SS. Well, yeah, 1972 is the first year that Chevrolet introduced an engine designation in the BIN. We see the W. Yep, 454. Not a clone, not a fake, nothing like that. This has cowl induction, and uh, this is basically the end of the line for Chevelle convertibles ever. 1972, a whole different body for 73. Yep, final year for this styling cycle. Uh, bucket seats, $100,000 bid. Full-length console, basket handle, shifter, and uh, a whole lot of restoration here on a car that just has 51,000 actual miles. This one does have the optional ZL2 cowl induction hood, and a lot of folks don't realize there's actually two doors. This one here is vacuum actuated at wide open. It sits open. There's a vacuum diaphragm. It isn't functioning. There's also an electric door inside. But yeah, ZL2, two doors inside of there, not one. $100,000 for that Chevelle LS5 from 1972, 50 years ago. Now it's brand new. Back here in Palm Beach, the Barrett Jackson Collector Car Auction up on the block right now. We got a 1960 Ford Thunderbird convertible, currently bid at 67,000. Earlier today, we saw a three-speed manual Thunderbird, a 1959. Well, here is the much more typical automatic transmission in a Thunderbird. Beautiful red over red and white interior, big wide whites, repeating that theme. Note the uh, radio antenna sits proud right in the center of the trunk, so it has a good ground plane. And they sell this Thunderbird for $75,000. And now they're going to sell a car for a great cause. Jackson moment. This is Franklin Graham, and I want to thank Mr. George Shin for donating the 2009 Shelby GT500 Super Snake signed by Carol Chevy, two Samaritans for our work in the Ukraine. The situation there is desperate. Millions of people have fled their homes. Samaritans Purse has a field hospital. We have clinics. We have 150 staff, doctors, nurses. We're distributing blankets, food, other hygiene equipment, and we need your help and need your prayers. God bless all of you folks there at Bear Jackson Auction today. You know, I've been a bidder of Bear Jackson since 2008, and I've been a senator since 2018. And I'm the luckiest senator on this earth because my boss is Ron DeSantis. How about that? And so here he is, Ron DeSantis. Thank you so much. Isn't it great to be in these United States? 
and what freedom is what these people are fighting for in Ukraine. We are the luckiest people in the world to be a part of the United States of America, and that flag represents inspiration. My beautiful wife is actually from Ukraine, and the two Ukrainian flag bearers are actually a couple of her family members that have actually just fled. Let's hear it, ladies and gentlemen. Governor DeSantis, sold! Sold! There we go! $1 million! You know why that was happening? To tell you how great this man is standing to my left, and of course we know how great this guy to my right is. He said, Steve, this is amazing. I want to throw in another $100,000. Tetiana and I are also going to donate another $100,000 for the great cause. Thank you. I'm going to donate personally $100,000, and I think Mr. Craig... And Cray, so am I. Carolyn and I, Steve and Janie, that's $400,000. Hey, John wants and, to put in $100,000 up on the top yes. there. Yes. And we've got another one. Joseph, oh, here, here's and, what we should and, do. And Michelle Mousy just whispered in my ear with her representative, she wants to throw in another $50,000. John Rosati, another hundred thousand dollars. Thank you very man. much. Thank you, John. I think we're at Thank least you. at one point six five million dollars, and that doesn't count what's being picked up in the room. These people are fighting for their lives. Thank you. Barrett Jackson is known for extraordinary moments, and especially when it comes to a charity moment. I've been here for a few years now, Craig. I don't think I've seen a moment more touching than that. That was un absolutely unbelievable. The generosity of both the Shin Pylock families is extraordinary in this very, very difficult time. And it's so urgent for you to step up and do this is just wonderful. The generosity that we see today from both your families. Thank you for my father. Thank you from the ministry. But know that this is going to go to the field right away. we got teams on the ground working hard to help those that are hurting and struggling. But we do this in the name of Jesus Christ. And we Here comes you. the man himself that wrote the big check. Rick, yeah. come on in. We raised a lot of money for Samaritan's Purse with the NASCAR group. And George was good enough to put this car up. And we met this family from Ukraine. And when you see the children and the suffering there, we just... We all need to pitch in, so I'm, I'm honored to help Samaritan's Purse because they are, they're the best, and they've got an underground hospital, and and that's just hurt for those folks. So we're praying for you guys, and uh, hopefully this will help feed some people and and bring some people out of there. So. And Mrs. Pylock, this is obviously particularly Thank personal you, for you. This must be very that meaningful was, moment. That was huge. Yeah, excellent. yeah. It, I'm just, I'm you know, speechless. The amount of money they raised is just unbelievable. And of course, it's going to be a lot of help. Yeah, everything that we can do to help. And um, you're making us all emotional. This is unbelievable. And Craig, for you, quite an emotional moment. Oh, it was. You know, Steve and I, after seeing the interview, both talk backstage. We go, we got to kick in 100 each. It's the least we can do. Plus trying to help. Hopefully, a lot of people at home donated also. That'll help a lot too. So, and we don't even know what the rest of our bidders did. So, hopefully, we can hit a couple million dollars out of this. Well, we know in the room there was 1.65 million dollars, and it could be up to two million dollars. Thank you to the generosity, the Pilot family, the Shins, and Mr. Hendrick, of yep. course. And I think now we will take it up to the block. We're still catching our breath here at Barrett Jackson after all the money that was raised just a short time ago to help refugees from Ukraine. Now they're back to just selling cars, but boy, what a group of cars we have here at Barrett Jackson. We've got the John Stalupi collection, we've got the George Shin collection, the American Muscle Car Museum collection, and then just a lot of cars that consigners from all over the country have brought here, like this one, a 2007 Bentley Continental GTC convertible. That's right, as Tyler Hoover mentioned earlier, when you add C to GT, you remove the roof and you get yourself the convertible. Again, like the GT, you've got that W12 six liter engine, twin turboed, over 500 horsepower, all wheel drive, and just a luxury grand touring, top down. That power cloth convertible top is made by Carmen. Yes, the same company that made the bodies for the Volkswagen Carmen Ghia, great engineering firm. 
and beautiful car here with only 23,000 miles. This is just barely broken in. You know, the Bentley racing history was so great. And back in the late 20s, they won five Le Mans. It was great to see performance be an important part as they move forward, going back to Le Mans. And of course, the beautiful design with this, together with the performance, what a perfect combination. One hundred thousand dollars for a 2007 Bentley Continental. Want something a little lower? Something a little meaner? From 2006, a Dodge Viper SRT10. A second generation Viper, which launched for 2003. Here we see it in its uh, what, third model year. Six lug wheels on Viper, six speed manual transmission, two, no automatics with Vipers, which may or may not have heard its image and sales. Great powerful V10 and what a platform these things would fly. This reminds me, a question we had yesterday about the Chevy GMC Suburban. Was a model name ever shared between two different brand names? Well, they told me on Twitter, of course. How about the Dodge and Plymouth Neon? Sure. And it's remember, too, of course, that the term Suburban was used on Plymouth station wagons in the 50s. You know, with that said, uh, Dodge was actually considering a mid-engined successor to the first generation Viper. Bob Lutz said nope. And this is the result of the second generation front engine Viper. That's interesting to think between the Fiero and the current Corvette, there were no mid-engine American cars. The Fiero was the last one. This could have been that car. If you want to read about the Viper's gestation, a new book by David Zatz called Dodge Viper, the full story by Velose Books. I picked up a copy. It's fascinating. It kind of takes behind the scenes of how Viper came to be. Less than 6,000 miles on this one. 500 horsepower coming out of V10. I'm not sure how you have this for so long and only put 6,000 miles with all that horsepower. Well, note that these have held their value better than a similar era Corvette for several reasons. One, far fewer were made. Two, more power, more wheel spin, more fun. This was a pretty hairy chested sports car. $75,000 for a 2006 Dodge Viper. Let's check in with April Rose. Well, right now I'm standing next to the latest technology, the most cutting edge technology. Check this baby out. 2022 Stingray Convertible IMSA GTLM Championship Edition. Just take a look at her. They only built a thousand of these. This is number 183. Now there's two versions. This new color of hypersonic gray with that strike yellow accent and the inverse of this. Now they look just like the race cars. Same stripes though the yellow does look a bit brighter on these. Now it's based on the 3LT trim Z51 performance packages. It's got the 6.2 liter 8 speed automatic really cool C8 logo on the top there. Just stunning carbon fiber carbon flash accents all around and the largest splitter available. Man they did not cut any corners and check the detailing on these super sleek Trident black wheels down here. Z51 yellow calipers, racing Jake Loco in the center, man. This is where it's at, Debrule. Yeah, there's nothing not to love about that new Corvette, to be honest with you. And the IMSA version, yeah, it's even more special. Look forward to that when it's up on the block. All right, now a little more old school in design, a 1965 Cobra recreation. Well, the hood is closed, but it's good to see this one has a 427 Ford FE big block, not the more traditional or, or typical, a modern uh, 302 or something like that. But again, aluminum heads on that 427 FE and uh, nice big block power. While this is a fiberglass bodied replica, it is pretty faithful to the original AC Cobra. AC here uh, on the wheel, uh, the gauges. Oh, there's a look. Uh, Steve wanted to show you that Cobra 427, and there it is, set well back of the front wheels, kind of a front mid-engine car, if you will. Well, there it goes, $48,000. Has less than 4,000 miles on the odometer. It's got all those four-wheel disc brakes, Jaguar independent rear suspension. Congratulations to those folks right there. A little while ago, we previewed this Bronco, a 1967 Bronco Custom. We've seen ever since Scottsdale, these things going through the roof in terms of pricing. So I won't be surprised where this one ends up. 
Now, if you see that this does not have doors, but rather these cut-down inserts, don't be confused. That is something that was part of the U13 Bronco Roadster available for the first few years of production. This one has a VAN that reads U15. So this was a station wagon. And yes, you can get reproductions of these now. These are fiberglass. But again, these don't open. This was Bronco's effort to be as cheap as possible and to take on the cheap Jeep CJ5, which had a similar shape on the sides. Note that the wipers are at the top of the windshield. Why? Because the bottom of the windshield has a piano hinge so that that whole windshield can be forward flat, uh, folded forward flat if you wanted to enjoy driving al fresco. Now, Grabber Green was not a Ford color back when this was built new, but no harm, no foul. Looks good here. Now, this one is a V8 with a 302 and a three-speed manual, which may seem a bit retro. Well, check this out. All the way through 1977, the Bronco came with either an automatic or the three-speed manual. Never got a four-speed. Kind of weird, but uh, there it is, the three-speed stick. This one has not been cut, as they say. The rear wheel arches are still semi-skirted, and uh, that's the way they were born. And the only way to get big, fat tires under there is to lift the suspension, which has been done here. Now these Broncos are just like pallets. What do you want to do with them? You know, you want to take the top off, leave the top on. You want to raise it up. You want to lower it. Whatever you want to do, there's buyers for them. Yeah, as a matter of fact, you can get reproduction Bronco body tubs from companies like Real Deal Steel, Dynacorn, etc. So if you have a rusty one, just get a new body. Why mess around with Bondo and welding? It's just been amazing how, you know, the Broncos were starting to come on. That combination of the new Bronco and the old Bronco just seems to create this incredible market. Meanwhile, Craig Jackson, Steve Davis, and the governor are taking a victory lap after a great charity presentation. And hopefully soon we'll have an idea of the total amount of funds raised for Ukraine relief. Well, the total amount for this 1967 Bronco Custom $83,000. A little while ago, April Rose, together with a nodding off Tyler Hoover, reviewed a big, huge limousine. It's a 2006 Maybach 62. Oh, yeah, and let me tell you how nice that nap was. It's very refreshing in the back of this long wheelbase Mercedes limousine. Five and a half liter V12 in these. Now, they were very, very expensive. And the big problem with the Maybach in this generation, because they didn't sell very well, was they looked too much like a Mercedes S-Class. But the moment you step inside, the quality was up 100 times over an S-Class, which is already a very nice car to justify the price. Understand these cost something like $460,000 new. What did you pay for yours, Tyler? Oh, so I have a 57, the short wheelbase. It was wrecked. It had 130,000 miles on it. I bought it for 20 grand at a salvage auction and put it back together. This was Mercedes' attempt to go after the Rolls-Royce extended wheelbase limousine market. And uh, these cars, they put a ton of money into the development of and the build of these cars, but they just never found a sustainable market. This one is a 2006 built right in the middle of the production cycle, 2000 through 2012. About 3,000 were built, and the word is they were never profitable, despite that half-million-dollar price tag. Yeah, if you're scared of flying, but you want a first-class experience as far as the, you know, the best of what you can get in the airlines, this Maybach is it, and then some. So nice. Well, wasn't the old story that uh, journalists who were doing the press preview were told they weren't allowed to drive the car because owners weren't going to drive them. They were going to be sitting in the back. $61,000, oh, just a shade of the original price for this 2006 Maybach 62 limousine. Caspian black, black exclusive leather. So many fun things. There's always something interesting crossing the block here at Barrett Jackson.
Gotta love Palm Beach. Absolutely beautiful. The water, the homes, very special out here. And it's a great place to hold a Barrett Jackson collector car auction. Coming here for nearly 20 years, enjoying it all. We missed the last three, so it's great to be back. And moments ago, check this out, a 2006 Rolls-Royce Phantom. Just one owner, 453 horsepower, less than 4,000 miles on the odometer, and it sold for $190,000. A perfect Palm Beach car. Up in the block right now, we got a 1970 Chevelle SS. This is a matching numbers car, not a clone, not a tribute. It's got paperwork, does have the ZL2 cowl induction hood as seen here with the two flaps inside. This one operated by vacuum from the carburetor, secondary one with a micro switch uh, electrically driven by the uh, gas pedal. Now this is a bench seat car with a four speed, kind of unusual, but a numbers matching example, real deal. Original owner's manual and protecto plate included. That's something they gave you when you bought a new Chevrolet in case you needed warranty service. Uh, that would help the service department figure out who gets to be rebuilt and where that car came from. $90,000, I got news for you. It doesn't even come close to cracking our top 10. That would take at least $117,000. Now, don't forget, this is just Friday at the auction. This isn't Saturday. Tomorrow's Super Saturday, the big day. So imagine where the prices are going to go tomorrow, if that's what we're seeing today. All right. You see no car on the block, no truck on the block right now. Well, that's because the next one they're going to sell is so big, they can't bring it in the normal way. They're bringing it in the exit, I think. It's a 2018 Ram 2500 custom pickup truck. There you see it coming in the exit. Big beast. Well, this truck. one uh, with a big, huge uh, lift. My goodness, no wonder it doesn't go up on the block. One great thing about these 2500s is they have the same coil spring rear suspension as the Ram 1500, which makes them the best riding of the full size pickups available today. This one is a 2018, the final year for the fourth generation of the Ram. And of course, the first use of the Ram was 1981 when Dodge described their pickup trucks as Ram tough. Well, the Dodge part went away and Ram took over. Now these are just Ram trucks. A lot of us still call them Dodges, but they're Rams to Chrysler Corporation. Big lift, big wheels and tires, additional shocks on the on the steering. Uh, so this thing has really been built up to go off road or perhaps I don't know you know monster truck jumping or whatever you'd like. OK I love this. They've got a vehicle history report and what it says is back in 2020 there was an accident reported vehicle involved in a rear end collision with another motor vehicle vehicle was not damaged. In other words <laughs> this hit something and it wasn't damaged. D does it say if the other vehicle was totaled or only not? knows but I mean just look at this it's a beast I have no doubt whatever it hit did not fare as well. Yeah, it was right around 1992 that Dodge kind of introduced this big rig styling, and it was uh, controversial at first, and then spread like wildfire, leading to things like the Super Duty Ford and the Heavy Duty GMCs. But uh, Dodge really has become a trendsetter, or excuse me, Ram has become a trendsetter in styling in the last 20 years. Yeah, very successful, and the new Rams have an interior design that other companies are still trying to catch up with. Cummins Diesel under the hood of this one. Well, definitely not a bad deal per pound. Forty-five thousand dollars for that 2018 Ram 2500 pickup truck with less than 50,000 miles. No shortage of pickup trucks here at Barrett Jackson. In this case, we got a 2020 Jeep Gladiator. Yeah, at this point in time, the biggest, baddest engine was a 3.6 liter Pentastar, which is 306 horse. Nothing wrong with that. And again, this is a soft top. These are available as hard top or soft top. This does retract for uh, fun in the sun. But this one's been treated to uh, a hard top treatment in the back over the bed uh, with a retractable cover, kind of like a tonneau, but giving it the lines uh, of a Hummer, let's say. Uh, that bed, by the way, is full. There is a huge full-size spare wheel and tire in there and not room for much of anything else. 
Now this is a first year 2020 Gladiator and these are huge at 218 inches bumper to bumper stock. These are just about an inch or so uh, close to the Ford Econoline Supervan. I mean, these are massive vehicles. And I see, you know, soccer moms driving these things around in New England where I'm from, and it's kind of weird to see that. But these are wonderful. I mean, they combine the, the suitability of an SUV inside and the full-size cargo bed. Good stuff. Here's the thing, if you think this is the first convertible pickup truck, think again, way back in 1989, Dodge Dakota was available with a convertible roof. So uh, this is the second time around. <laughs> The doors are removable, and again, just everything here is about function. Yeah, less than 4,700 miles on the odometer, so it's essentially a brand new truck. And right now, we're at $62,000, considering all the work that's been done. Four thousand six hundred twenty-two actual miles. It's got all the bells and whistles. Here's an opportunity. Don't let it roll out the door without taking one more look. No reserve. It's going to sell. Consigner shipped it a long way. Great consigner. Buy it with confidence. The only thing wrong with this car right now is the price, Joseph. Let's get some more. Yeah, I, I agree with Steve. I think we're in the you couldn't build it for that range, even though it is a two-year-old pickup. It's been subject to a lot of modifications, expensive uh, mods at that. Only 4,600 miles on the clock. Well, there goes sixty-three thousand dollars for a 2020 Jeep Gladiator, highly modified, less than four thousand miles on the odometer, five thousand miles, and away it goes here in Palm Beach. Ah, uh, there's a reason they call it Palm Beach. Plenty of palm trees around. All right, at every auction, we like to highlight one particular year. Take a look back at the cars from that year. And for this auction here in Palm Beach, it's 1957. Let's listen to Mike Joy. I was just seven years old in 1957, but I still have the Corvette brochure my dad brought home from the dealership after going to look at one of these. He had his handwritten notes on all the option prices, like the 270 horse dual quad 283, manual transmission, positive traction rear end. This one's a beauty, black, silver, coves, red interior. Would look great in our driveway, but dad couldn't explain to mom where the kids would go. So no Corvette for us. Wouldn't that have been fun? Well, and there is that 1957 Corvette that Mike's father did not buy, sitting out in the staging lanes. It'll be up on the block very, very soon. Meanwhile, up on the block, we got a 1947 Cadillac Series 61, a big beast of a custom four-door sedan. Well, here we have them right here, the very beginnings of the fin. The next year would be the kickup. But again, 1947, that chrome reflector housing was the beginning of the tail fin, which would explode in size. Now, this is a resto mod. It's got a Ramjet 350. But again, this is a torpedo back. So fastback starting was not new in the 60s. Here we have it in the late 40s. Look at that Cadillac crest. Antoine de Lamont de Cadillac was a self named French nobleman. He came to America, told everybody he was royalty, and that was his coat of arms, and he founded the city of Detroit. So that coat of arms persists on the Cadillac as this one hammers sold. At $75,000, looks like it's going to John Stalupi up in the skybox right there. All right, for something big and huge in 1947, we're going to move forward about eight years and a little more, well, it was common in its day, although it's pretty cool up on the block right now, a 1955 Chevy Bel Air Custom. Here it is, the beginning of Chevrolet's sort of renaissance into a uh, youthful, high-performance brand. Uh, this one is a Bel Air. It currently has an LS engine under the hood. Uh, this one was born a V, not a, no, not a V8 car, it has a C. So this would have been a six-cylinder car. So not everybody got the memo that the V8 was the hot dog. Still get the Blue Flame 6, but again, it's been replaced here with an LS. Back in its day in 1955, this was just a high volume production car. Now the two-door hardtop, second most expensive body style to the two-door convertible. 
but the 55 Chevy was the best-selling car in America uh, back there. It dueled with Ford and perennially third-place Plymouth in the low-priced sales race. So these cars were everywhere. A lot of them found their way onto the short track ovals of America or were repurposed for drag racing or just collected, and then some of them were lucky enough to be restored like this one. You know, speaking of short, the roof on the Sport Coupe Bel Air is actually shorter than it would be on the two-door post. In fact, the B-pillar touches down ahead of the rear axle center line, which gives it a graceful look, but if you look at a 210 or a 150 post, it's actually a longer roof, and the B-pillar touches down just after the center line. So it's funny, sometimes you see a 55 Chevy two-door, you say, man, it looks kind of weird, kind of long. Well, that's because it's not a Sport Coupe. But here it is, the Bel Air, tight, small greenhouse, looks just right. $90,000 for a 1955 Chevrolet Bel Air. Congratulations to that gentleman right there. He'll sign the paperwork, pay an extra 10%, and he's off. We'll be back. Back here in Palm Beach, we've got a 2022 Jeep Wrangler Unlimited Custom currently bid at $110,000. This one is a Hemi-powered monster. This is a Demon Crate engine with 840 horsepower. And it's good to see that rather than just swapping in the big old Hemi, they actually upgraded from the Dana 44 to a Dana 80 rear axle. Dana 60 up front, so it is ready for the power. Also has an eight lug conversion with the hub, so this is ready for the power. Eight-speed Trackhawk automatic goes with this one of course the big wheels and tires i am a sucker for that hydro blue paint that is a factory color this is a fresh build test miles only a hundred of them yeah this is cool now it may or may not be emissions legal in all 50 states some states are more liberal than others but 840 horsepower <laughs> what a monster Monster, look at the bid, $160,000. I think that puts it into monster territory. Up front, they got a big 12,000 pound winch. So with all that horsepower, you'd be amazed what you can haul. Get those tree stumps out. The AMW 840 is a reference to the builder, America's most wanted Jeeps 840. Of course, the horsepower rating of the Demon Crate engine. They thought they had it. There's a bidder out there who's like, oh, I got it. Oh, no. At the last second, another 5000 bucks came in. And that's exactly what it sold for, $165,000 for that massive Hemi-powered 2022 Jeep Wrangler Unlimited. Massive horsepower, truly a monster in every way. And with that, well, our top five just changed because guess what? That's now the number five sale of the day. We got through two charity vehicles, actually three vehicles total in the top two. And then, of course, that $190,000 for a Rolls Royce Phantom. So quite an eclectic collection of cars in our top five. Let's check in with Tyler Hoover. Well, if there is a blue chip collectible in the Impact Porsche 911 world, Impact Bumper, this would be it. It's a 1984 Porsche 930 Turbo. Look down at the front bumper here. You see what I'm talking about with the Impact Bumpers, which were federally mandated. A little accordion right there so they could accomplish that. But this is a beautiful example of a 930 Turbo, the wide body with the guard's red paint. But there's some special touches inside. This was an interior to sample, so they picked a color they wanted. Sent it to Porsche, paid all the extra money to have that special tan and this one is showing less than 20,000 miles on the odometer has a full maintenance history as well but these are famous for what's in the back here a 3.3 liter flat six you have the whale tail to to showcase well basically cool this intercooler right here for the gigantic turbo so this wasn't really for efficiency like modern turbos this is for more power and when these things hit about 3,000 rpm a little late it is so, so hard when it comes onto the power. So much fun, and this is a beautiful example. All right, thanks, Tyler. Well, look what we have on the block right now. This is the Corvette that April previewed, and she knows how to pick them. Current bid, $177,000. Yeah, uh, here we have it, man. The eighth generation Corvette, mid-engine, all of them, 495 horsepower. That's the base engine. 
this is number 183 of 1,000 very special C8 Corvettes convertibles uh, celebrating Corvettes IMSA participation. 153 actual miles, hypersonic gray, strike yellow accents, uh, carbon flash arrow, C8R racing livery, car cover. Wow. Now this still has push rods. Let's keep in mind the Z06 with the 5.5. That's a dual overhead cam. No push rod engine. That's just around the corner. Hint, hint. We'll see one tomorrow on the block. But with that said, this is still old school push rods, but they work great. $200,000, the current bid for this Corvette. This is the biggest, baddest Corvette you can buy until the Z06 hits the streets. Congratulations to those folks. Wow, very special indeed on every level, and it just brought big, big money here at Barrett Jackson. IMSA edition, less than 200 miles on the odometer. Well, let's think about this. Back in 1959, the Corvette looked a lot different. No mid engine, front engine, pretty standard, and this is what you got. Well, this and it didn't look quite like this because this one has been highly modified. It has been widened almost four inches. Uh, the body has been stretched top to bottom. That is not a stock windshield, nothing like it. That's because this 59 body has been stretched to fit on a C4 mid 90s Corvette chassis and suspension. More than a resto mod, this is a full all out custom. Let's remember that 9,670 Corvettes were built in 59, so there's plenty to go around. I love the wide and wider wheels. I've said it before, but it just gives the car ready to pounce kind of a stance. I like it. The uh, tires on this are about three times as wide as a 59 would have been born with. This is just an incredible true custom, and at $115,000, hopefully the bidders appreciate just all the work and love that's gone into this. L60E, four-speed automatic transmission. This one here with push-button control. Very cool. Nice. Now note the dashboard. It is replicates what they had in 1959. Central speedometer, tachometer atop the steering column, accessory gauges to the side, and of course the uh, grab handle for the passenger. He's going to need it. $115,000 for that very special custom 1959 Corvette Roadster. Took five years to build it. Beautifully done. Great price. Although, once again, not enough to make it into our top 10. That would take at least $127,000. All right, from, let's see, that modern Corvette to that custom Corvette to a stock Corvette, a 1957 283, 270 horsepower. Well, now, this is the one I previewed earlier. This is not the exact car my dad went to see because the local Chevy dealer, Ardrey Chevrolet in Windsor, Connecticut, well, they didn't stock Corvettes. He had to go to Grody Chevrolet in West Hartford uh, to see one. At least that's what's stamped on that Corvette brochure. Boy, big power here, Steve. Indeed, yeah, this is pretty cool piece and sort of a counterpoint to the Corvette we just saw, that 59 full custom. This is essentially a bone stock resto, and that's fine with me. Uh, this is a manual transmission car. Let's keep in mind the two-speed power glide was your alternate, but most of these had the three-speed manual. The four-speed manual arrived late in the model year. Very few were actually installed at the factory. And if you're familiar with Ken Grody Ford in Southern California in Orange County, Grody Chevrolet was his father and grandfather's dealership. Keep it in the family. Closing in on $100,000 for this one. This one is a three-speed manual. You can see right there the plate reads one, two, three, reverse. So uh, indeed, that's factory correct. And again, the four-speed arrived very late in the production run. 6,300 Corvettes built that year. Note the hubcaps. It gave the appearance of a center lock wheel uh, with the knockoff there, but beneath that sits a regular five lug steel wheel. These are fiberglass. Uh, they won't rust, but they do have a steel frame, which can rust in the event you should be silly enough to drive one of these in the winter year after year. I live in Phoenix. I can drive it in the winter year after year. Lucky you. 
Well, people up in the Northeast in the 50s, as I was growing up, they didn't have second cars. You had one car per family usually, but we all had a winner beater. And that was a car that was just barely running and almost all the way rusted out. And when it failed, well, you parked it by the side of the road, you took the plates, and then you went and found another one. Well, let's say I live in Phoenix now. I grew up in Los Angeles. I have no idea what you're talking about, Mike. <laughs> Not bad for that beautiful black Corvette and away it goes behind it uh, we're going to get something sporty and European from Italy a 2004 Ferrari 360 Spider F1 yeah the 360 is what brought Ferrari into the modern era done were you with engine outs and major belt services except well you did do the belt service but it was behind the seat you didn't have to take the engine out but a beautiful styled car F1 paddle shift transmission Daytona seats very very nice something I see right here is the window sticker OK, 10 miles per gallon city gas guzzler, forty five hundred dollars <laughs> gas guzzler tax on this puppy. So, hey, you got to pay if you want to play second generation of the F1 paddle shift transmission. And a great thing about Ferraris is you can go to the dealer. They can hook up their computer and tell you how much clutch life is left in that transmission on a used one such as this. One thing I almost never see on these is the original rear grille. Usually a day two modification is to replace this with the challenge rear grille. Since it's a mid-engine Ferrari, it has little holes to where it vents out into the outside. It also breaks up all the yellow. Surprising to see one with it still having its original rear grille. Now the metal cloisonné shields on the front fenders. In 2004, you gave Ferrari $1,200 for the pair of these. If you want them on your new Ferrari, be prepared to pony up about $2,000. Well, that squeaks into our top 10. In fact, that is the number 10 sale of the day at $130,000. She is one happy buyer. $130,000 for that Ferrari 360. A little while ago, this is a car that Tyler Hoover was previewing for us, a 1984 Porsche 930 Turbo. Oh, wonderful cars. These are. I had the M491 Turbo look version. Had I had any idea uh, how rare a car that was when George Fulmer, noted racer and uh, Porsche dealer, suggested I buy one, I would have kept it. Uh, but here it is, the full-blown turbo version, and it comes with a three-inch thick binder of receipts Steve Davis is holding up and showing to the crowd. And you want to sell a Porsche or a Ferrari, you need that provenance to get top dollar. Yeah, my dad actually had one of these when I was a kid. He sold it right before I reached driving range because he was very smart. But every time I see one, I just think, oh, man, I, it just takes me back. <laughs> Now, note, note the gauges. There are five of them. The central gauge is always the tachometer, the speedometer to the right. If you buy a brand new 2022 Porsche like the one I looked at at Penske in West Broward the other day, it has these same five gauges, and the ignition key is still located right here to the left of the steering wheel. So if you're jumping in the car for a Le Mans start, it's easier to get to than if it was on the right. That persists. I love it. The M491 Turbo Look car may look like this, but the VIN doesn't lie. You go to the sixth and seventh spots. If you see a 9.1, it's a 9.11. 9.3 is the 9.30. That's what we got here. 9.30, of course, brings that turbocharged three liter. Wheel flares on this are steel. All too often, we'll see folks add wide body kits to 911s and do it in fiberglass. But this is steel right from the factory. A friend of mine calls these, if you're an owner and enthusiast, a boost junkie because of the way they hit. I was hitting at this earlier, but it comes on late. It's turbo lagged, but when it hits, it is unbelievable. So much fun. They didn't call them widow makers, though, because they could get you in trouble, especially with that engine hanging out the back. You'd go backwards into whatever you did if you got the rear tires loose. Note the exhaust. It is a cast twin pipe, and that is unique to the turbo. Uh, if this was a turbo look, it would be a regular exhaust pipe uh, looking thing. Wow, we're over 200,000, 25, 210. And we got a fight going on here right on stage for this one. Well, plus we've got an internet bidder as well, Mike. So we got three committed bidders going after this. 
and it just sold over the internet for $210,000 for that 1984 Porsche, Porsche 930 Turbo. And that reminds me of an auction moment that happened just a few months ago. Remember at Scottsdale, the top retail sale was a Porsche Carrera GT. Let's take a look back. The 2004 Porsche Carrera GT is up on the block. Well, we just shot to a million dollars. Yes, these have been exploding in value recently, and I sure wish I bought one a few years ago. They have doubled or tripled in price. This is one of the most rapidly appreciating exotics out there right now. $1.8 million for a 2004 Porsche Carrera GT, the number one sale of the day. Wow, serious money for that car back then. Who knows what the number one retail sale will be before we finish here at Barrett Jackson in Palm Beach. Got a couple of special Ford GTs that will be crossing the block tomorrow. Big money on the block right now for a 2022 Cadillac CT5 V Blackwing. Beautiful car, ruby red metallic. It has the diamond stitch seats in gray, trimmed in black, 6.2 liters. And this one is very rare because look in the center of that console. Yeah, that's a shifter. This is a three pedal car, six speed manual transmission. Very rare, very powerful. The last one, last of its breed right here. Who says that the uh, stick shifted V8 muscle car is dead? And I got to say, the Tesla Plaid may run a little harder than this, like maybe a lot, but once you've giggled yourself into dead battery mode and you're inching along in golf cart mode, this thing is still burning rubber going right around you. I love these things. Almost a brand new car, 645 actual miles on the clock. Michelin Pilot Sport tires, old aluminum wheels uh, in that dull gold orum finish. Um, this is a beauty and this is fast. Yeah, it's been 11 years since Cadillac launched the V series and every single one of them since then has been push rod equipped. Who says push rods don't work? $122,000 is what it works for today. 2022 Cadillac CT5 D Blackwing Boy. Beautiful car, beautiful price. And away it goes to a new owner. And we still have plenty of cars left to cross the block here in Palm Beach, so do not go away. Well, the staging lanes have plenty of great cars yet to cross the block. Boy, I love that uh, little Shelby GT that's going across right there. Got a big beast of a Jeep behind it over there. Hot rods, Corvettes, whatever you like, it's coming here to Barrett Jackson and Palm Beach. And there's no shortage of great custom Broncos this year. This is a 1972 custom Bronco. Yeah, this one is a U15 VIN, another station wagon. Yes, this fiberglass top is permanently affixed unless you've got about an hour and a bunch of tools not meant to come off. This one is cut. The rear wheel openings have been large for the bigger wheels and tires. Well, away it goes at $80,000 for a 72 Ford Bronco. And once again, it, there's just about every flavor of Bronco custom that you could have out there right now. Well, up behind it, we've got a 1965 Chevy C10 Custom. Yeah, nice example of uh, the short bed, Apache body style. This one here under the hood is a six liter LS with a Holly fuel injection system, big wheels and tires, much lower than stock, but uh, the custom cab includes this uh, die cast trim on the B pillar, sort of a faux bent look, kind of like louvers, but really a beautiful truck. And inside the bed, my gosh, look at that beautiful, I guess that's broad grain wood. Very nice. Yeah, that is pretty cool. Very neat the way, <laughs> I love the way you've reached in. You have to feel it to kind of understand it. It's awesome. It's such a great design for these trucks. You know, this was the first generation of the C and K line. This 
design came out in 1960, went through 66, so the second to the last year of this styling package. But boy, look at the way it's been done with disc brakes front and rear. I like that creamsicle look with the orange and then the white on the, in the insets. And it looks like underneath the chassis looks really clean as well. There's really nothing you can't not like about this thing. Boy, $95,000 the current bed. And again, being a custom cab, it has the full width rear window versus the about one quarter the size standard rear window glass. Big 20 inch tires, $100,000. That's the bid right now, and that's what it sold for here at Barrett Jackson in Palm Beach for that great 1965 C10 custom pickup truck. Well, if you'd like to try and sharpen your bidding skills and maybe snag a great prize in the process, you're going to want to play our fantasy bid brought to you by Dodge. And right now, April is going to preview one of the cars that you'll be predicting the price on. A lot of beautiful trucks here, but this one going across on Super Saturday is definitely a work of art. Now, it's another Chevy C10 Custom, but this one's a 1960 beautiful powder blue. It's got a finely tuned 6.2 liter supercharged LSA, six-speed automatic, custom exhaust, strengthened frame to handle all that extra power, custom coilovers and A-arms with rack and pinion steering. Now, take a look inside. It's got the coolest custom retro hybrid gauges that just light up electric blue retro sound vintage air i mean she is one powerful beast detroit steel wheels willwood brakes i mean this is what super saturday is all about debril absolutely look forward to that thanks april that 60 chevy pickup truck is going to be crossing the block tomorrow on saturday so go to barrett jackson fantasy bid.com or We'll show you a QR code, and you can scan that to register to play. And who knows? You could walk away with a 2022 Dodge Challenger if you're one of the big winners for the year. There's the QR code. and we'd get up eventually. Just scan that. You can go right in and register to play the game. And remember, we haven't been playing it yesterday and today. It's only a single day of playing, and that is tomorrow. For the block right now, we got a 1970 Chevelle SS LS3 Custom. Indeed, the LS3 is a reference to the third generation aluminum V8 under the hood. The hood is closed, but uh, don't let that cowl induction hood fool you. It's all modern fuel injection under the hood. $105,000. Boy, a few hours ago, $105,000 seemed like a lot of money, but then we had cars that well, we had that Porsche that sold for $210,000, a Corvette for $200, a Rolls Royce for $190. Man, big money here on Friday at Barrett Jackson Palm Beach. Can't wait to see what happens tomorrow. 1966 Ford Fairlane GT Custom up on the block. This is the year that the Fairlane kind of grew up from its uh, oh, Falcon-based uh, origins to a much wider engine bay, which could finally accept the FE Series big block. This is a 420 cubic inch version of the 390 with a stroker crank aluminum trick flow cylinder heads backed up by a TKO 5 speed. And it's a real S code 390 big block car from day one. That's yeah, amazing what they've done to this. They've really upgraded big disc in the front, slightly smaller in the back. Boy, just everything you want. It's got both go power and stopping power at the same thing. Because, you know, in Austin, back in the, the classic muscle car day, just because they put great horsepower under the hood didn't mean they added stopping power at the same time. So that's what I love with the resto mods that we've got today, the ability to, you know, use that serious horsepower under the hood as well as stop it once you get moving. Yeah, 66 again, first year for the big block Fairlane, excluding the 427 Thunderbolt of 1964. But again, there were a total of 37,342 buyers for 390 powered Fairlanes as the muscle car wars really heated up. This is the kind of car right here that would have taken on the Chevelle SS 396, um, the Plymouth Satellite 383, uh, and cars like that. Well, and I love that they really gone to every detail even to the point that they've stripped off all the bright work re-anodized everything so it's just got a fresh brand new look to it 
the GT, when applied to a fair lane, meant muscle. And with if this was an automatic equipped car, it would be a GTA, and that would be in the C6 automatic behind the 390. Nine inch rear axle, dual exhaust, and there's the Fairlane GT logo on the trunk lid. And just nice branding. Uh, just uh, really a, a great thing. And of course, the rectangular vertical tail lamps echoed the treatment used on Galaxy. $100,000 for that custom 66 Ford Fairlane GT. We've got quite a variety of cars here at Barrett Jackson Palm Beach. In fact, we, we really have a lot of extremes. So we've come up with a feature. We're calling it the Beauty and the Beast. It's been said each car has its own personality. And here at Barrett Jackson, there's a car with every personality from the beauty to the beast in the best possible way. Like this beast right here, it looks like it's about to devour you. Meet Apocalypse Hellfire, the 2022 Jeep Gladiator 6x6 custom pickup. It's got a 717 horsepower supercharged 6.2 Hemi SRT Hellcat, high performance 8 speed automatic, active suspension, driver selection of two or four wheel drive. Kevlar protected running boards, removable doors, roof, and this eight foot bed with a much needed matching roll down metal locking system for storage. I mean, no one's breaking in this puppy. Inside is just off the charts with this fancy marine grade diamond stitched distressed leather. And it's all finished off in this protective shell in a color called King Ranch. This right here is proof sometimes bigger does mean better. Well, April, this is a 1969 Pontiac GTO, the 242 VIN sequence, it's a real one. And yes, it's a verified judge in the registry. But here's the thing, the first 2000 GTO judges were carousel orange, not vintage burgundy like this, but that's correct. After the first 2000 judges were made, Pontiac opened the door to any color you wanted, including again, this vintage burgundy with a white vinyl top, just like grandma's Tempest. But it's a real GTO, it's a real judge, and it's a beauty. Well, there you have it. Barrett Jackson has beauties and beasts all weekend long. And there it is out in the, uh, about to enter the building here in Palm Beach. That very unique color, red underneath, white on top. Don't see many of those around. 1969 Pontiac GTO Ram Air 3. Up in the block right now, we've got a 56 Chevy Bel Air Custom. Uh, the Bel Air hardtop, of course, has the short greenhouse with the more compact side glass, a little nicer proportions than the 210 two-door post, which has a longer greenhouse, kind of the same greenhouse used on the four-door. But with that said, I love these things. Inside, pretty much custom. Got an LED screen in the center, 4L60 automatic transmission. Yeah, custom all the way, $86,000. That's the hammer price for a 1956 Chevrolet Bel Air Custom with 427 cubic inches. Over the years, Barrett Jackson has had some pretty special moments here in Palm Beach, but I can safely say that this year's Super Saturday is going to be better than ever. Why? Well, to start with, how about not one, but two latest generation Ford GTs? This one from 2020, a carbon series. The other, a 2018 Heritage Edition in the Dan Gurney AJ Foyt color. So how about Mercedes best GT offering today? Lot 683, a 2018 AMG GTS with a powerful V8 under the hood, rear mounted dual clutch transmission, Dizinho paint, and a rich, wonderfully smelling saddle interior. Oh, so good. Lot 722 is a real stunner. This 62 Corvette is a multi-award winner, and underneath this champagne mist metallic sits a 500 horsepower LS7 and overdrive automatic. The body looks stock, right? Anything but. It has been lengthened, stretched, pulled, and widened, all to fit over a mid-90s Corvette chassis and suspension. This Super Saturday, we have some amazing collections, including John Stalupi's Cars of Dreams collection, and this is one of them. A 1957 DeSoto Adventurer. It's one of 300 built that year. It's got a 345 Hemi, all decked out in factory gold and white accents. This is one beautiful ride. Old world charm and elegance get a full makeover with this 1957 Chevy Bel Air custom convertible. More power with an LS3 engine, more luxury with a full redo of the interior with Italian black leather. This is another extraordinary vehicle from the George Shin Collection crossing the block only here on Super Saturday.
Well, collections are a big part of this auction, and this is from the American Muscle Car Museum collection. It's a 1968 Yanko 427 Camaro. You know, Palm Beach is more than just palm trees. There's so much to do here, especially when Barrett Jackson comes to town. And I just want to know one thing. How is it that Christian Murphy buys all the fun? I believe you're the only female driver out here on the track. That's right. Yeah. How, do, how do you come to be here? Yeah, well, uh, our lead driver, Nick, I actually raced with him when we were nine years old. We raced together for about five years, and then, you know, we come up through the ranks, and he needed an extra driver, and he thought it would be really cool to have the only female out here ripping these cars. I love it. So. I believe your, your team is all female too, right? Yeah, my racing team is all female as well. I cannot tell you how excited I am for this. Nice Sunday drive! Oh my goodness! Far out, Jess! Oh, wow. Uh-oh. Oh! Oh! oh. oh. Whoa, we just had to end. Whoa, oh, whoa. Okay, we're good. <laughs> we are good. Excellent. Wow. <laughs> yes, that was unbelievable. GR Supra, best thrill ride ever. I might need a bucket. Well, maybe it's possible to have too much fun. Get that man a bucket. Ninety-seven thousand dollars for that 1976 Ford Bronco Custom that just crossed the block. Finished two-stage Ford Atomic Orange and Pearl with that black removable top. Away it goes. From 1969, we've got a Camaro Z28 in frost green. This is very special. Jerry McNish is the boss on these things. He's speaking right now. In the country. This is a matching numbers 302 engine. All the componentry in the car is original to the car. It has a fold down seat. It's finished in frost green paint. You're not going to find a nicer Z28. Now, as good as this car is under the hood with its ZL2 cowl induction, you know, the numbers matching 302, four bolt main engine. This is also a a67 fold down rear seat car crazy but true the back seat on this folds down flat and if you look through the window there's a gap right there at the speaker panel that's not poor fitment but that's rather where the 42 dollars and 15 cents were spent to turn this into a more utilitarian vehicle but that's a pretty rare piece only 4397 of 243,000 camaros got that rare in a camaro let alone a z28 now, this is a very nicely restored example, but they started with so many original components, the numbers matching engine, rear end, and a lot of bits in the interior. The floor pans are original, not rusted, and it even has the original rosewood steering wheel in it, which is a very nice touch. And under the back, we see the chambered exhaust system, which, unlike a reverse flow canister-style muffler, is basically a straight through. The dimples somewhat attenuate the offensive exhaust note. Those are made by Walker, which is a generic, well, manufacturer of exhaust systems, a supplier to Detroit. But again, nice to see that. It's reproduction stuff, but it's uh, illegal in most states, but it sounds great. You know, more than 20,000 people paid the 450 plus to buy these, but today, how many are left in such original condition? Boy, only a handful. $92,000. Those folks right there, they get to take it home and own all that originality. Don't forget, Barrett-Jackson.com is the place you can go to get all the information on the cars that are crossing the block. It's also great for the upcoming auctions as well. You can learn more about the next auction, which in this case is going to be in Las Vegas in June. So, Barrett-Jackson.com. A little while ago, we previewed a couple of cool cars, the Beauty and the Beast. We'll meet the Beauty, the 1969 Pontiac GTO Judge Ram Air 3. My friends at High Octane Classics and Auburn Mass brought this car here, and something this car has is the hideaway headlights, which we can see right here. Now, the, here's the thing. There's vacuum motors that run those things, so these are grills here that hide the, well, the ugly diaphragms on an exposed headlight GTO. That's why it opens. So that's a unique item seen only on these, but again, this is a weird car. It's Cranberry Poly with a white vinyl top, and it's a judge. Now, the first 2,000 judges were indeed carousel red or hugger orange, but after the first 2,000 cars are built well you can get any color you wanted including this on your judge well instead of here comes the judge it might be here comes ron burgundy 
Like that, I work with that. <laughs> of course, the judge came standard with this trunk spoiler. The only bummer about this was that if you closed the trunk and you weren't thinking, you could pinch your fingers pretty good right there. So for 1970, it became a T-wing, floating wing, but right there, that's factory stuff. Watch those fingers. And I see the hood-mounted tachometer, which is a signature of the judge. Even though it looks like they had plenty of room to mount a tack in there, it looks like they just made it blank or substituted with a clock or something. Yeah, it's funny, those hood-mounted tacks were installed on the assembly line and uh, often uninstalled at midnight by <laughs> midnight auto supply. But uh, yeah, they work. The only downside is they're tended, they tend to get wet once in a while, but it's cool. $92,000 for a 1969 Pontiac GTO Judge Ram Air 3 in Burgundy with a white vinyl top. Very rare. All right, let's take a look at our top sellers of the day. And number three, the top retail sale today was a 1984 Porsche 930 Turbo. Beautifully done, nicely restored, hammered sold at $210,000. The number two sale of the day, well, it was a 2012 Jeep Wrangler Unlimited. And when it was hammered, sold for uh, canned aid to help kids around the country, it sold for $250,000. It was actually sold a second time. The tow time together made two fifty. dollars And finally, this was the big sale today. To benefit Samaritan's Purse, helping refugees from Ukraine, a 2009 Ford Shelby GT500 Super Snake, and a 1998 Indy Pace Car, Together with the sales and all the money raised, $1.65 million. Back here at Barrett Jackson in Palm Beach, we're getting towards the end of our coverage. We've been on the air for almost seven hours, and guess what? They still have plenty of cars left across the block, like this one, a 1961 Chevy Bel Air bubble top. Well, they call it a bubble top because it has very slender A and B pillars, and these are only made for just a few years. Uh, but this is a 115 VIN car, which means it was born with a six-cylinder engine. <laughs> it was a 118, it'd be a V8 car, but that was then. It now has an LS V8 under the hood, LS3 with four L70 automatic transmission. Just a tasteful, creamsicle kind of a paint scheme here. And the seller describes this as a Boyd Coddington inspired build, which I guess he built several cars like this. And back in the day, I actually had an opportunity to meet him. He's been gone for about 15 years, and it was right here at a Barrett Jackson when I was a kid. This was the day before selfies, so I got his autograph. He was selling some extreme version of a 57 Chevy with the fins that seemed to go up above your head. Boydster. Boydster, yes, absolutely, yes. Zoom, anyway. One thing about this is Dave Kindig is the fellow behind these door handles, these puppies right here. He patented this. If you push in on this, and Gabe, Kindig Design right there, you open those up, and that's a cool little detail. You can buy those from Kindig Design. Beautiful matching orange dashboard with the digital gauges, but they still put a little wood in there. Nice, classy touch with the wood steering wheel. Beautiful interior. I like the fact they put a backup camera on this because, you know, this is a pretty valuable car. You don't want to accidentally do any damage while you're backing up. $80,000 for that 61 custom Bel Air bubble top. Now, before the cars sell every day here at Barrett Jackson, they sell the automobilia. Check out some of the cool stuff that sold this morning, like this 1999 Dale Earnhardt Kitty Ride sold for $13,000. And it works. Another one that worked, another Kitty Ride, this 1950s Porsche sold for $30,000. Pardon me, a Corvette. It's in red, beautiful 1950s. Ah, but check this out. A neon Porsche sign. Before it was over, it sold for $45,000. It's amazing the money that they get for these things. And by the way, if you want to watch the automobile you sell, just go to barrett-jackson.com and you can watch the live stream before the cars go on the air every morning. Up on the block now, we got a 67 Camaro Indy Pace Car Convertible. Beyond the Pace Car Convertible part, this is a 396, a big block Camaro with a, a three-speed turbo 400 automatic. Big block Camaro Convertible right here for the first time. Muscle car royalty. Now, it says they built 104 of these Pace Cars. Were all of them big blocks? No, you can get the small block as well, but something about this is that this has a blacked out rear taillight panel, which was seen only on the 396 cars. Now, this also, if you look under the rear axle on the right hand side, you see a little square thing 
hang down next to the muffler. That's the passenger side only traction bar to the right of the muffler. That little bar right there, that's specific to big block cars. Yeah, it was the only year they had this suspension as well, where they had the the shock absorbers in the back, the way they're situated. The next year they staggered it because of the, you know, axle hop problem they were having in 67. Got a little better in 68. This is also a mono leaf car, single leafs, indeed, indeed, which is why that traction bar was needed. And who won the 1967 Indy 500? A.J. Foyt. And to connect him to another car, he went on just a couple weeks later to win the 24 Hours of Le Mans. And we have a Heritage Edition A.J. Foyt car, Ford GT, coming across the block tomorrow. So we got a little bit of A.J. Foyt today, a little bit of A.J. Foyt tomorrow. $73,000 for that Indy pace car from 1967. All right, let's check in with Christian Murphy. Thank you very much, Rick. We're all down here with the head honchos of Barrett Jackson after a, a very emotional day, a wonderful day. Craig Jackson, Chairman and CEO, what did today mean to you? Well, I think we knew that that was going to be a moment. Who knew how much the cars were going to bring? But it, uh, what really touched me, and it got Steve and I, after hearing the interview outside and watching the news this morning, Morning of the train station getting the missile into it it just tugs at your heart and the spontaneity that everybody else in the room our great customers all throwing a hundred grand in each the room the emotions in here it's it's real it's genuine and what I said you know freedom isn't free and everybody has to fight for it these people are fighting for it and we got to take care of their families that are leaving while the men stay there and fight for freedom. Steve, I think in last tally, I counted up about $1.65 million, but I know more donations were coming in. Where did we get to? Because it was such a remarkable moment. Well, I think, again, that the, the final tally, we really won't know for a while, because, again, keep in mind, we had that website, and there was a lot of uh, uh, things going on that we haven't even figured out ourselves yet. But, but what a moment, and, and to Greg's point, you know, the, the platform that we've created at Barrett Jackson, and that incredible American flag that drapes the, the stage there. It's inspirational to so many people. It surely is inspirational to me, and I know to Barry Jackson, but, but this really reflects why it's so important for us to fight for the freedoms of other people that aren't willing or able, excuse me, not able. They're, they're more than willing to fight, but they're in a position that they're trying to survive. And again, you wake up in the morning, you see those terrible images, you, you, you look up at lunchtime, you see those, those poor people are living that, and they can't escape it. We can help them get better, we can help do what we do with the power and the absolute awareness that we created. And the number is great, Murph, the dollar amount, but think about the awareness that we created throughout our viewing audience and, and online and, and all the places that we're touching. But a great moment, an honor to share it with George Shin, Mark Pylock, their families, and, and Rick Hendrick doing what he did. And, and being on FYI to share it with the world was phenomenal. You guys putting the donation up there. We don't know what the total one in the room was 1.65, but we're hoping it brings over 2 million with all the other donations. It was an absolutely amazing moment, a wonderful moment, and we're thrilled to be a part of it. It's going to be hard to top tomorrow, but it is Super Saturday, and we look forward to that, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, definitely some very special moments today here at Barrett Jackson. Up on the block right now, we got a 1972 Chevrolet K10 custom pickup truck. Well, of course, K is four-wheel drive, but the 350, the turbo 350, nice. Yeah, very, very nice. It was treated to a two-year frame-off nut and bolt restoration. A uh, few little upgrades for the 350, but mostly a pretty faithful restoration. Obviously, a little bit of a lift, but, you know, a mild custom, I would say. One of the great things about these uh, Chevy pickups is that virtually every steel panel you might need, you can get brand new reproduction from companies like Golden Star Classic Parts and others, and they're 100% blueprint corrected, bolt right on. And again, the bed on this, the floor is undoubtedly a reproduction part. There's not a single dent in it. So again, it's beautiful. You can build one of these pretty much from scratch with new parts. This does have later wheels. Again, these are the six lug wheels found on late 70s Blazers and uh, four-wheel drive pickup trucks. No harm done. 
Boy, this thing is just too nice to probably use as a truck or to use off-road. It is just very much a show vehicle. Of course, back in the day, this was something somebody used to work, which is why all those reproduction parts are totally necessary to build these. But you can see, build one, you might get a return here. Pretty good price. Actually, there's an outfit called Brothers that makes a kit to shorten a long wheelbase pickup truck into a short wheelbase pickup truck. It's a frame patch, and then you buy a short bed, and then you got it. But the VIN doesn't lie. There will be a code in there for the GBW rating. With that said, no harm. The vehicle doesn't know the difference if it's been sliced and shortened, but this is a real short bed. The 73 would bring an entirely new body, the square body as we call it. That went all the way up until 1988 or 86 or 87, I should say, 87. And uh, a long-lived platform, both of these actually. Yeah, I love that Ferrari blue Roma paint, the two-stage look on it. Really nicely done. Imagine the paint job on this truck exceeded its original MSRP by several, several times. It is perfect. Well, I tell you what, the price of paint, custom paint, has really jumped up tremendously over the last year. So if you were going to paint something like this, you're going to spend several thousand dollars just on the paint alone. I mean, that's just for the supplies. It doesn't count the labor associated with it. $80,000 for that 1972 Chevy K10 custom pickup truck. Let's check out the top sellers of the day. The number one retail sale of the day was this Porsche 930 Turbo. Red, four-speed, hammered sold at $210,000. The number two sale of the day was raising money for an organization called Canned Aid. It was a 2012 Jeep Wrangler to help kids experience music, arts, and the outdoors. It was sold not once, but twice, and it raised $250,000. But the number one sale, well, it was two cars. This 2009 Shelby GT500 Super Snake, together with a 1998 Indy Pace car, together with all of the money that they raised so far that they know about, it's $1.65 million, all going to help Samaritan's Purse, which is helping refugees from Ukraine. Boy, what a Friday it's been here at Barrett Jackson in Palm Beach. Great cars crossing the block. Just to make the top 10 today would have taken at least $130,000. And remember, this is just Friday at Barrett Jackson. So what a day here in South Florida. We're going to take a deep breath and reset for a super Saturday like you've never seen before in Palm Beach. It's hard to imagine it's really going to get even better tomorrow, but that's exactly what we're going to see. We kick things off with six hours on the History Channel at noon Eastern time, and then we wrap things up on FYI for the final hour. So for Mike Joy, Steve Magnante, Tyler Hoover, April Rose, Christian Murphy, I'm Rick DeBrule. Thanks for riding along with us. We'll look forward to seeing you here on Super Saturday.